you're tired of feeling overwhelmed from studying and you want a system to learn more and score higher all while spending less time, then you've come to the right place. I'm Mike, that's my little bro, Maddie. We're both former medical doctors and now full-time learning coaches. And we've helped thousands of students transform their study skills using our 3C method. It's an evidence-based workflow that you can start implementing right away. So this video is a super-powered masterclass that puts all our best videos together into one comprehensive guide that you can use to ace your exams. The videos are organized to take you through the three C's of our method, construct, connect, and challenge. We'll even throw in a bonus C to help you stay consistent and not fall behind. Be sure to bookmark this video for easy access. Timestamps are available, and we got more resources and downloads in the description. Let's go. I spent over a decade studying to become a doctor. And believe it or not, until recently, I had no idea how to learn. In college, I'd heard horror stories about pre-meds studying all day and having no life. And I was like, sick dude, sign me up. I'm just kidding. But uh, I wanted to become a doctor, so I knew I had to put in the work. And through sheer effort alone, studying 10 hours a day, I got into med school. But things didn't get easier. I wouldn't say the curriculum was more challenging, but the volume quadrupled. People compare it to drinking from a fire hose. By that math, I needed to study 40 hours a day just to keep up, which seemed hard, but I tried it anyways, and I was right. It was incredibly hard. At one point, I was studying nonstop, yet I still failed an exam. I remember feeling hopeless. I was so burnt out. And that's when we started this YouTube channel to explore how to study, and it changed everything. The reason most of us struggle with studying is because we don't understand our brain. Honestly, Honestly, it's not even our fault. We aren't taught this stuff in school. But from obsessing and teaching how to study for years now, I've come to realize that even a simple understanding of how the brain learns can change your life. So I want to share how I understand the learning cycle, which I've simplified to the three C's. The beginning of the cycle stands for construct. Information is presented to us from our teachers, books, and lecture slides. It's the stuff that we need to learn. The problem is most of us don't know how to think about that information when we receive it. How many times have you read something, weren't sure what to make of it, wrote it down anyways, and then moved on? By the end of studying, you might feel like it was a win, but just because you took a whole bunch of notes doesn't mean you actually learned anything. Actually, you dug yourself deeper in the hole, because now, when you go through it again, you might be even more confused about why you wrote something down. And so, the realization I had is that when we collect information, it's not about trying to absorb everything like a sponge. We want to be a filter. We want to sift through and figure out which concepts are important and which ones are less important. One of the best questions to ask during construction is, why does this matter? What's the point here? Or what's the main idea? And if you can't figure that out, don't write it down because it's not worth remembering yet. You don't have enough context to fully understand it right now. But remember, this is a learning cycle. Maybe on the next cycle, it will matter and you'll collect it then. Just focus on collecting the pieces of knowledge that you can. At a certain point, we stop collecting and start working with the ideas that we have. And this is when we move on to the next step, connect. Some people think of our memory like a bunch of filing cabinets, where we store information in specific places of our brain. But from our understanding of neuroscience, our memory is more like a web. For example, when I think about a concept like fashion, I think of clothes, shoes, jewelry, different brands, trends, you know, both ones that were pretty sick and ones that were kind of a miss. And each of those separate ideas have their own associated webs and interlinkings. We don't think about ideas on their own. They all go together, like a package deal. The more connected an idea is, the stronger our understanding of it. Think about it. If a spider just spun a web by making one connection to another branch, nothing would stick and it would starve. But a dense web with many connections is sturdy. The goal of connect is to create a dense web of knowledge. In neuroscience, this is called a schema, the mental model and way we think about an idea. We've collected and filtered all these individual pieces of knowledge. Now it's time to connect the dots and put things into context. This is why I really love hand drawing notes. I'm basically glued to my iPad nowadays because it's so much easier to draw mind maps and connect ideas together to create those schema. Check out this video up here for our mind mapping guide. Typing notes just isn't able to do this as well. Even the more sophisticated apps nowadays that have hierarchical or relational linking features. At least for me, something about the freedom of drawing just makes it way easier to visualize connections instead of having to click on links or decipher big walls of text. I'm not saying that digital note taking is useless, it does provide value, but that's a topic for another video. Now that we've connected our ideas and created a schema, we move on to the next step, 
challenge. Think of this entire process like building a raft. We've collected all the materials and resources. We've connected the dots to conceptually build a prototype. Now it's time to test the raft to see if it actually works. A big mistake I used to make with learning was getting stuck in the connect step. I just reread notes over and over, or rewatch lectures, thinking that all of those connections were accurate, but I didn't test them until the exam. And if you've ever been stumped by a test question and realize what you thought you knew actually doesn't make sense, that feeling of, oh snap, everything I know is wrong is soul crushing. Challenge reveals the gaps in our knowledge. If the raft doesn't float, break it apart and figure out why. Why doesn't this work? Is there a missing connection or is this connection actually not even a connection? We need to assess and deconstruct our thought process to improve it. Some of my favorite ways to challenge my thinking is with practice problems and through teaching. These strategies force us to really know our stuff as opposed to rereading our notes or blindly accepting that our schema is accurate. What we gain from challenge are new insights and new understandings that now funnels back to the construct Things. And then the cycle repeats. So to put it all together, we construct information, whether that's new material or the insights from the previous cycle. Then we need to connect the dots and create schema, a mental model of how we believe that information relates together. And then challenge our understanding by putting it into practice and applying it. It's a cycle, meaning that for any subject or topic we learn, we continue making rounds through the cycle until we deeply retain the information. And that idea of making multiple rounds has been shown to be very important for retention, thanks to the work of Hermann Ebbinghaus. He was a German psychologist who basically discovered what we all know as spaced repetition. Looking at his learning curve, our memory of a topic decays over time unless we review it. So with interval practice, we can improve our long-term retention. So it's not enough to just run through a cycle and then forget about it. We need to repeatedly reinforce and strengthen the neural circuits until that knowledge becomes second nature. So this learning process has been an absolute game changer for me to study more effectively. But I do have to mention that it won't feel that way at least not at first. It's important to understand that real learning is an uncomfortable process. It's an active process and requires critical thinking to evaluate what we know. It feels stressful, but that feeling means it's actually working. Passive learning, like rereading your notes, you know, highlighting things, flipping through lecture slides, there's no real thinking involved. But it feels comfortable because that's what we've always done. To make progress, we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone. If you don't want to put in the effort to learn the skills to study smarter, that's your choice. But your mental health and scores will reflect that. But sooner or later, you're going to hit a point in your life where you plateau where your current abilities to learn won't be able to keep up. College, grad school, professional school, they only get more difficult. And I say this because I wish someone had told me this back when I was a student. Because we all want to enjoy being students, not stress about being students. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments what aspects of studying you struggle with so we can make more content to help you on your journey. I'll see you later. AI is only as powerful as the person using it. Most people just use it to look up stuff they're too lazy to figure out. That's the problem, because spoon feeding answers doesn't equal learning. So instead of using AI to replace our thinking, we want to use it as an extension of our thinking to learn faster and actually retain it. And in order to do that, we have to understand how the brain learns. So our framework was designed around cognitive load theory. So we see learning as a three-part cycle. Construct, connect, and challenge. We construct chunks of information, connect the dots with what we already know to form an understanding, and then then we put that understanding to the test. But the main purpose of our framework, and actually the purpose of learning in general, is to encourage critical thinking. In each step, there are specific thought processes we can train to engage that type of thinking to learn more effectively. And these are the skills we teach thousands of students in StudyQuest. But even with the framework, we still encounter roadblocks. We still need to know what to think about, and then we have to go find it. We've all been there before, right? Flipping through textbooks, watching YouTube videos, without even knowing, is this what I'm looking for? And these roadblocks stand in the way of learning and add to cognitive load, or the mental effort we experience when we're learning. And this is where AI steps in. AI can help guide our thinking, search for relevant information, and generate insights. And by offloading a lot of that cognitive load to AI, we can focus on the most important part of learning, the critical thinking. That's AI's role in the process. So now let's dive deeper into how to use it in each part of the CCC cycle. The construct phase is all about how to gather new information, because not all information should be collected at the same time. Some of it doesn't have to be collected at all. There there's a sequence to learning that allows us to learn the most effective way possible. Think about learning how to play the piano. It would be most valuable to start with the names of the notes first, right? That sets the foundation for learning scales, and together, those can set the foundation for learning chords. Sure, we can start with chords first and then work backwards, but the cognitive load of starting there is a lot higher. By starting with notes and then scales, we construct little chunks of knowledge, starting with the fundamental principles, and then slowly build on top of it with more advanced chunks. So the order of learning is super important. 
important. Not just for comprehension, but also to save time so we don't struggle trying to learn something before we're ready for it. But figuring out that order can be stressful, especially if you don't have a textbook or we're self-studying or if your professor confuses you more in lecture than helps you. So one of the best ways to use ChatGPT is to role play and ask it, you are an expert at this topic. How would you recommend a beginner to learn this topic? Create a syllabus and lesson plan for me to learn this information effectively. Now we're reducing the cognitive load by creating a sequence to the way that we should approach this topic. If you want to take this a step further, you can tack on this. Then give me a list in bullets of other topics and concepts I should explore to understand this topic more completely, and then also tell me why. Here's the next prompt. Let's say that we're learning about blood pressure. Explain the concept of blood pressure in simple terms for a beginner. Then explain how it relates to the big picture of cardiovascular health. So with this prompt, the emphasis is not on defining unfamiliar terminology, although that is helpful, but more so in facilitating critical thinking to figure out why it's important. You know, when we're learning, we get those light bulb aha moments when we realize that something matters and something's important. And especially with Construct, when we're viewing information for the very first time, we have to know why it's important to the main idea. And every concept we learn after that that's also relevant to the main idea will now also make sense in the context of the first one. And so if I can zoom out again and look at the big picture, the way that ChatGPT reduces the cognitive load here is by helping us create a sequence to approach learning and then to guide us in critically thinking about that information to create an outline or skeleton of how all the information might be related to each other. Let's move on to the next step now, which is connect. This is where we take that skeleton that we just made and we try to fill in and develop some kind of understanding of how it works. Because the goal here is to connect ideas now, the critical thinking question of this phase is how does this concept relate to other concepts? We know that all of these concepts somehow fit in the skeleton, but now we try to understand which bones are touching which bones, which ones are not touching. How is this bone similar and different from this bone? And how does this bone affect the overall structure of the skeleton? What we're doing here is moving beyond definitions and starting to analyze and compare relationships. Because remember, if it doesn't seem like it's relevant, then we're less likely to understand why it's important and then we're not going to remember it. And this is where AI really shines. We don't need to search for those relationships anymore. It can compile a great starting point for us in seconds. For example, try out this prompt. Create a table to compare and contrast topics 1, 2, and 3. And then explain why the relationship of these concepts matters and how it helps me understand this concept as a whole. This is such a powerful prompt prompt because it focuses on the relationship, you know, both the similarities and the differences, and it ties it back to the big picture. So what if we're completely stumped and we don't even know what to compare to what? Well, here's another good prompt to get started. Help me explore additional concepts related to this topic. Give me a table of their similarities and differences, and then explain to me in simple terms why those relationships are important. And then follow it up with this. Thanks. What are other related concepts I might have missed when learning about this topic? I'm having ChatGPT search for other potential connecting points that I didn't even think about. One of the best things about ChatGPT is that it learns from the conversation. So as long as we're specific in the prompt, we'll avoid getting repeat information. Let's look at another example. One of my favorite ways to connect is to use analogies, because it can be tough to visualize how a brand new concept works. But if we can relate it to something that we do know how it works, it clicks a lot faster. But pulling analogies out of thin air is not easy. And and it requires a lot of cognitive load to come up with something that actually fits into the skeleton. So why not remove that friction and ask ChatGPT? Create three analogies to explain this concept to me from different perspectives, and then explain the strength of each analogy and the limitations of it. And now we can save our mental energy for critically thinking and evaluating whether or not these analogies actually make sense and what other insights we can get about the relationships of the concepts. Now, I wanna be clear that even with the help of AI, our attempts at connecting, you know, are at at least initially, probably going to be messy and potentially inaccurate. And that's totally fine because the goal of the next step in the cycle, challenge, is to critically evaluate if our current thought process makes sense. One of the simplest ways to challenge yourself is with practice problems. Makes sense, right? We apply what we've learned. But finding problem sets and looking up answers can be tedious, especially if our teachers don't provide resources or they're behind a fat paywall or something. But we can ask ChatGPT to remove that barrier, reduce unwanted cognitive load, and create challenge for us. For example, try out this prompt. You are a physiology professor. Create a 10 question short answer practice test on the topics of cardiac physiology to evaluate how well I understand why this topic is important. And you can substitute short answer for multiple choice or true false to get different variations depending on how you're going to be tested. But personally, I like short answer questions the most because they really force us to retrieve information from our brain because we don't get any context clues or hints from the answer choices. And of course, after you take the practice test, remember to check 
check your work. So follow it up with this prompt. Thanks, I just took the test. Now provide me with the answers along with detailed explanations about why the answers are correct and common pitfalls that students make who answer them incorrectly. Not only am I asking for a detailed thought process behind the correct answer, I'm also evaluating how this concept might confuse me or other students. I'm having ChatGPT challenge me and bring in different perspectives I might not have considered to assess my knowledge. Here's another banger prompt I've been using. I'm learning about this topic. Is my thought process accurate? Provide feedback on the strengths and weaknesses of my understanding and which other points to explore for a well-rounded perspective. And then type out your response below. So this is an incredible prompt because it forces me to explain what I know in my own words first as if I'm teaching, which is probably the most underrated study strategy out there. And we have a whole video about how to teach effectively if you're interested. But this way I'm not just plugging and chugging to search for an answer, but I'm forcing myself to critically think first, right? Some Sometimes we think we understand something, but when we're put on the spot and we have to explain it, it's obvious that we don't know anything. And in the second part of the prompt, I'm asking for feedback so I can properly fill in the gaps of knowledge I had considered. But remember that the quality of the output is directly proportional to the quality of the input. And from here, whatever insights I pull from learning, I'll feedback to constructing new chunks and repeating the cycle. Now, as revolutionary as AI is, I do want to address some limitations that at least currently exist. First, First, don't accept everything ChatGPT says as absolute truth. You can even ask ChatGPT itself and it will tell you that it still makes mistakes and sometimes generates inaccurate information. So it's still up to us, the human, to do our due diligence and take responsibility for our learning and not to rely too much on ChatGPT as a crutch. Next, although ChatGPT has an incredible depth of knowledge, at a certain level of depth, it falls off. And the best way I can describe this is that ChatGPT is incredibly book smart, way more so than any human brain could possibly be. But it physically can't acquire street smart, you know, real world experience. A couple months ago, we even conducted an experiment to see if ChatGPT could think and potentially replace a doctor by grilling it with questions that our patients have had. And we found that the more specific and interpretive we got with our questions, it just couldn't keep up. Because there are so many nuances and subtle decisions that doctors make which come from years of practice and experience. And ChatGPT couldn't replicate that. So if you're looking to gain the mastery and insight of a top 0.1% expert, ChatGPT probably won't be able to get you there. But let's be honest, for high school, college, and most graduate level programs where the education is very standardized, that level of depth is usually not necessary to perform well. And who knows, it's very possible that with the next versions of AI that all of these limitations will be addressed. I actually think it's more a matter of when than if. There were times when I felt like I understood the material during class, but when it came time to review, I'd open my notes and I wouldn't recognize anything. Sometimes it felt like I had to relearn everything all over again. So I went to an expert learning coach about this, our friend Justin Sung, and he had three words for me, higher order learning. That's what we're gonna break down in this video. And since this is part of our ongoing ultimate study skills series, I'll have a step-by-step -step portion at the end to help you apply this skill. So what does it mean to really understand something? Some experts will say, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it. I definitely agree with that, but it doesn't capture the full picture. Other people might say, if you can apply the info and use it to solve problems or answer questions, then you understand it. That's better, we're getting closer. But now you can see that how well you understand something lies on a spectrum. If you're able to recall facts and concepts, that's considered lower order. But if you can apply the information or evaluate information against each other, that's higher order. And that's what Justin was talking about, higher order learning. If I was trying to solve a puzzle, lower order would be trying to understand each puzzle piece in isolation, either by learning the concepts, memorizing facts, maybe using some active recall. Let's say this is a piece of info. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's got a groove here and a groove here. Got it. Next piece. The Golgi apparatus is the post office of the cell. It's got a groove here. It kind of looks like this. All right, next piece. This is actually how most students learn. Now for higher order learning, this means taking multiple puzzle pieces and relating them together. How do they compare and contrast? Do these somehow fit together to create a part of the puzzle? Or how do these pieces here fit into the bigger picture? That's the way you wanna be learning everything, knowing how everything fits together. So let's talk about a framework to promote higher order learning. And it all comes down to asking three critical questions. Why is it important? How does it relate to other info? 
and how will I use this info? In other words, how will I be tested on this? There's also a fourth bonus question, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, let's see this framework in action. And let's say we're learning about COVID virology. First, I'll ask, what is it? COVID-19 is an RNA virus. That's great and all, but that's lower order learning. So let's go higher. Why is it important? COVID-19 stores its genetic material in the form of RNA, which is different from most other organisms that use DNA. Next, how does this relate to other information? RNA is single-stranded, while DNA is double-stranded. RNA travels around the cell easily, while DNA stays safe inside the nucleus, meaning that RNA is more unstable and more volatile compared to DNA. And all this works in COVID's favor. It allows it to change and mutate quickly to stay ahead of our immune system. So next, how will I use this information? Or how will I be tested on it? Well, let's say we had to invent a vaccine against COVID. How might this vaccine work? What might it target? Maybe RNA. So we wanna break away from lower order learning, right? We don't wanna just chuck all the facts and details onto flashcards and start memorizing everything. Instead, we wanna invest more time up front to understand the material and think about it at a higher level. Learn it properly the first time so that later on, we're not relearning things and playing catch up. And of course, there's always going to be a bunch of arbitrary details that we can't apply higher order learning to things like random dates or random names of enzymes or basically anything that seems unrelated to the main concepts. That's when the fourth bonus question comes in. And that question is, do I need to memorize the details? And this is now a topic for a whole other video, but it's still very important for understanding info. So I'll be sure to link that at the end. But let me ask you, which part of this framework was most helpful to you? This video is part of our Ultimate Study Skills series, and today we'll be covering a technique that allows us to learn fast without sacrificing on comprehension, learning in layers. So let's say we're learning how to build a house. It'd make the most sense to build the foundation first, right? This includes the walls, the structure, and this all represents the main concepts of what we're learning. That's layer number one. Then we would add on supporting stuff like the roof, some electrical, some plumbing, and this all represents the supporting details. That's layer number two. At this point, we have a fully functioning house, but obviously there's still more we can add to make the house comfy, right? Maybe a couch, a lamp, some picture frames on the walls or something. These are nice things to have, but we don't really need this furniture to survive. So we're gonna call these the less important details. This is layer number three. So layer one is concepts and layers two and three are both details. But how do we differentiate between layers two and three? Well, layer two actually helps us understand layer one better, whereas layer three normally doesn't. For example, if I'm studying the concept of photosynthesis, then a layer two detail would be understanding that water, sunlight, carbon dioxide is transformed into oxygen. That's a detail that helps me better understand photosynthesis, right? That's the layer two detail. A layer three detail would be knowing something like the name of the enzyme that drives that transformation, which I don't even know the name of that enzyme, right? It's not that important, but obviously we're still gonna be tested on it. So layer three is usually what I would put on my flashcards to be memorized. And if we follow the 80-20 rule, usually 80% of exam questions will be on layers one and two, but usually those two layers make up only 20% of the material that you need to know. And I think the hardest part about learning is being able to differentiate what detail is more important and what detail is less important. Basically knowing which topics and key terms belong to which layer. And unfortunately, the skill isn't taught in school. You'll notice that if you read a textbook from start to finish, the order of information that comes at you is first you'll get a heading or a main idea, followed by loads of detail that you kind of just got to sift through, right? Then you'll get another heading, main idea, followed by details, another heading, followed by details, right? This is the same pattern that most professors teach in lecture too. Instead of giving us all the foundational pieces first to help us build our structure, they give us all the pieces for one room at a time. We don't move on to the kitchen until we've completely built the bathroom first. And this approach makes this house overall super unstable, right? It might seem like an efficient way to teach, but I don't think it's an efficient way to learn. So here's a step-by-step -step of learning in layers. Step one is to start with a list of key terms. You wanna have all the pieces laid out in front of you. And you can find this in the learning objectives of the chapters or from the syllabus itself. Step two is to categorize the key terms into one of the three layers. Is it a concept? Is it an important detail? Or is it a less important detail? And then step three, you wanna build your house layer by layer, right? On the first pass of the material, you wanna focus on the concepts. Then you come back for the important details then you come back for the less important details. So let's see these steps in action using microbiology as an example. 
For step one, here I have a list of all the key terms for multiple chapters. Just a side note, for beginners, I'd recommend doing this one chapter at a time, but when you get the hang of it, you can definitely try multiple chapters because it's much more efficient. For step two, I'm going to categorize the terms into the three layers. It really helps to compare and contrast all the key terms against each other to figure out where they belong. So first, what is a gram stain? A gram stain is a laboratory technique that we use to identify bacteria. I'm not exactly sure what layer gram stain is at the moment. Is it a concept? Is it a detail? I don't really have anything else to compare it to. So let's move on and then maybe I'll learn something later that will help me better understand where this fits in the big picture. So next, what is a gram positive bacteria? All right, so it's basically a bacteria with a thick cell wall. How does it relate to gram stain? Well, if you gram stain a positive bacteria, then it'll turn purple under a microscope. So we see some sort of functional relationship between these terms. Let's keep that in mind and move on to the next. What is a gram negative bacteria? All right, we have another term with the word gram in it. Gram negatives have a thin cell wall. And if you compare and contrast that to a gram positive, this one usually gram stains red under a microscope. So the idea of gram staining is a concept. So you see, the more we learn, the easier it becomes to put these terms in layers. All right, next, what is a Staphylococcus aureus? It's a type of gram positive bacteria. This next one is Clostridium difficile. It's also a gram positive. Next, we have toxin A. This is a toxin that's released by Clostridium, so it's a detail of that. Next is Klebsiella pneumonia. This one's a gram-negative bacteria. And we just keep going until we finish categorizing and grouping all these key terms together. Step three is to build our house layer by layer. And what better way to map something out in your head than mind mapping? So I'm gonna start by placing all of layer one on the page. So I think the most important part of this step is figuring out how the different components of layer one relate to each other. For example, here, it becomes clear to me that we group bacteria based on their characteristics, right? Gram positive, gram negative, etc. Because those characteristics are how we identify them, which then tells us what antibiotics to use to treat them. That's the big picture right there, right? That's what I'm talking about when I say lay the foundation first with the layer one concepts. So once all of layer one is connected on the page and we have a good core foundation, we can add the details on top, starting with layer two and then layer three. Now, the usual way that students mind map is to kind of build out each branch all the way out to the details before moving on to the next branch. This is not learning in layers and you'll easily lose sight of the big picture. If I were speed learning or even cramming the night before an exam, which I don't advise, and I wanted to make sure I don't fail that exam, then I would focus on the red and blue layers first since that will be the majority of the test, right? 80-20. But if I didn't go in layers, I might not even have time to cover all the important stuff because I was too busy with the less important details. So that was a simplified version of learning in layers. Justin covers it more comprehensively and even adds an extra layer that can be helpful for bigger, more complex topics. It's crunch time. You're stressed the exam is three days away and you haven't been studying. Plus, you're behind in lecture, so raise that to the power of stress. So you procrastinate in binge anime. The cycle repeats, you fight demons in the shower, procrastinate some more, have a good cry, tell your crush how you really feel. Wait, actually don't send that. All of a sudden, your exam is in less than 24 hours. Well. It's time to cram. So I never endorse cramming. I also understand that shit happens and the only way to go is forward. I've been there too. But if you follow this three-step plan, I'm confident you will not fail your exam tomorrow. Step one is to focus on the high yield concepts. First and foremost, before anything else, figure out what's most important to study. This is huge. A lot of students succumb to last minute pressure and enter panic mode. They'll open day one PowerPoint and raw dog every lecture start to finish. Don't do this because not all information is created equal. Some concepts are super complex it can take hours to learn. And if your exam is multiple choice, hate to break it to you, but it's only worth one point. But this is actually a good thing because it gives us two criteria to determine what to study. Number one, is this concept high yield? Start by looking at the syllabus or asking your classmates and upperclassmen for the breakdown of the exam. Better yet, ask your teacher what to focus on. They're the ones making the test. A lot of sneaky teachers will say something vague like, everything in the chapter is fair game, or you should know everything we covered. Annoying for sure, but in these cases, you're on your own. So use the 80-20 rule. Generally speaking, 80% of classes are tested on 20% of the core concept. These are the fundamental concepts in each lecture that everything else builds off of. 
Most chapters only have a few important takeaways. So as you study, focus on these and ask yourself, what was the main point of the lecture? And how does that relate to the main point of the other lectures? This way, you're always thinking big picture and trying to understand the 20% that's most likely gonna be tested. And criteria number two, can I easily learn this concept? This is more subjective, but you need to gauge your comfort with each high yield concept. If it's something you've mastered without trouble in the past or can easily wrap your head around, then invest a little time to master it and guarantee those easy points on the exam. If it's completely unfamiliar, then do this. Flip to the back of your textbook or PowerPoint and read the summary or wrap up. Also watch a few short videos on YouTube or another learning platform. From there, honestly ask yourself, can I learn this concept without spending the entire day? If you can, great, you have your next hour's work cut out. But if not, teach back the main idea from the chapter summary or YouTube video in your own words, just so you have the minimum usable understanding of it and then move on. You can always come back to these topics if you have time later in the day. The main point with step one is to detect Catch yourself from thinking you need to spend the same amount of time on every lecture. Stop panicking by trying to get through every detail of every topic. Figure out if it's high yield and if it's reasonable for you to learn quickly. Cram with a plan. We just talked about what to study. Now let's go over how. Part two, use high return strategies. Just like step one, the goal of step two is to use study strategies that give you the highest return. Avoid passive studying. No rereading notes or lecture slides, no highlighting, no mindless note taking. Panicked students think they need to lay eyes on all the information, so they speed read through every lecture, hoping their brain will remember something valuable. Again, don't do this. Rushing through information just to catch a word here or there isn't helpful. Honestly, it'll backfire during the exam because of the mere exposure effect where we tend to develop preferences for things that are familiar to us. Say you're reading a vignette for a test question, and of course it makes absolutely no sense because you crammed. Looking at the answer choices, you recognize a word and think, ah, yes, I remember seeing this word. I don't know what it is or what it means, but I'm gonna pick it because it's familiar for my cramming. Not the best test taking strategy. You're better off just guessing. Familiarity without comprehension can be dangerous. Instead, here are smarter ways to go about it. First, use practice problems, but be strategic. Panic students are afraid they won't have time to learn everything, so they read their practice questions and their answers without trying to solve them. Again, this is just to lay eyes on the information. The problem is they don't actually understand the answers. Test questions most likely won't be the exact same as the homework or past papers. So without understanding why the answer is the answer, it's useless. What you should do is learn the thought process. Spend a few more minutes thinking about what concept is being tested and how that relates to the takeaway of the chapter. Here's an absolute game changer trick. See if you can think about how to change the wording of the question so that another answer choice is correct. This forces you to differentiate concepts, which means you understand it better, and it's basically what teachers do for tests. For problem-based questions like math or physics, follow a guided solution first if it's available. Then you can try a similar problem on your own. But remember from step one, if you struggle too long on any concept, cut your losses and just move on. Next, use strategic memorization. Panic students try to rope and memorize everything. They read a definition four or five times in a row, then close their eyes and try to repeat it. Problem is, by the 10th concept, they've already forgotten the first one. Trying to brute force memorize everything is a surefire way to fail your exams. The smarter way is to spend a little more time making connections with all the concepts in that section. Look for patterns, similarities, and differences. This allows you to chunk concepts together to strategically memorize groups of ideas with mnemonics or images. I know this sounds tedious, but it's way more effective to differentiate concepts and understand their relationships. Spending even 10 extra minutes identifying these connections can easily guarantee you two or three more questions on the test, which is a huge return on your study time. Next, take strategic breaks. Most likely, you're gonna need to study 12 plus hours today. Tough, but be strategic about it. Panic students attempt to study all day long without breaks. Even when they start to lose focus, their Torah tendencies emerge and they stubbornly try to power through. By hour three, they're completely burnt out and scrolling TikTok. The smarter approach is to take strategic breaks. Use HIT or high intensity interval training. Set a clear study goal for a laser focused block of time and then take a quick break. Some rookies prefer to call this Pomodoro, but it's the same idea. For example, set your timer for 50 minutes and dedicate it entirely to learning a single high yield concept. Then take a 10 minute break. We focus much better with a clearly defined goal and the breaks allow our mind to reset instead of burning out. Use that break time to move around and clear your head. Go take a walk, grab food or drinks, or take a shower or something since you 
probably haven't done that today. So these strategic study strategies all have one thing in common. There's super high effort, which feels uncomfortable. But discomfort means learning is happening. And when we have very little time, we can't afford to study where learning isn't happening. And this is why step three, maintaining high energy studying, is equally as important as the first two steps so we can keep our mental capacity strong. No matter what I say, I know you're gonna stay up all night, pound energy drinks, skip meals and all that. I probably don't need to remind you that this can negatively impact your performance. But here's how you can keep up your energy while studying, even if it's last minute. First, don't pull an all-nighter. If you wanna study well into the night, that's your choice. But I can't stress how important it is to sleep before an exam. Think about it this way. An athlete who had a match the next day wouldn't practice all day and then stay up all night practicing. They would be absolutely exhausted. Just like our body, our mind needs rest in order to perform. Sleep consolidates what you learned into your long-term memory. My advice, if not a full six to eight hours, is to go to bed earlier for a few hours, wake up early, and continue studying. Nothing productive ever happens after 2 a.m. Plus, this will prevent the possibility of oversleeping and missing the exam. Next, it's okay to skip meals, but don't skip food altogether. Our brain uses up a lot of energy, and we need to keep it going. But instead of taking in a full-on lunch or dinner break, just snack throughout the day. Big meals can cause postprandial hypoglycemia, aka food comas, which make it really hard to focus. By snacking, we avoid the tired feeling and keep a steady energy level throughout the day. Pick snacks that are nutrient dense. Protein bars, almonds, veggies, or fruit. You don't have to limit it to just snacks too. Like you can just break up your meals. If you get a bowl from Chipotle, eat a quarter of it every break over the course of four hours instead of all at once. And also grab a big 40 ounce water bottle for the day. Staying hydrated is also super important. And next, be careful with your caffeine intake. It's okay to go above your normal caffeine dose for the day, but don't go too overboard. Too much caffeine can add to your anxiety rev you up so much that your productivity actually goes down. I'd also be mindful of how late in the day you want to have another cup of coffee or Celsius or something. You don't want it to interfere with your precious sleep, so maybe call it quits after 4 p.m. All right, so here's a mind-blowing secret. The three steps to cram for an exam are actually no different from how you should study for any exam. Because if you improve your study efficiency by focusing on the high-yield concepts and your study effectiveness focusing on the high-return strategies, that means you'll learn more information in less time, which is the exact goal of cramming. Crazy, right? And because you're maximizing high energy studying, you free up time for self-care and actually enjoying life. Imagine having a dream to become a world-class innovator. You envision yourself using complex math formulas and physics to engineer a device that changes the course of history. But on your first day of astrophysics class, you realize that this is really tough. So you decide to let go of that dream and think, maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'll become a doctor instead. So you switch to studying medicine, hoping it'll be easier. But to your surprise, it's still super difficult. The truth is, regardless of what our academic goals are, the road ahead is full of challenging classes. Our journey in medicine took over 10 years and came with plenty of learning struggles in complex topics. We've made a lot of mistakes, but learned a lot about learning in the process. So we wanna share three ideas that made learning difficult subjects not only effortless, but also enjoyable. It sounds crazy, right? Imagine actually enjoying the class that's completely kicking your ass right now. This first idea is something I call learn like a painter. Think about how a paintbrush works. Each stroke of the brush is incomplete. There are splotches and gaps all along the stroke, but we don't paint trying to fill in every last gap as we go. Rather, we go in layers. To relate this to studying, it's okay to skip some information on our first pass of the material. In fact, I find it smarter to keep moving the paintbrush forward. Learning difficult concepts are only difficult because we have no prior knowledge, no context to understand them. So learning like a painter works for several reasons. We're gathering a broader perspective of the topic and acquiring the needed knowledge to understand the difficult concepts better. Imagine if Bob Ross painted a masterpiece top to bottom filling in every single detail along the way. We would have no idea what he was trying to draw until the very end. But instead, he paints in layers. He builds the groundwork, the background, then outlines the shapes and structures so that it's easier to actually grasp the details and the difficult parts of the painting. So when learning brand new content, we have no idea what the painting is supposed to look like. That's why it's so difficult. We can only think about it based on the little context that we have. And this leads us into a trap of something called the anchoring effect, 
where we have a tendency to latch on to the first piece of information that we learn about something, even if there's new evidence that it might be incorrect. Without prior knowledge, our brain literally doesn't know what it doesn't know. In medical school, I had a really difficult time learning obstetrics because unlike something like neurology or cardiology that are somewhat covered in the classes leading up to med school, I had zero prior knowledge about obstetrics. Plus, I'm a dude, so I never had to look it up before. And I remember having a really, really hard time understanding the nuances between primary amenorrhea or secondary or primary or secondary hypogonadism. You know, I'd learn about one thing and then I'd latch onto that idea. And then I'd try to fit that mold of how I understood it to another definition and nothing made sense to me. But then I started to learn like a painter. Instead of going in the order of my textbooks or my lectures, I started to learn in broad strokes by seeing more patients and doing randomized practice problems with explanations. Learning about the treatment or method of diagnosis made it more clear to me why something was a risk factor or why the pathology was the way it was. Things began to click because I started to learn in layers. Understanding the easier concepts first then served as that prior knowledge that was needed for me to understand the more difficult concepts. So this meant that it was incredibly inefficient for me to spend too much time learning a new challenging concept. That's the mistake I used to make all the time. I'd get super frustrated spending hours and hours trying to figure something out. Instead, it's better to skip the harder concepts and collect more knowledge from concepts that are easier to understand. Just move the paintbrush forward because it's very likely that the easier concepts to understand will then become that prior knowledge I needed to understand the stuff that I skipped. So if it takes me more than a few minutes to wrap my head around, I just skip it move on and gather more information. And that doesn't mean only from the textbook. We can gather information from anywhere. If it's a medical disease, see how that disease presents visually or socially or compares to other diseases. Bring it into context because learning the easier things will then make the harder things click. So this rule works excellent for kitsunes as they prefer to frequently skip around and learn multiple topics at once. They also tend to be more creative, hence the painter idea. The next idea is to learn like a hunter. Adopt the mindset of a master predator. The thrill of the hunt gives purpose to the game. The most skilled hunters are fascinated by their prey and are curious about what makes them tick. They know where they hang out, what they eat, when they sleep, and they try to stay 10 steps ahead of them at all times. So to relate this to studying, we need to become fascinated with what we're learning about. Genuine interest for a topic makes us naturally curious and hungry to learn more about it. Of course, the next obvious question becomes, how do I become curious about what I'm learning? Like, what if it's not interesting? Complex topics are difficult enough, but they become even more painful when we're apathetic towards them. And these are very common concerns. I felt this way about a lot of my classes. Our brains aren't wired to find everything fascinating, and there's a reason for that. Because our brain gathers so much information every day, it has to be selective about what it remembers. When we learn something that our brain does not perceive as relevant or useful, we're gonna forget it. But if we create curiosity by relating it to something we do find interesting, then our brains will retain the information much better. So a hunter might find learning about physics boring, but what if they relate it to their love of the hunt and think, wait, maybe I can reverse engineer a trap using this equation to corner my prey. For me personally, I find mathematics quite challenging and boring. So one of my favorite scenes in Spider-Man was when Peter Parker actually used math to win in a 1v1 against Doctor Strange. He used math to beat magic. Suddenly math becomes more interesting. It's using an inquiry-based approach to learning. We're looking for patterns between abstract topics. We're looking for answers to our questions. This is why we love analogies so much. So some of the best questions to ask include, how does this idea relate to something I already know? How could I use this idea somewhere else? what happens to this idea under a different set of conditions. This is not to say that there were times in the past where I literally could not relate some concepts to prior knowledge, but that doesn't mean I still couldn't learn like a hunter. At the very least, we can still try to have some fun hunting for the answers themselves. Like treat the hunt for the answers like a game. Maybe you can do it with a study buddy to see who can get more answers faster and use that as a motivation to learn. Learning like a hunter speaks to those in Torah club, like me. Torahs are goal-oriented and often competitive, so naturally something like a game or a hunt would appeal to this brain type the most. And the final idea is to learn like an athlete. 
There are days they love the sport and there are days they absolutely hate it. But what separates top athletes from the rest of the pack is their ability to show up consistently regardless of how they feel. They also understand the importance of self-reflection to identify areas for improvement. To relate this to studying, in order to learn the difficult subjects, we need to cultivate a habit for discipline and self-reflection that's completely detached from the way that we feel. For a long time, I tried to rely purely on a motivational spark to get by. But waiting for inspiration to spark is, frankly, unreliable. More often than not, I'd feel defeated and frustrated by difficult topics, and this would set a negative precedent for the entire day. So that's a very counterproductive way to think about motivation, if we're waiting for the way that our emotions make us feel. Jeff Hayden talks about this paradox in his book, The Motivation Myth. Most people believe that motivation is required to take action. What he observed is that it's actually taking action that creates and reinforces motivation. If we persevere, we begin to make progress, and that progress is what actually builds our motivation for learning difficult things. So instead, we need to be vigilant and show up even when we don't want to, to make it a non-negotiable and seeing consistent progress will become the motivation we need to keep getting started. But simply creating a habit of discipline doesn't lead to improvement. Athletes can create all the motivation in the world, but if they don't analyze their weaknesses, then they'll lose the same matches over and over again. They also need to implement a self-reflection practice. My favorite question in starting self-reflection is to ask, what is the reality of the situation? It's a question that asks for objective, factual data not data based on the way that we think or the way that we feel. Because we can ignore reality all we want, but we can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. I used to blast through as many practice tests and problem sets as I could. I get fired up with motivation, doing like 300 practice questions a day. But then I realized I wasn't improving at all, and I kept getting the same questions wrong. Had I taken the time to analyze these questions and figure out why my thought process was incorrect or what I wasn't understanding, I would have improved much faster. Another example was how I would always underestimate how long it took me to learn something difficult. Well, actually, people in general do. It's called the planning fallacy. I would give myself two or three days to learn something really difficult, where in reality, it actually took me a lot longer. Without a self-reflection practice, I never would have recognized that. So as a general principle, I tend to give myself more time than I need to learn the difficult things. This rule really speaks to those in Kuma Club. Kumas tend to be more methodical and like consistency, so developing habits and routines will make the learning process much more enjoyable for them. Regardless of what difficult subjects or skills we need to learn, these are the three rules that have guided us the most. It really goes to show that we have a lot to learn from those who have taken the time to master very difficult skills. Ever since I started YouTube and got into self-discovery, I've become a bookworm. I went from reading one book a year to almost 40 books this year alone. And you know what? Reading is chill. I get why people have been doing it for thousands of years. It's like I'm downloading a piece of someone's brain. But I don't really care about reading thousands of books. I care a lot more about learning. Like what's the point in reading 20 books on weight loss if you're gonna go slam McDonald's every night? I wanna make lasting changes to my life through reading. And those are the strategies I'm gonna share with you right now. So the first cluster of tips are related to the technical side of reading. These include physical actions of reading, like eyes to words to brain and all the logistical stuff. The first tip is to read sitting upright, preferably in a chair or couch as opposed to lying flat in bed. Since most of us lay down to sleep, our body is conditioned to feel sleepy when we're horizontal. So when we read in this position, two things can happen and both are terrible. We either get drowsy, yawn, and then pass out after a couple pages, or we reprogram our brain think that laying down is actually reading time. And then it's harder to go to sleep because we've unconditioned ourselves for sleep. Plus it's dangerous to hold books up like this. You wouldn't want to risk dropping it on your face and uh, <laughs> chipping a tooth. My recommendation, pick a dedicated spot that's well lit, upright, and reserve it specifically for reading. Tip two is to schedule in reading time. We suck at being consistent without structure. I myself know that if I don't physically pencil in time to read, I'm never gonna get around to doing it. There's always something else that feels more urgent or there's some dopamine heavy binge that I'll fall victim to instead. So if you wanna form a habit of becoming a reader, 
the best thing you can do to show up is to put it in your calendar. I personally use an app called Cron, where I set up a recurring daily task to read for 20 minutes. This way, I know there's an uninterrupted chunk of time devoted for reading every single day. And I usually end up reading for longer than 20 minutes anyways. But just start with 20 minutes. It doesn't sound like much, but if you do it daily, it adds up. Tip three is to read with your finger. Our eyes actually don't move smoothly without something to track. They jump around and do what we call saccade movements, which is why a lot of the times you read, you lose Lose your spot and end up rereading the same line or sentence on accident. Actually, there's a really cool thing you can try right now with me to demonstrate what I mean. So look up from your screen for a second and don't focus your gaze on anything in particular and try to move your eyes very smoothly from left to right. It's probably going to be super difficult to do really slowly unless you use a lot of intentional focus. And even then, you'll realize that your eyes actually do these little jerky movements and those are called saccades. All right, now let's reset and try it again, but this time, hold up your finger instead and follow it from left to right. Way easier, right? So pretty interesting how our eyes work, but the point is using a tracking device makes it easier to read and not lose your spot, and it helps get you into that reading flow. Tip four is to read without speaking the words in your head. When we first learn to read and pronounce words, we're taught to say them aloud to make the association of words to our brain. But over time, reading becomes a muscle memory and instinctual. We can read and recognize words without actually having to say them aloud. For example, if I flash a few words on screen, you probably didn't have to read them, but you know exactly what they said, right? Reading every word in our head actually slows down our reading speed a lot. The visual data that our eyes get from seeing words is enough for our brain to recognize them and understand them without actually having to say them aloud. It's kind of a challenging skill to get the hang of because you have to break a habit and you've been taught to do it without even thinking, but stick with it because it can really speed up your reading once you get the hang of it. So moving on to the next cluster of tips, I call these emotional reading skills because reading is an emotional experience. A great analogy to demonstrate this section is to think of reading like dating. Books make us feel a certain type of way, the way the author crafts their stories. But we also feel a certain way towards books. We have preconceived notions about books. Or maybe you've just been eyeing this book for a long time, right? If I'm into someone, I'll clear my whole schedule and move mountains to see them and talk to them. And as a result, I'll learn about them much faster. The same goes for the opposite. If I'm not emotionally invested, I'll have no desire and learn way slower. So tip number one is to stop reading a book if you don't like it. Like if I didn't enjoy going on a date with a girl, I wouldn't plan another date or chase after her just because someone else told me they thought she'd be the one. If the book blows and doesn't fit your vibe, then put a pin in it and go for another book. Not every book we try has to work out. Tip number two is to not read every single word in the book. This is really for nonfiction, but you don't have to read every single word to get the idea. I've realized that the majority of books are super repetitive and redundant. A chapter is usually like one to two ideas, followed by a ton of examples and explanations and stories about those ideas. So if I'm reading and I get the gist of it, I'm just gonna skip ahead to another idea. Like this is the same way you'd get to know someone on a date. You ask them lots of different questions to get to know them. You don't need to spend the entire date asking about their career or their dog. You're both gonna get really bored. So when you're reading, don't be afraid to skip forward, skim, read it backwards or whatever. Remember, we wanna stay emotionally invested, not bored in order to read more. Tip three is to follow your reading curiosity. I like to think that every year I grow and learn more. And along with that comes new ideas, new perspectives on life, and new curiosity for learning. So to read stuff that interests you now. Timing and headspace are really important factors. Depending on where you are in life, a book may be more meaningful. Like if I read How to Win Friends and Influence People five years ago, I wouldn't have cared about anything I read. I probably wouldn't have gotten past the first chapter before I got bored. But it's because I've gotten so obsessed with self-discovery and self-development over the last few years that it's now so much more impactful for me. Which leads into tip number four, where you should read multiple books at once. I'll repeat it again. Reading is an emotional experience. Similar to how people would go on multiple dates with many different people, you should be doing the same with books. Reading multiple books at once keeps it spicy, it adds variety, and it makes sure that there's always something desirable and interesting for you to read. 
If one book starts to get dry, then set it aside and add another one to the rotation. This also doesn't exclude the fact that a year from now, maybe you're growing out of your degenerate party animal phase and starting to deep dive into another phase of your life, then hmm, maybe that book will suddenly become way more attractive. Books speak to us at different stages in our life. And the best part is they're never gonna be taken off the market, you know, by Giga Chat or something. All right, and the third group I call consolidation reading skills. These are the cluster of skills that make sure you aren't just stroking your ego by reading thousands of books, but that you're actually learning and remembering the information that you read. That's why we read books, right? We want to get ideas, satisfy our intellectual curiosity, get knowledge, or at the very least be entertained by what we read and implement them into our lives. Consolidation skills are all about immediately applying what you read at the first possible chance you get. When we're learning, reading, or experiencing something new, that information enters our short-term memory. This is called a memory trace, where a few brain cells, specifically in the hippocampus, get activated. If that information isn't used or applied in a meaningful way, then the memory trace will fade and we're gonna forget it. Our brain isn't very good at holding on to information if it's not processed and applied quickly. Like, think about the last time you went on a YouTube video binge to learn something something. If you watched videos back to back to back, you probably felt like, hell yeah, I'm learning a whole bunch. This is great. But if you try to recall it tomorrow or next week, most of that information is going to be forgotten. I mean, take this video, for example. If you don't even try to take action to consolidate what I'm telling you right now, in a week, nothing will change and you'll still be reading like a snail. But we're built different at Cajun Koi Academy. What are you rookies going to do instead? Stop and apply what you learn right there on the spot. Some people write directly in their books, some people highlight them, some people use post-it notes. I personally don't like scribbling notes or highlighting physical books, like I'm not gonna go back through this and look at my notes. I've been teaching how to learn for way too long to know that you don't learn jack shit from rereading and highlighting. That's why tip number one is to write about what you read in your own words. Now for me, I do almost all of my book reading on iPad using the Kindle app synced to Readwise. What I like about these apps is how they export and sync highlights directly into my Notion database. I know I just trash talk highlights, but as someone who writes a lot, it's been a game changer for me. I'll highlight quotes that make me think or that I want to refer back to because I like to give credit where it's due. And I also have this organized database so I can easily cite authors and ideas while I create content. Uh, especially if I revisit or link an idea from a long time ago. Tip number two is to consolidate by having something to build alongside with what you're reading. If you're starting an online business and reading a book about business, then start building your business at the same time. If you're reading a book on social skills or dating, go out later and use what you learn to strike up conversations. Life is about upgrading our skill builds and books are our skill manuals. We're constantly reading books and trying to apply them and building this business, building this brand, growing on social media, learning sales, all of these things. And even if you don't create content publicly like we do, although I definitely think you should, that itself is a super underrated skill. You can at least implement and engage with what you read in other ways. Talk about what you read with your friends or at the dinner table. Have discussions about what you read and why they're important to you. There are endless ways to consolidate what we read to improve our lives. We just have to be intentional and implement them as soon as possible to make sure they stay. So those are the three different skill build categories I see for really developing the ability to read more books that will actually make a difference in your life. Reading has become something very personal and important to my life, and I hope that with these skills, you'll fall in love and find a similar way to connect with it the way that I did. When I need to study, it's a drag and I need to push myself. But I've never had to force myself to play video games. Video games are easy to get hooked on and they keep us wanting to come back for more. Studying, not so much. So is there a way to combine the fun aspects of video games into our study routines so we don't have to rely on motivation? There's clearly something special about video games where people choose to devote thousands of hours leveling up their characters. I mean, every chance we got at the dinner table or while we were supposedly studying, we happily nope. sacrificed nights of quality sleep to squat up with the homies. So let's explore three ideas that make video games so compelling. And then I'll show you how to apply these as power-ups to your life to level up your studying. The first idea is that video games have a well-defined storyline. In every Super Mario game, Mario always rescues Peach from Bowser. In Zelda, Link always has an epic showdown with Ganon. All throughout the game, we're given quest logs and objectives with specific tasks to complete the game. And if we get stumped by a puzzle, we can literally just YouTube how to beat this dungeon and a bouquet of walkthroughs will pop up. But as students, our storyline is a complete mystery. And because of it, we feel like we have no time to think about our future self or what the end game looks like. Surveys 
show that 80% of college students change their major at least once, and on average, up to three times. And there's a reason for this uncertainty. It's because none of us know if we're actually making progress in life. In video games, you can't continue forward until you reach a higher level or acquire a certain item. And you know exactly which attributes you're improving and which skills you're buffing. You know how much your damage increases or how much EXP you need to level up. There's tons of feedback from gameplay that give us certainty that we're actually making progress. In the dream outcome, defeating the final boss or getting that rare loot is always clearly defined. We're so certain of what we need to do, it gives us freedom and autonomy to decide how and when we want to do whatever task. We can choose exactly what skill build we want and how we want to achieve it. We don't get that with school as much. When we're stumped, finding guidance is incredibly difficult, especially for struggling with academics. Like studying for an exam, I can't mindlessly farm Diglett all day and expect to do well. And after days of relentless grinding, I can't pause my life and check my stats to see like, oh yeah, my active recall skills are now at level eight. That means I'll deal 40% more critical damage on my exam. Most of us study without clearly defined goals and we get zero feedback on whether or not we're improving. So we have no clue how our story will unfold. So here's the first power up. Create opportunities to track your progress. When studying for an exam, implement weekly or even bi-weekly self-assessments. Take a practice test to see how you're doing. Or close your notes and draw a giant mind map connecting everything you've covered to find gaps in your learning. One of my favorite review methods is the grow table, where you basically have a progress bar for individual topics you're studying. Check out this video here for more on that. Track your progress frequently over the semester and record your progress so that at any point, when you start to feel lost or uncertain, you can pause and check out the quest log or stats to see how far you've come and what attributes you've actually improved on. Because once you gain clarity of your objectives, you can immerse yourself in the game and clear the challenges with a sense of purpose and direction. We can also apply these power-ups outside the classroom. Like most of us don't know what the hell we're doing in life. But although we can't remove that uncertainty, we can make it easier for ourselves. All we have to do is ask. If you don't know if med school is right for you, go ask your professor or ask your doctor. If you're not sure about how to do something, ask your parents or your counselors, ask the YouTube search bar or Senor Google. As a student, it's your job to get as much feedback as often as possible so you can make better decisions to define your story. Get it often and get it constantly to remove that uncertainty about what you're doing. All right, now we've cleared stage one. The second idea is that video games are low risk, high reward. I get unlimited attempts to challenge the Elite Four or Ganon. I can make multiple save files to experiment with which storyline I want to pursue. I can have it all because I'm in complete control and there's no consequences for failure, which is an insanely powerful motivator. Mark Rober called this idea the Super Mario Effect. He analyzed data from 50,000 participants in a coding challenge and found that when the consequences for failure were removed, people were significantly more likely to complete problems and tasks, all because they were willing to keep trying. It's shown in orange right here. So those who didn't see failing in a negative light nearly had two and a half times more attempts to solve the puzzle. The risk of losing a game of Dota is really low. I can instantly queue up and try again. And the rewards for winning are extremely satisfying. There's a glorious rush of dopamine for winning a match or pulling rare loot in Zelda. Epic music, flashy visuals, and praise make us want to play again so we can try to get that same sense of accomplishment. There's so little risk from trying that we can focus on simply enjoying the game. We can get creative with problem solving, like if that team comp didn't work, well, we can try a different strategy. But as students, it's not the same. We spend months preparing for huge standard tests like the MCAT or the USMLE, and we have one attempt to give it our best shot. Otherwise, failure is crippling. We missed parties and get-togethers, not to mention the $300 down the drain or however much the exam costed. And then there's the time investment. Months of studying wasted. We can't queue up at the last checkpoint and try again. We have to wait months before another attempt and continue studying to keep the information fresh on our mind. And if we had plans to apply for school, that's another year loss of precious time in our 20s. The risk is astronomical. But although we can't lower the stakes, of our big goals, we can turn them into bite-sized pieces. Power up number two is to break down high-risk goals into low-risk, high-reward goals. We can try to make the act of studying as easy as possible by setting smaller learning objectives and, to the best of our ability, removing the consequences of failure. For example, Fixating on the goal of scoring the 99th percentile on the MCAT can be changed into many smaller objectives. Break it all the way down to a single practice problem. Can I understand this one concept? Or how else can I solve this problem? Replace the big scary goal with small mini games to get creative and experiment. Think about learning like a Super Mario stage where you allow yourself to fail 
again and again. Like, don't even think about how difficult the next MCAT section is. Just focus on one tiny objective that's right in front of you. Learn from past mistakes to improve your study system. And over time, these will add up until we reach the point we're equipped to reach our big goal. Stage two, clear. Now let's move on to the final way video games can help us with studying. And that is that video games instill FOMO. This can be controversial to whether or not you see it as a good thing, but video games are really good at instilling FOMO if you're missing out. Mobile games do this especially well by implementing daily login bonuses and streaks. They make sure you come back every single day to play their game or else you'll miss out on those juicy rewards. And for games with leaderboards and ranking systems, there's that looming fear that you might lose your spot, so you gotta log back on and play. Multiplayer games also use the idea of FOMO because of friends lists. We love squatting up with our friends. I'd be watching anime or something, and I'd get that ping at the bottom of my screen. There was no way I was missing out on the fun. Or worse, getting replaced by Mike for solo mid. I know FOMO gets a bad rep, but for video games, it does something amazing that we cannot deny. It gets us back in game consistently. Even if it's just to log in for the prize, we show up to claim our hit of dopamine and to quench the fear of losing our streak. To quote everyone's favorite ranger, James Clear, what gets rewarded gets repeated. In school, we don't see this pattern as often. There's usually no prize for turning in homework every day of the week. Nothing special happens when we get a practice problem correct or finish reading a chapter. There isn't any reward for consistent studying. The next page is just the next chapter. Plus, we can't rely on our squad for boss fights. Exams are single player. I mean, it would have been so sick if I could have brought the dream team to take the MCAT with me. Because FOMO mechanisms didn't exist natively, I ended up procrastinating a lot in school. Like, there was no urgency to get rewarded, so it was hard to get motivated. But that being said, there are ways we can leverage healthy FOMO to our advantage. We can create social accountability with our friends. Studying groups. It provides a sense of community and belonging because everyone is working toward that same elusive goal. You don't necessarily have to be studying for the same class either. Being around other working students has been motivation enough for me. But if you are studying for the same thing, even better. You can get competitive about being more productive or scoring more points on the exam. Just know that the most important thing for healthy competition is to keep it collaborative. It's much more powerful when everyone is willing to help each other out and share resources to perform better. Don't let competition get toxic where you sabotage your peers or hide resources from each other. Keep it friendly. But there's something really cool about struggling through a challenge with a group of friends. Like there's a a real sense of accomplishment towards something bigger than ourselves. The whole idea of power up number three is to be consistent. You can also consider implementing a personal reward system. If you love to-do lists, maybe you're a Torah or Kuma, then give yourself a small reward after you check that last box. And if you achieve a very difficult task, like getting an A in a class or reaching a hard milestone, then reward yourself with some rare loot or a collectible item. Brand new air fog, huh? But the rewards should match the task. Don't be buying Hermes Birkins for finishing your flashcards. That's more deserving of like a Kuma cookie or a quick game of Pokemon Unite. And that's stage three clear. So sometimes we can use external motivation to cultivate long lasting habits that allow us to achieve our goals. And when we finally defeat the final boss of school through consistency, through repeated failures and through tracking and evaluating our progress, it'll be more rewarding than any video game because it wasn't a game, it was life. That's that euphoric sensation that game developer Miyamoto strove to achieve with Nintendo games, the feeling of pure accomplishment from hard work. It turns out there's a lot we can learn from video games. What most people think of as a distraction from studying, we can actually leverage to improve our lives as students. The worst thing you can do is take notes that look like this. This is what I call a wall of words. It would take a good minute to read this entire paragraph and figure out what it was saying. But if you had like 50 pages of notes, you would be studying it for hours. So what I would do is take the main idea of this and then turn it into something visual, like an image, a flow chart, a diagram, or a mind map. I could look at a visual and within seconds get the gist of what it's about. So tip number one is to make more visual notes, because not only does the brain remember images better than words, it also processes them faster. The next tip is to understand that notes are meant to be an extension of your thinking, not a replacement. Here's what I mean. So imagine that your brain is carrying a load. This is called cognitive load. So you're sitting in class and the teacher is lecturing and feeding you info, metaphorically adding weight to this load. Your brain's job is to process it, ask questions, make connections, piece the information together properly think about it. So when the load of information starts to become too much to handle, then you jot some notes down. Right? You offload the excess information to keep track of it, but you wanna use your notes as an extension of your thinking. You want your cognitive load to be heavy enough to be challenging. If you're at the gym and you're lifting light weights, it's not gonna help your muscles grow. The only way you're gonna learn is by struggling with the info in your brain. 
at a reasonable level, of course. And that struggle is what learning feels like. But what many students do wrong is that they offload everything immediately to the notes. The info comes from the teacher to your brain and then directly to your notes. You don't give your brain any chance to process it. You don't embrace that uncomfortable feeling of learning. Many students do this because they're afraid of missing information, so they gotta frantically write it all down. The info is basically bypassing the brain too quickly and you don't learn anything. So if you made the commitment to go to class, then use that time effectively by learning the information right there and then, rather than writing it down and then postponing your learning till after class. Plus, if you understand what's being taught, then you'll end up taking better notes. The next step is to not over rely on your notes as a study guide. A lot of students will read their notes to review for an exam. And they think that the more times they read it, the more prepared they'll be. But that's not how it works, because rereading notes just gives you the illusion of learning. You feel like you're absorbing the information, but you're not actually retaining it. Think about your favorite favorite movie. Can you recall every scene in that movie in order straight from memory? It's a lot harder than it seems, right? Even for your favorite movie. But if you had that movie playing right in front of you, then it becomes a lot easier to recall the scenes because they're all familiar to you. That's what rereading your notes is like. It gives you the illusion of learning. But when you close your notes and try to recall them, like picture the movie playing out in your mind, it's not that easy, but that's what true learning feels like. The next tip is to constantly update your notes, especially if you're using a technique like mind mapping. The notes that you take in class are version number one. That's your initial understanding of the information. It's pretty new still. But as you keep learning and ask more questions, you begin to clarify things. You might find that you misunderstood some concepts and you gotta go back, you gotta cross things out and edit your notes. That then becomes version number two. And the more you learn, you start to notice more patterns and how ideas relate to each other. And you can start grouping information together and condense your notes. That might be version number three. And you gotta go through however many versions you need until you have a concise and condensed understanding of the concepts. There's no such thing as a perfect mind map or perfect notes on the very first try. You gotta go through many iterations, so don't waste your time trying to make your first notes look pretty and formatted if it's going to change anyway. The next tip is to understand the difference between linear and non-linear note-taking and when to use each. Linear note-taking is when you write information in sequential or structured order. This is typically how textbooks are written. You get chapter one, then heading one, subheading one, then heading two, subheading two. Like it looks very chronological. On the other hand, non-linear note-taking is more freeform and allows the ideas to all connect to each other. It makes it very easy to visualize how all the concepts are connected through diagrams, mind maps, or flowcharts, or any other visual representation. This is normally a lot easier to do with pen and paper, whereas linear notes are the default when you're typing your notes, right? Because you can't really draw or sketch with a keyboard. And yes, there are some subjects like math or chemistry or physics where you gotta make sure that you get the right steps in order. But most other learning, especially conceptual learning, is complex and all the ideas Ideas are interconnected. I really enjoy taking notes on an iPad and stylus because you get that free form to make connections, but you also get that digital organization to keep track of your notes. And speaking of math, the next tip is specifically for note taking in math. The best way to start learning math is without all the numbers. You want a conceptual understanding first. So ignore the numbers and learn the math in words first so that you know when and why you're using certain equations. I'd say the wrong way to learn math is by memorizing all all the equations and then on the exam you're just trying to recognize patterns and you're trying to fit variables into the equations until you get somewhat of an answer that looks familiar and then you just go with that one that's what we call the plug and chug method right which is not that great because you're just trying to rote memorize the procedures and the steps to solve the problems without a conceptual understanding of how to solve the problems so again the tip here is when taking notes for math start off by using words in your notes Right, what do the laws and equations mean? Once you have a conceptual understanding, then you can bring in the procedural practice. You can start introducing numbers and doing practice problem sets. The next tip is to write questions. And writing questions has a few benefits. First, it gives you an objective to work towards. Like as you're reviewing or reading through your material, you're actively looking for answers to these questions. Secondly, it forces you to think like an exam writer. How would they ask this information on the test? What variables can you remove or change around to make the question even more difficult? And thirdly, writing questions gives you a great practice or review tool. When you're studying for the exam, you can run through your list of questions and actively recall 
the answers to quiz yourself. If you're using a note-taking app with toggles like Notion, you can nest the answers and hide them under the questions. Or you can transfer your questions directly to flashcards. Writing questions is the basis of many different note-taking techniques like Cornell Notes, or one of my favorites, the QEC method. I used to take terrible notes. By the time I finished, I retained barely anything. So I tried to review them again, and my retention went up a little bit, but the notes were trash to begin with, so I'd review them again and again. Sometimes it helped, but sometimes it didn't. This was an unreliable way to study, and I just kept wondering, how many reviews does it take to get to this point? Well, it turns out that's the wrong question to ask entirely. I had it completely backwards. The real question is, how do I make this very first view as effective as possible? A Eliminate the need for multiple reviews and retain as much as possible from the very beginning. Well, it turns out there's a lot of ways, but today we're focusing on a method called associations. Associations can happen in many ways. Like if you have tons of information on the page, you can associate them down to two or three groups, depending on their characteristics. This is called chunking. Or if you have a giant paragraph of information, you can associate it with a single image that is faster for the brain to interpret and understand. This is called visualization. Associating things together can take many forms, but fundamentally Fundamentally, it's just about connecting ideas together. Because ultimately, we just want to condense and process our messy notes into study material that we can actually use for review. So here's a simple framework that will help you associate complex topics in a way that's easy to remember. Step one is to simplify the concept, and step two is to associate the idea to something similar that you already know. An easy way to simplify something is to break it down so that even a child can understand it. Apparently, half of American adults have a reading level below sixth grade. So let's just say a child is someone who is fifth grade or less. Basically, you don't want to use fancy language. You want to leave out the names of complicated key terms and you want to keep the details out. Step two is to find prior knowledge you have that is similar to the idea and associate them together. So the way that memory works is that you want to take this new unknown piece of info and want to connect it to a bunch of other information that you already have in your web of knowledge. And a memorable way to make these connections is by using familiar imagery, analogies, or stories. So let's go through some examples and it'll make a lot more sense. Okay, so for for this example, I'm going to use associations to better understand and remember chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So let's take a look at the notes here. COPD is a group of lung diseases characterized by inflammation and constriction of the airways leading to symptoms like dyspnea. Okay, let's just stop right here for a second. Imagine having to read this entire paragraph every time you want to review this topic. That's way too much reading, it's going to take way too long, but that's what a lot of students do without even realizing. So the goal is to condense this paragraph down with associations. So step one is simplify. And already I see way too many big words here that a fifth grader would not understand, so let's simplify those. Inflammation basically means damaged. Constriction is tight or blocked. Symptoms is what you feel. Dysmia is trouble breathing. Chronic is over a long period of time. So irritants, smoking, hazardous chemicals. I'm just going to group these all together and just say smoking. I want to keep it simple for now. And all these other details aren't really necessary to explain the core concept. So let's leave it out. So I've simplified this entire concept down to the idea that COPD is a disease where your lungs are damaged and blocked, making it hard to breathe. Lots of smoking can cause this. And that's it. A fifth grader should be able to understand that. Let's move on to step two, similar ideas. One of my favorite examples of imagery is from med school. My critical care attending always talked about the lungs being like inflatable balloons because when you blow air into them, they expand. And when you exhale the air out, they collapse. So when I'm solving problems or figuring out how certain diseases affect the lungs, I always imagine a balloon inflating and deflating. So why don't we add an analogy here? So if you can imagine breathing through like one of those paper towel rolls, it's probably not that hard because the tube is wide. But if you constrict or shrink that tube down to the size of a straw, it becomes a lot harder to breathe through. That's the analogy of a constricted airway, right? You're trying to breathe through a straw. Now, imagine having to blow up a balloon through a straw, right? That's terrible. But people with COPD just have to go through life breathing like that because their lungs have been so damaged. This analogy is really gonna help me remember this disease. Let's add a story. One of the most common causes of COPD is smoking. You can imagine that if you inhale toxic stuff into your lungs constantly, sooner or later, you're gonna damage your lungs, right? That's a logical story that should be easy to remember. I could also imagine a smoker smoking a cigarette and associate that cigarette with breathing through a straw since that imagery looks kind of the same to me. 
and I've actually used this in the hospital to diagnose lots of patients. When I see a patient coming in and they're wheezing and they're unable to breathe, I automatically imagine them breathing through a straw and I automatically ask them, have you ever smoked? Because that helps me figure out what kind of lung disease I'm dealing with here. So the overall goal of associations is to condense your notes from pages of text to more simplified expressions. This makes it way easier to make study guides that are just efficient to review. So for example, it can make mind mapping or flashcards way more efficient. I can replace the text with my associations and instantly make my review sessions much faster. So schools don't typically teach us how to take good notes, which is crazy because it's a difficult skill to learn, especially if you're taking different subjects like math or science, which is very technical, versus literature or history, which is very text heavy. So we've created multiple note-taking tutorials in our Ultimate Study Skills series, and this video in particular will cover how to take better notes for any subject. These frameworks come from How to Become a Straight-A Student by Cal Newport. He was a top Ivy League student, and then he went around interviewing other top students around the country. Now he's a professor at Georgetown University, so he speaks from multiple perspectives on this note-taking topic. So let's dive right in. In general, we have two types of classes. First, we have the non-technical classes, like literature, history, or poli-sci. These classes usually involve long, dry reading assignments. Then we have the technical classes, like math, science, economics. These usually involve problem sets, calculations, code, and equations. So let's start with the non-technical classes, right? The three-part framework here is what Cal Newport calls QEC. Question, evidence, conclusion. So the goal is to make notes that clearly state QEC for every big idea, but it's not as easy as it sounds. The good news is that a lot of professors will teach information in this framework. Like they'll pose a question, and they'll walk through some evidence, and they'll reach a conclusion, and then they repeat this process over and over for the rest of the lecture. And the bad news is that they don't tell you which info is the Q or the E or the C, right? Some professors just love to ramble and they go off topic, and then we're left trying to figure out what's actually important. Sometimes the professors won't even state the questions, so be sure to put a star to remind yourself to come back and figure it out because it's probably going to be a test question. Sometimes they'll just hint at a conclusion, but they won't right out say it, so it's up to us again to figure that out. All right, so let's do a quick example here because sometimes the conclusions are not exactly straightforward. Let's say that the professor poses this question, who is the greatest basketball player? So I'll write that as the question and then be on the lookout for evidence and conclusion. So during lecture, the professor might give a simple conclusion like Michael Jordan, right? And the evidence might be several points highlighting how many championships he played or how he changed the culture of basketball or something. But it's not always going to be that simple, right? Because the professor could say that it depends or you might have multiple reading assignments that all look at different bodies of evidence and they all arrive at different conclusions. So for example, the conclusion might depend on which analysts you ask, or it might depend on what stats you're comparing, or what about LeBron James? Sometimes a question can have complex conclusions or multiple conclusions, and you have to be able to group together which evidence supports which conclusion. So make your QECs as clear as possible. Another quick tip here is if you're using an app with toggles like Notion, then one thing you can consider doing is nesting your conclusions and evidence under toggles to make your review sessions more efficient. So if the conclusion isn't obvious, then you gotta do whatever it takes to figure it out, right? Ask questions during class to clarify, or ask the professor after class, or go to office hours, or ask your friends. But you wanna make sure that you complete as many QECs as possible during or immediately after class when the information is still fresh in your head. Because when it comes time to review for the exam, you want a study guide that's easy to review, right? You don't wanna be spending more time trying to relearn or figure out what you wrote. All right, let's switch over to the technical classes. Cal Newport doesn't explicitly state this framework, but we'll call it the PSA. Problem, steps, answer. So he states that the key to taking notes in a technical course is to forget the big ideas and record as many sample problems as possible. I don't agree with this actually. I think that big ideas are very important in technical courses. I think that if you can forget about all the numbers at first and just focus on understanding the math in words, that will make it much easier to learn. So for PSA, your professors will most likely give you the sample problems and answers. So be sure to save them or print them or write them down but that's the easy part. The hard part is writing out all the steps on how to solve those problems and annotating those steps. So a quick example here, I'm writing out the steps that lead to the answer, but I'm also annotating those steps, right? I'm taking notes about what steps are being used, 
when they're being used and why they're being used at that time. Because I want to understand the math or the science, not just in numbers, but also in words, right? So literally writing out the explanations if I need to, or using arrows or bolding important parts. So some professors move really fast. And if you don't understand, raise your hand and ask questions, especially to clarify the annotations. If you need to, then put a question mark and maybe come back later because recording the steps without the annotations is just useless, right? We don't want to learn technical courses by rote memorizing the steps. We want to understand when to use which steps and apply it to any problem on the exam. Now, most beginner students don't even have a framework for taking notes. So the QEC, the PSA, these are really good places to start. However, if you're trying to become a top student, there are some limitations to these methods. In particular, they mainly facilitate learning information in isolation. Yes, you might have the QECs for a class, but did you take time to synthesize multiple QECs together and form the big picture? Yes, you have the full PSAs for every sample problem, but what if the variables and steps were slightly changed? Do you understand the reasoning behind the steps enough to nail those curveball questions on the exam? Because when we evaluate or synthesize information in this way, it gives us a deeper understanding and that goes beyond the QEC or the PSA methods. Mind maps have been around. There are many ways to do it. There's lots of science that supports it. The smartest people in the world swear by it. But the truth is, it's a difficult skill to do. I was doing it wrong for a while, even during medical school. But the system I'm about to share makes it really simple. And I'm gonna demonstrate using an advanced medical topic just to prove that even if you don't know anything about the subject, that mind mapping can still help us learn the most complex concepts. And by the end of this video, we are going from a blank page to complete mind map. So first of all, just understanding why we mind map actually helps us better with execution. The process of mind mapping helps us understand the topic better. And second, the product, which is the mind map itself, helps us remember better. It's a great study guide for review. If we compare mind maps versus traditional notes, mind maps are better for review because they are expressive. They use visuals, analogies, abstractions, and associations. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? It would take me a lot longer to read through these paragraphs of notes. Whereas I could look at this and instantly remember what the whole topic was about. So that's the remembering side. But what about the understanding side? Well, I can see how every single detail relates back to the big picture. This is easy to understand because it's related to this, which is caused by this, etc. So compare that to learning with flashcards, which are isolated information. I can't see my thought process, right? This makes the big picture harder to understand. So everything we just went over is covered in our mind map acronym called TREE. Thought process, relationships, expressive, and efficient. Get it? My maps are trees, Cajun Koi Academy trains rangers, rangers protect forests, you get the picture. Hey Misty, can you activate the mind map protocol? Initiating mind map protocol. Step number one, prepare a list of key terms. So for this example, I'm gonna mind map nephropathology, which is basically the study of kidney disease. And here is my list of terms that I got from lecture. Step number two, outline the terms. So I'm gonna figure out which are the main topics and which are the subtopics. And this step really used to trip me up because I used to try to mind map all the terms at once and I would just end up with this really messy mind map that looks something like this, which is basically useless for review. So we wanna identify the main concepts because those will be the trunk of our tree, which will later be giving us structure to the rest of the map. Step number three is plot the main topics on the page. So I'm writing all the topics on the page here and I'm leaving plenty of room in between so that I can draw all sorts of relationships and arrows and stuff. For step number four, this is where the tree acronym starts to kick in. So in this step, we find the thought process. How do these main topics fit together logically? Like imagine that these are all individual puzzle pieces and we're trying to fit them together to see the big picture. I found that a good trick is to ask how do these key terms relate to each other? Are they similar or different? Can I compare and contrast them? Is one a cause or effect of another? Are these parts of a bigger whole? When I ask these relationships, it automatically implies that I gotta know the definitions of these terms. So let's go through some of them. Acute kidney injury. This is basically a type of kidney damage that happens abruptly, that happened like within a short period of time, for example, if I took a drug that I'm allergic to and it causes kidney damage within a few hours, 
I would say that I got AKI from a drug allergy. All right, let's look at the next one. Chronic kidney disease. This is basically another type of kidney damage. Uh, we see that there is a relationship between CKD and AKI. They're both types of kidney damage. If I compare and contrast them, I find that the difference here is that CKD takes place over a long period of time, typically years. So both are types of kidney damage. AKI is short time frame. CKD is long time frame. Next is end stage renal disease. This is also another type of kidney damage, but this one has been happening for so long that the kidneys basically don't even work anymore. So the thought process I'm realizing here is that kidney damage occurs on a time spectrum. AKI to CKD to ESRD. So I can visually depict this process by maybe drawing a spectrum and labeling it zero to 100. 100% working, 0% working. So the thought process is clear and now I might be able to group all the rest of the key terms onto the mind map based on this thought process, based on timing. Overall, this makes the big picture a lot easier to understand for me. Step number five, find the relationships. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the previous thought process step. We've basically already found the relationships between the main topics, but that's okay. Let's try to find some more. So I could group these other key terms according to the time frame. Some diseases tend to cause persistent damage over years. For example, if you have diabetes and you don't treat it, then it'll just keep causing kidney disease for years and years. But if you have something like an infection causing kidney disease, and you treat that infection within a few days, then the kidneys usually get better pretty quickly. So I could group these other key terms by relationship of timing. But I was reading a little more, I found another relationship that might be even more useful. So in general, the whole kidney system looks something like this. We have the kidneys, which are responsible for filtering our blood. So it picks out the good stuff to keep in our bodies, and it picks out the bad stuff that we just pee away into the toilet as urine. So blood coming in, urine coming out into the toilet. This whole thing in itself is another thought process that comes about while I was reading. So it's more memorable to me. And so all these other terms cause damage somewhere along this pathway. So the relationship here is location. All right, to spare you the time, I'm just gonna quickly fill them in. But for example, this disease typically happens here, damaging the kidney cells itself. This disease typically happens further upstream, causing less blood supply and basically starving the kidneys. And this disease typically happens further downstream in the form of a blockage that causes everything to just back up like traffic and it causes total mayhem. So even if I had no idea what some of these key terms mean, like renal calculus, is that some kind of mathematical equation for kidneys? I don't know, but I can figure it out. I would at least know that it causes disease in this location of the system. And the treatment for all diseases in this general location is the same. You gotta remove the blockage. That's why relationships are so important. It helps you figure things out. Now, for those of you wondering, renal calculus means kidney stones. Stones block urine from coming out, stuff backs up. Kidney stones are extremely painful because our body's trying to squeeze a giant stone through a tiny tube and it hurts. The solution is to remove the blockage with medicine or surgery or laser or whatever. Step number six is to be expressive. So I'm looking for ways to express ideas in the form of visuals or analogies. So instead of writing, renal calculus is the formation of hard deposits that obstruct and cause congestion of the ureter. Treatment of large severe urolithiasis includes lithotripsy versus nephrolithotomy versus blah, blah, blah. Like how long does that take to read and review, right? So instead I've expressed it as a visual. It makes it so much easier to review. But being expressive with mind maps seems obvious, yet we have a lot of students making mind maps like this and this. I'm personally not a fan. I would invest a little more time up front to deeply think about these concepts and what they're about and possibly find some kind of analogy to my favorite anime or Marvel movie or something. I want to express all my ideas visually. Step number seven is make our mind map as efficient to review as possible. So to do this, let's revisit all the other parts of the TREE acronym and make them all efficient for review. 
So first is thought process. I wanna make sure that I can easily see the flow of ideas. Because when I look at my mind map, my eyes should know exactly where the starting point is. I don't wanna waste my time trying to decipher my own mind map. Like, look at this mind map. It's kind of hard to tell where the thought process is and reviewing it would be really inefficient. I want to be able to see a clear line of reason. So maybe make the arrows thicker and bolder or make the main concepts really stick out. Like here's a spectrum of damage and here's a flow of process. Next is relationships. I can efficiently see the relationships between the ideas. One way to make it more obvious is by using color coding or highlighting. So for example, damage upstream is red, damage to the kidney itself is blue, and then damage downstream is yellow. Red indicating the kidney getting less blood, and then yellow for urine. You see how I'm abstracting right there. So another way to make relationships more efficient to review is to try to group together as much info as possible. You don't want to have like 10 different things coming out of one point. So for example, I've already grouped all these kidney diseases by location in the entire system, but let's say, what if I had like 10 different diseases here that cause damage to the kidney itself? You know, that's way too many. So I would do my best to find a way to group it even further. I'd have to look for even more relationships. And if I do a little more reading, I'd find that I can group the diseases by the type of kidney cell that they damage within the kidney. So like glomeruli, tubules, interstitial, etc. A general rule of thumb is that I try not to have more than three to four branches coming off at any one point. And then finally, expressive, which I've probably talked about enough by this point. Visuals are more efficient to review than text. A trick that I love doing is to pack a lot of info into one image. For example, if I have to memorize a bunch of details about a disease, like if this disease causes you to have moon faces, red urine, petechial rash, and I don't know, camel hump, then memorizing this list would be difficult if it's all words. But if I draw a picture that depicts all those details, then not only does it instantly become more memorable, it makes review much more efficient. So this whole process took me about an hour or so to do, including all the reading and trying to figure out important relationships which is totally worth it if I compare it to the hours of review I would save if I used this efficient study guide, plus the hours of relearning I might have to do if I didn't understand the relationships and thought process the first time around. So a lot of students swear by flashcards, and we were no exception. We even started a flashcard app. But being so deep in this craze revealed to me how terrible my flashcards actually were. Yes, it's a great way to study, but it's not easy to do well. And flashcards can actually be detrimental to our grades if done incorrectly. So in today's video, which is part of our study skills series, I'll be sharing our ultimate flashcard tutorial. It consists of three parts and it's important to learn them in order, so don't skip ahead. Part one is to understand the role of flashcards and how they fit into the overall study system. Flashcards help us rote memorize standalone pieces of information or isolated facts. What they don't do is help us understand concepts or piece them together to see the big picture. So there's this paradox with flashcards. The more we make, the more time we have to spend reviewing them and the less time we have to spend towards actually understanding and learning the main concepts. So it's important to know if and when to make flashcards. So before I'm tempted to make flashcard, I ask myself two questions. Have I tried to group the information together? In pharmacology, we have to know all these drugs. And instead of making 20 flashcards for 20 different medications, we want to take some time to group them first. Are there any underlying relationships between these drugs? For example, these meds here all end in the same suffix, sartan, because they help with blood pressure in a particular way. So what I would do is group them all by name and just make one flashcard for all of them. Or all these drugs are safe for pregnant patients. Or these work really fast and are used for emergencies. So taking time to understand relationships allows me to make far fewer flashcards that are actually more memorable. And the second question, is this piece of information important enough to memorize? Not all information is created equal. Most exams follow the 80-20 rule, meaning 80% of the exam comes from only 20% of the material. And that 20% is usually the main concepts, and that's where we want our attention to be. The rest of the material are details. And yes, some details are more important than others, and there are always going to be facts that are so obscure 
and so isolated from the rest of the material that you literally just have to rote memorize. Things like random dates or abstract names like medications, enzymes, rare diseases, equations, or anything your teacher says will be on the test. The list goes on. So this is why we recommend making your own flashcards as opposed to using pre-made decks from someone else. That way you're forced to understand the material and draw your own conclusions before you blindly commit everything to memory. All right, now we're on to part two. This is making your flashcards. So creating quality flashcards takes a lot of practice and you have to be very intentional with every card or else you'll waste a lot of time. So we'll start with some terrible flashcards and level them up using our framework here. Point number one is to make flashcards as simple and specific as possible. And this is usually achievable with only one topic per card. It should be black and white, right? It should be super clear what the card is asking for. If it's not, then you haven't broken down the concept deeply enough. For example, our terrible flashcard reads, what does blood do? This flashcard is super vague, right? It raises a lot of additional clarifying questions, like which specific component of blood? Plasma, white blood cell, red blood cell, where in the body, the lungs, the heart, the vessels. We know it's a bad flashcard when the answer is a long list, because when you study lists, you might recall some, but not all the facts. And this causes us to incorrectly gauge what we know and what we don't know. So to make this flashcard better, let's add a few clarifying words, like what is the role of red blood cells at the peripheral tissue? Okay, this is much more specific. At the peripheral tissue, red blood cells deliver oxygen in exchange for carbon dioxide. So these one-to-one -one cards force us to understand concepts at the fundamental level and leaves no question whether or not we know the facts. Tip number two is to include answer context. So on the back of my flashcards, I like to include extra details or references or context that help me understand the bigger picture. So in our example, I can improve the card by referencing a page in the lecture slide or in the textbook, or I could put a diagram or image or a comparison table differentiating between the three. I could even link a YouTube video but there's a two-fold benefit here. First is that I have a reference to help me refresh my knowledge if I need it, but more importantly, I'm actively trying to relate this card to all the other concepts and forcing myself to always think of the big picture. And point number three is to add memory techniques. Using flashcards to remember memory techniques is next level. It's like inception. You're memorizing how you memorized. But basically, if you have a mnemonic or an image, acronym, mind palace, story, or any other creative way to trigger your memory, it should be put on the flashcards. And point number four, make digital flashcards. And as someone who started a flashcard app, this should go without saying, but you want to have mobile access as well. Because digital flashcards allow us to quickly search for any card we need. We can organize our cards by folders and tags. We can make custom decks like for a midterm, or we can combine multiple decks for a final exam. We can study anytime, anywhere from the convenience of our phones. And most importantly, digital flashcards can use space repetition. This is basically a built-in algorithm that schedules your review for you based on how well you know your flashcards, which helps in overall retention. But not every flashcard app has space repetition capabilities, so be sure to check. I'm not really gonna recommend any specific apps, but I do suggest you try out multiple and then you pick the one that you enjoy using the most, not the one with the fanciest features, as you'll see why in the next section. Part three is studying our flashcards. Our tools are only as powerful as the way we use them. So let's talk about the key ingredients to get the most out of studying our flashcards. I like to schedule in time to practice every day and it doesn't even have to be that long, maybe like five to 10 minutes, just to start building the habit. Some common questions that we've gotten are, how am I supposed to finish all my flashcards in five minutes a day? Or how many cards should I do every day? And the answer is, it doesn't matter, as long as you're consistent. Remember that flashcards are just a rote memorization tool, right? They're not really a substitute for learning the information. If you find yourself spending more time practicing flashcards than understanding main concepts, like using mind maps or past papers or something, then you're practicing too many flashcards. So that's why I recommend pairing our flashcard studying with a routine that we already do on a daily basis. For example, always doing your flashcards when you're brushing your teeth. Here is a list of other examples. Also consider practicing flashcards in all the random pockets of time throughout the day. 
like waiting in line or riding past your princess with your bro. Here's another list of examples. Also consider pairing it with something you enjoy or rewarding yourself, like only allowing yourself to drink boba while you're doing flashcards at the same time. Here's a list of other examples that you can reward yourself with after doing your flashcards. Our biggest goal is to try to reduce the total number of cards in our deck whenever possible, because we don't want it to get to critical mass, at which point you're making more flashcards than you are learning from them. I'd recommend using the rule of three. If you've gotten a flashcard correct three times in a row, you're probably not gonna forget it, so just archive it. If you get a flashcard wrong three times in a row, then it's probably time to rethink that card. Maybe it's too vague and needs to be rewritten, or maybe it needs to be further broken down into multiple cards, or maybe you need to add a memory technique to that card. In freshman year, I took a physics class. Physics is hard, especially chapter seven on vectors and forces. I didn't get it. The force was not with me, but I was determined. Man, if I can't get forces, how am I gonna survive med school? So I studied my ass off. I mean, I watched videos, I went to extra office hours, I did problem set after problem set, and by the day of the exam, I knew every force question inside and out. And guess what? There was one question on forces. I got a C plus on that exam. Basically failed by Asian standards. You know, we're already stressed enough having to study this much, but then we're also expected to read your mind and just know what the questions will be. Life would be so much easier if we all just knew what was on the test. I learned the hard way. So in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how to figure that out how to figure out what you should really focus on, what you can just straight up ignore. And finally, once you have all the tricks, we will talk about a super secret study plan that you can use to ensure that you will never fail an exam ever again. This plan is pretty much foolproof and universal. It doesn't matter if you're studying for nursing school or the MCAT or your hunter licensing exam, these tips work for everyone. And we call it studying with a paintbrush. But more on that later, let's first figure out what's on the test. And I'm gonna show you a ton of ways to approach this. First, pay attention to what the professor emphasizes or hints to in lecture. They highlighted that word for a reason, or they spent half the class on that one slide for a reason. So if you notice any of the strange behavior and you're watching a lecture recording, then you best rewind it and make sure you understand that exact topic. So next, I took this a step further in college. Not all professors write their own tests, but many of them do. And this strategy works particularly well for those tests. What I did was I would compile a list of topics that I thought would be important, and then I would go to office hours and kind of play detective. If you pay attention, sometimes the professor would explain it very well and kind of give away the test question. But if the professor was kind of vague about it or it doesn't sound like they had thought it through completely, then maybe it's not that important. Sometimes the course syllabus will tell you plain as day what is important to know for the test. I know a lot of us on this channel are in medicine, so let me just show you this from our medical boards. I mean, look at this. Look how precise that is. If you're studying for a standardized test, then I would just do a Google search and you'd probably find this kind of breakdown for your test. Next, you wanna ask seniors or other students who've already taken the test. Like just straight up ask, what should I focus on for the exam? They might not remember all the topics of the class, so you should try to get as detailed as possible and kind of bring up some topics yourself. If they feel uncomfortable sharing specifics or if it's just against the test policy, then the next best thing to do is you could ask them exactly what resources they use to study. What review books did they use? Do they have flashcards or notes that you could look at? Any past papers? And this takes us to the next tip, which is to find practice tests, past papers, problem sets, and see what questions were commonly asked. If you're studying for a national standardized test, then this shouldn't be too hard to find. Like think about the MCAT, right? Like how many thousands of practice tests are there for the MCAT? But whether your exam has too many practice tests or too few practice tests, it's again, always a good idea to ask your teacher or ask your friends which practice resources they would recommend. Now, if you don't have any friends, then go online and see what people are posting on forums or YouTube or TikTok or wherever. You might have to do a little digging and who knows, maybe someone out there has an entire YouTube channel dedicated to the subject you're studying or even dedicated to the exact test that you're studying for. In most situations, taking practice tests is probably the best use of your time because the more practice tests you take, the more you'll start to catch on to what the important topics are. 
but also the more you'll start to think like an exam writer. The more you'll start to think, hmm, how could this information be asked in a multiple choice format or a fill in the blank format? Or how could they ask me to write an essay about this topic? You'll start to notice yourself think like a test writer, which is an amazing superpower because it's basically like reverse active recall where you can reverse engineer what's on the test. Okay, so now that you know what's important to focus on for the test, let's talk about how to study with a paintbrush. Let's say that this box represents everything that was presented to you for the exam. And let's say that this circle in the center represents all the important stuff that you definitely need to know. A newbie would just try to study everything from top to bottom. That's what I used to do freshman year. I would naively read my textbook as if it were a novel from beginning to end. If I had to demonstrate what that would look like with a paintbrush, it would look something like this. I mean, I was trying to pick up every little detail. I didn't want to miss anything. But since I was spending so much time trying to catch every little detail, by the time the exam came around, I hadn't even gotten through all the important material yet. I mean, obviously I was a diglet. I had no idea what I was doing and I was literally just digging aimlessly. But now I've evolved and I know a better approach. And that is to start studying from the center and gradually move outwards. And with a paintbrush, it would look something like this. And I know it might seem weird at first because you might be going a bit out of order, but by the time the test rolls around, even if you haven't covered everything, you can feel reassured that you've at least hit the most testable topics where you'll score the majority of your points. So the other thing you gotta understand about paintbrushes is that when you paint over something, you'll always miss a spot. But that's okay. Don't ruin your flow trying to go back and fill in all the missed spots. Just keep going. Study all the way through in one complete stroke. That's how you always wanna approach it, especially when learning new content. Each pass through is quick, but every time you go through again, you pick up more details and you fill in more gaps. The first time through, you're just trying to scope the subject. Then you're trying to grasp the big picture concepts. And then you're trying to learn the details. Okay, I tried just about every memory technique out there, and since I've been through medical school, I've had a lot of time to experiment. I came across the fundamentals of how memory and the brain work from the books Limitless and Moonwalking with Einstein, and I learned that almost all memory techniques can be boiled down to three simple steps. Step one is to visualize. Our brains remember images much better than numbers or words. Like when I say apple, you instantly think of the red fruit, or maybe you think of the iPhone. But either way, your brain is not thinking of the text A-P-P-L-E. So step one is to take everything you need to memorize and turn it into an image. Whether it's a list of drugs or steps to a chemical reaction or, I don't know, dates to a battle, everything can become an image. For example, the number nine to me is a cat because a cat has nine lives. If something is uncommon or rare, then to me, it's a zebra. If you know what I'm talking about, comment below. But for a more complicated example, let's say I wanted to remember that labetalol is a blood pressure medicine that's safe to use during pregnancy. Labetalol to me is a betta fish laughing out loud. So I could imagine that a betta fish is laughing at a baby. And to take this a step further, if I have the scene drawn in a specific location, like in the corner of a mind map, then I'd be using visual spatial memory. Step two is to structure. There are many ways to do this because the brain is good at remembering things like stories, acronyms, mnemonics, alliteration, rhymes, and so on. So what we want to do once we've turned all of our info into images is to link the images together using some sort of structure. In med school, we had to memorize the cranial nerves, which control our senses. So like one does smell, two does vision, and so on. So for example, once I've converted all the cranial nerves into images, I could then imagine each of those images on each of my knuckles. That's called the knuckle method. Or I can imagine the images in specific areas in my house or in my bedroom. That's the mind palace. Or I can tell a story about the images and have them interact with each other in some sort of order. For example, once upon a time, a nose gave birth to two children, a Cyclops and Sleepy, and so on and so on. That's called the story method or the link method. And the best part about this is you only need to remember the first item and the story should just naturally flow. There's also this cool program called sketchy.com. I know this is not sponsored by them. They're just a really good example of what I'm talking about. They take all these complicated medical topics and turn them into visual storyboards for us. And then they tell us a narrative to make memorizing these things like 
drugs, bacteria, and diseases so much easier. Another tip for linking is to chunk things together. Like normally we don't think of a phone number as 10 individual digits, we chunk them together so that the brain only has to process three individual units. Another tip is to make the stories interesting. And what do our brains find interesting? Action, humor, and sex. So for example, don't just turn an image into a ninja. You wanna make it vivid, like tell a story about how the violent ninja would assassinate people and make it sexual, like how he would use naked women to beat his toughest opponents. And step three is repetition. Whenever we practice recalling things from memory, that knowledge becomes stronger. In med school, my favorite way to use repetition was through flashcards because flashcards utilize multiple strategies that boost our memory. Active recall, spaced repetition, and interleaving. Each of those could be their own entire videos. So if you're unfamiliar with these topics, I'll link them here or in the description. Another tip for using flashcards is to put the images and stories you made from steps one and two onto your flashcards to make the most out of this entire memory system. So now I'm gonna do a walkthrough of all the tips that we mentioned so far and try to memorize the shoulder muscles. And I'm gonna to try to not go too deep on the medical stuff, so focus more on my thought process rather than the info itself. So for this particular exam, there are four muscles. I need to know their names. I need to know how each muscle moves the arm and I need to know what tests to perform. Like if a patient comes in complaining of shoulder pain, I need to know how to maneuver the arm to figure out which muscle is injured. So that's 12 different things I gotta memorize, but I can chunk things together and reduce the total amount of things I need to memorize by just taking more time to understand the big picture concepts. So an important concept here is that if the muscle raises the arm, then an injury to the muscle makes it hard to raise the arm. And the test you want to do applies pressure against raising the arm. Basically what I'm saying is that column two and column three are opposites of each other. So if I memorize one column, then I know the opposite is the other column. So I've essentially chunked those two columns together, reducing 12 things down to eight. Now we can start to memorize. First is turning things into images. Terry's minor to me is Terry McGinnis, Batman Beyond. And a side note here is that we all have unique ways to visualize things based on our unique interests. Personally, I use a lot of images from comics and anime, but you can use what's most memorable to you. Anyways, I've turned the muscles and their tests into images. The test for the Terry's minor is abduction and internal rotation, which looks like you're throwing a baseball. So the image to me is a baseball. The test for the supraspinatus looks like you're emptying a cup. So the image is spilled coffee. The test for the infraspinatus looks like you're backhand slapping someone. So to me, it's a slap. And the test for the subscapularis looks like you're arresting someone. So it's a pair of handcuffs. Then looking here, I can actually chunk these two muscles together because they share the same root word spinatus, meaning spine. And I wanted an image that would reference the spine. So I chose Professor X because his origin story is that he got shot in the spine. And then I can chunk even further by combining the images of the muscles and the images of the tests. So now this image of Terry throwing a baseball to me represents multiple pieces of information. It represents the Terry's minor muscle. The way that you test for that muscle is to make the patient do a baseball throwing motion. And the opposite of that motion is how the Terry's minor muscle moves the arm. And likewise, I've chunked all the other images of the muscles with their corresponding tests. Step two is to link the images together. And going off our example here, I could tell a story. Terry threw a baseball at the professor's spine, causing him to spill the coffee on himself. It hurt so much that he accidentally slapped Sub-Zero. They got in a fight and then Sub-Zero got arrested. It's a little over the top, I'd say, but remember, you wanna to try to make it as memorable as possible with things like action, violence, humor, sex. But notice that this story has been now chunked down to only three plot points, yet in my head, it represents the original 12 pieces of information. And you can really do this for hundreds of pieces of info, right? This is how someone would memorize pi to the nth degree or memorize an entire deck of cards in exact order after seeing it only once. So for step three, I'll put this story into a space repetition flashcard. And it doesn't have to even be drawn out on the flashcard since I use the story that flows. So I can just put the first character as a memorization cue and I would run through the rest of the story in my head. Hopefully you saw my thought process here. Understand first, memorize second, and always be looking for ways to chunk things together. One of the most common questions I get from students is how do I keep track of my studies? In college, I had four to five classes at a time. In med school, I only had one at a time, but with the amount of stuff we had to study, it was basically like five. So if there's a lot on our plates, we need to know how to focus on the most important stuff. That's why I created the GROW method. It's an acronym for prioritizing your study schedule. G stands for GRID, an organized and visual way to display everything study related. And it's found in my study dashboard. So here are all the folders for my current classes. We have physics, chemistry, Study Quest, which is our learning skills program where we teach you how to get better grades in less time, writing, and 
Uh, this is actually not supposed to be here. I think that was uh, Mike's or my mom's or something. At the beginning of a semester, I'll open up every single folder and I'll input my class syllabus, including all of my lectures with their dates. And if I scroll to the bottom, any of my upcoming assignments for that class by status, and of course, all of my exams. And there's a cool formula in here that if I change the date, it automatically updates and lets me know how many days left I have to procrastinate. And that way, when I return to my study dashboard by clicking on method here, I can see the entire grid from one calendar. And if this looks kind of chaotic, I totally agree, which is why I have a few filters here where I can filter by the specific class, like only my physics class, and I can filter by type if I want to only see lectures or exams or assignments. These two views here for assignments and exams are going to show me all of the assignments I have for every single class and every single exam for every single class. So Grid is all about having a visual way to track everything. But we also need a way to manage a review schedule, which is R in Grow, record. After I start studying or I go to class, I'll open up a lecture and I'll record how confident I feel with that material. I keep it super simple. If I am confident, I'll mark Ranger. And if I'm not confident, I'll mark Rookie. If I haven't studied this lecture yet, it's gonna give me a mastery of none, right? Less options, less stress, hypothetically. Retire is for if I'm not gonna be tested on that topic at all. So let's choose Rookie here because I kinda suck at physics. <laughs> Pop-up's gonna appear here for me to record my review. I'll click Sounds Good and boom. Now clicking on that button triggers a sequence of automations that I programmed to where the last review date gets updated to today. And a review log is created at the bottom here that's also timestamped exactly when I clicked it. There are a couple more things that I like to record and I'll do so by clicking on the pencil next to edit here. I record how long I spent studying, 60 minutes or something. And I also record my mood. How did I feel during that study session? frustrated. Recording data about your study sessions is so underrated. You know, I used to never self-reflect on anything and then I'd be shocked when I tanked another exam. Like, what the heck? Like, I would make the same mistakes over and over again because I was too dumb to realize that I was even making mistakes. Which is why in Extended Brain, if I go to my growth mindset dashboard in purple, this is where I journal, I set my goals, I track my habits, but there's also this page called the log library. And if I click on the log library, this is where I can view all of my global study stats. It compiles each individual review log, how long I studied for it, which topic I studied, and also that timestamp that was created. I can see every single time I was anxious, I was calm, I was energized. And if I switch views, I can see different combinations of stats. The focus view shows me by most recent reviews, how long I did in each mood. And if I go to consistency, I can actually zoom out even further and I can see my daily stats. My total study time for the day, which is a roll-up property calculating all of the different times that I put in, and also my procrastination rate, or what I call my study streak here. This is a formula that basically means if I study today, it's gonna check and it calculates at the bottom on a monthly basis how often I studied, or for me, my procrastination rate, which is not great, uh, 40%. And so with this data, I can self-reflect much more effectively to find weaknesses and gaps in my study habits. And that way I don't make the same mistake over and over again. Let's return to the study dashboard though. And from this grid view, I can see the last time I also reviewed a topic, the red pin date and my confidence level. Pretty useful, right? But for a more focused view, I'm actually gonna switch over to the table view. Now this grid displays only topics that I've started studying, right? Stuff that's either rookie or ranger. And it's organized by class, like physics, chemistry, uh, study quests. This is my preferred grid view for managing my review schedule because I can see my mastery, the last review date, and also how many times I already reviewed this topic. Because the next step in GROW, O stands for overall outcome. Let's be honest, we're students, we procrastinate, we have a lot going on with One Piece, the new season of JJK, stalking our exes and chasing girls and boys who have absolutely no interest in us. I would say very few times in my entire student career did I master 100% of the material. And guess what? You don't really have to in order to do well. There's this concept called the 80-20 rule or Pareto principle. 80% of the test comes from 20% of the material. This is why, generally speaking, getting a B on an exam doesn't require like 
too much effort. But the jump from a B to an A requires so much effort because now we're entering that 80% territory. You have to cover a lot more information just to get those last few points. Again, this is a generalization for sure. It depends on the class you're in. But if you think about studying that way, it means you can be much more efficient with your time by focusing on the bread and butter fundamental lectures of your class, right? My point is you don't need to study every single detail for every lecture. It's impractical and honestly, not really worth it. So if I know one of these lectures is gonna be very heavily tested, I'm actually gonna do myself a favor and change the icon to a star. And that lets me know I should probably prioritize it. But aside from that, I'll just aim for an overall outcome of making my grid as green as possible, knowing that it probably won't turn completely green. And to make sure that I'm headed for that overall outcome, I choose to study the weakest topic first, the W in GROW. Most students don't do this, right? They just cycle through lectures one through 10 over and over again. I know this because I used to do it too. But remember, you're probably more confident in some lectures than others. And also not everything is equally important. Important. And so I used to waste a lot of time reviewing stuff I didn't need to, not reviewing stuff that I needed to. So with GROW, that means to focus on the stars first. And if those are all good, then I'll move on to the weakest rookie topics first. And if there are multiple rookie topics, I'm gonna choose the one that I haven't reviewed in the longest time. For example, that'd be FORCE right here and also the ones I haven't reviewed as many times. So the GROW method makes it so simple to decide what to study every single day. And I can save all three of my tiny brain cells for actually learning. And it also reduces test anxiety because I can see from my grid view, the overall outcome, right? Of how confident I am and how prepared I am for my upcoming exam. Unless of course, everything is still red, in which case you have my permission to panic a little bit. All right, so knowing what to study is step one, but we also need to know how to do it effectively, which is the second core part of the learning system. I see learning as a three-part cycle, construct, connect, and challenge. Think of it like filling out a puzzle. We construct chunks, connect them to create some understanding, and then challenge ourselves to make sure it's accurate. The goal of this cycle is to guide us in critically thinking while we study. So we're not just cluelessly writing things down or blasting through thousands of flashcards without thinking about why. And recently, the most game-changing tool to help navigate the cycle is AI. And very conveniently, Notion has its own native AI, which I'll use to demonstrate this entire process. So let's imagine that I'm going to review for physics today. I'm actually gonna open up the physics folder into a full screen. I'm going to scroll down to the review tab to see my grid view and choose the weakest topic, which is gonna be two-dimensional kinetics. I'll open it up, scroll down to the notes area, and I'm gonna create a new note here. Let's give it a name. Newton's got nothing on me. And I'm actually gonna open it up into another side peek there. When I create a note from the lecture itself, it automatically links and also links back to the class it came from. So just extra organization there without any extra work. I'm gonna choose this note template. Now, if I go to any blank block in Notion, I'm gonna see faintly in gray, press space for AI. Simple enough, I can follow instructions. Let's hit spacebar and a whole list of options for AI will appear. And Notion AI basically becomes my personal assistant to study smarter. But the thing about AI is that the quality of the response that you get is dependent on the quality of your input. And to be completely transparent, I think that most of these stock prompts in Notion AI are not really good for learning. So instead, here are a couple of my favorite prompts for each step of the CCC cycle. Let's start with construct. Construct is how we approach learning new information. Think of it like taking a road trip. You wouldn't just blindly pick a spot on the map and then just start driving there. You want to map it out first, right? Maybe look up a few spots along the way, route the course so you don't get stranded in the middle of the desert somewhere. Well, you want to take that same approach when you're studying. In cognitive psychology, this is called priming, basically preparing our brain for learning. So before diving in, ask Notion AI for a roadmap. I am a beginner to physics and I am learning about two-dimensional kinetics today. Give me a list of most important concepts to know, define each concept in simple terms to the beginner, and then explain how I should approach learning this topic to understand the main ideas. Let's see what I get here. And cool, we have a very useful primer to uh, orient ourselves before diving deeper into this concept. Here's another great way to construct. Take a peek at the learning points or the learning objectives for your upcoming lecture. This is your professor basically telling you what is most important to learn. So highlight your learning objectives, go back to Notion and ask AI, I am learning, uh, what was the topic actually? Relative motion, distance, and displacement, distance and displacement today. Here is the list of learning objectives I need to know. Give me a brief and clear summary and how I should approach 
this lecture. And then go ahead and paste the learning objectives below. I'm gonna give them dashes just to differentiate it. And let's see what Notion AI gives me. I love this, it's giving me a step-by-step -step approach to learning this lesson. All right, so next is connect. Connecting the dots of the material to the roadmap. In our road trip example, we've now hit the road and we're seeing the landmarks and we're associating the streets and the stores with a map and we're filling in all the details in our brain with that map that we made. In terms of learning, this means identifying relationships between concepts and seeing how everything fits together. Looking for relationships is probably the single most important thing you can do to retain what you're learning better. So as you go through your lecture and you encounter different terms like these, go back to Notion AI and you can ask it, create a table comparing and contrasting the relationship between displacement, distance, and kinematics for me. Then why this relationship is important for understanding the main idea. Notion AI will even format it in a table like this, which just makes it so much more clear and easy to read. I get to see relationships and also this quick summary about why it's important. Here's another connect strategy. When trying to understand complex topics, it's easier to find relationships with things that you already know. That's called making an analogy. So if I get stumped on like a really difficult concept, right? And rereading that same slide five times over again isn't suddenly gonna make it make sense. So try giving AI this prompt right here. I am having a hard time learning about scalars versus vectors. Give me three simple analogies to help me understand it better. Then explain the strengths and weaknesses of each analogy. It gives me three different simple analogies that I can use and explains why they're useful. And now I can use my prior knowledge about some analogies that I know about and understand this concept a lot more smoothly. All right, and finally, challenge. Challenge is testing our knowledge to make sure that we actually even learned anything. Right, it's taking that road trip again, but this time without GPS and without a map and trying to use all those associations that we learned to figure it out on our own. But the most important part with the challenge is that you actively recall the information without peeking at your notes and without peeking at any resources. And AI can help us out in really cool ways here. One way is to ask Notion AI to create a practice test for you. I am studying motion, displacement, movement, and distance, I think it was, uh, in physics class at the college level. Create a 20 question multiple choice practice test. And you can substitute multiple choice for whatever your test is gonna be. I recommend challenging yourself the exact same way that you're gonna be tested. And if you want, you can even tack on this at the end of it. Make sure to include questions about these learning objectives and then you can paste the learning objectives below. All right, and let's see what I get. Fire, look at that. I love to see it work. And of course, you should take that practice test on your own without peeking at your notes. You can ask Notion AI for the answers and the explanations so you can check your work. All right, here's a second way. Test yourself by explaining the concept first and then asking AI to evaluate your thinking and your accuracy. So you can say something like this. I am studying for physics class and learning about displacement versus distance. Evaluate if my understanding of this topic is correct. Challenge yourself to explain this topic without peeking at your notes again, right? So displacement and distance both mean how far away you are to a patient. However, displacement refers to net, uh, Let net miss away from the patient and distance refers to Let's see if I got that right or not. Cool, and it gave me a great answer. It says I'm partially correct. And you can kind of just keep working back and forth with it until you deeply understand that concept. And the best part about using AI the way I'm showing you here with Construct, Connect, and Challenge is that you're still actively studying, right? I'm not just looking stuff up, but I'm actually thinking critically about what I'm studying. We ran a poll on our YouTube community, and not surprisingly, the majority of us agree studying is boring. But I've spent over 10 years building my learning skills to now teaching them in a program study quest, and I never thought I'd say this, but studying is kind of fun. So I want to share three lessons from my personal journey that have made studying not just bearable, but actually enjoyable. If studying is boring to you, you're not hitting the learning sweet spot. The way that you're studying doesn't engage your brain to enjoy learning. Robert Bjork describes this concept called desired difficulties, where there's an optimal level of effort we need to expend, a sweet spot in order to both enjoy and learn from studying. If it's too easy, we'll get bored. But if it's too challenging, we'll get frustrated and also bored. Think of it like playing a video game. Let's use Valorant. As you get better and you win matches, you're gonna rank up and queue against more competitive players. But what if you you are only allowed to play against complete noobs, you know, like first time players. The first few pub stomps, you know, might feel pretty satisfying, but eventually you're gonna get really bored and then stop playing. On the other end, if you're thrown into matches against the best pros in the world, you're gonna get steamrolled over and over. And no matter how much effort you put in, they're 
are just too good. And yeah, you'll probably also get bored and stop playing. Our brain enjoys a challenge, but not futility. If it feels pointless to try, both trying too hard or not trying at all, it is really hard to enjoy what we're doing. But if we hit that challenge sweet spot, which Bjork found to be just a little bit outside of our comfort zone, it's addictive to our brain. And yes, this is partly why we can play video games for five straight hours without feeling bored. But there's a very important nuance to desire difficulties that I want to talk about. Just because we hit that sweet spot doesn't necessarily mean it's better for learning, because studying and learning are not the same thing. Studying is like the physical actions and the study techniques that we use. Learning is what we get out of using those. So it's more than just about making it more effortful. We need to hit that sweet spot for the right type of effort. For example, I can make practicing flashcards more challenging by dimming the lights in the room or putting a movie on in the background. Like sure, that's more challenging, but it's not really going to help me get more out of doing flashcards. So the question I ask myself when I'm bored isn't just how can I challenge myself more, but how can I challenge myself to think about what I'm learning more? Reviewing the same flashcards 10 times or even 20 more times for my exam, it's more challenging, sure. And uh, in hindsight, regrettably, that's something I used to do a lot in medical school with like Anki and RemNote. But challenging myself that way with doing more reps doesn't make me think about the information any differently. I'm not learning anything new when I review that flashcard again. Therefore, I'm not challenging my brain to think and I'm gonna get bored. What if instead you laid out five flashcards on your table and then you challenged yourself to find what are the similarities and differences between these different concepts? Or how can I describe what this flashcard is saying using an analogy? Turn it into a game, and now you're engaging your brain to think differently. So next, if you're the type of student that can't focus on a subject, then you don't see why it matters. I'm sure you've probably thought while studying, why am I learning this because this information is useless and I'm never gonna use it. If you have to ask yourself that question, then you need to make it matter and make it more relevant. I'm not gonna lie, in medical school, there were a lot of classes that I felt this way about, particularly like biochemistry and obstetrics. But I found allergy medicine really interesting and fun to learn about. And I'm positive now it's because I personally suffer from terrible allergies. I have food allergies, I can't eat peanuts, cashews, and other nuts. I can't drink alcohol without turning into a tomato. You know, being outside all year round makes my eyes and my nose cry. I can have pets because of dog and cat dander. Even my own sweat breaks my entire body out in hives. And because allergies impact me on such a deep and emotional level, learning about how that works was like learning about myself. It was like I was solving my own problem. So that got me thinking, if I can figure out a way to understand how the thing I'm studying is used to solve real world problems, would that make it more interesting? And the answer was absolutely yes. Like say you're in physics class learning about frequency and pitch and all you see are the equations. It's a pretty elusive concept to grasp and it's hard to see how that's useful. But what if instead you learned it in the context of how a piano works or how a guitar produces music? Now, all of a sudden, understanding sound waves and frequencies and pitch becomes super interesting because it's relevant to how it's being used in the real world. So my point is, if what you're learning seems boring or irrelevant, then make it relevant. Ask ChatGPT, how is this concept being used in the real world? Watch documentary about it, or watch some YouTube videos about it, read up on case studies. If we can understand why a concept matters to solve our own problems, or how it was used to solve other people's problems, especially the people that we admire or look up to, like other creators or influencers or celebrities and stuff, it immediately becomes much more interesting and enjoyable. Finally, studying might be boring because you view it as a chore. Not a lot of people get a dopamine rush from taking out the trash or cleaning the toilet. Those are things that we see we have to do, not necessarily the things that we want to do. But you can change your perspective and stop viewing studying like a chore. And the reason this works is because of how our brain interprets perceived control. When we feel like we have no control, we get stressed out, hopeless, and then we lose motivation. But if we can reframe our mindset to look at things through a lens of gratitude, we can actually enjoy it. Because the only thing that we can control is our mindset. It's like if you're baking a cake for your friend's birthday and you think, ugh, I have to bake this stupid cake because they want it, it's gonna be such a drag. That statement in itself comes from a place of having no perceived control. But if you think instead, I wanna make this cake because I know it'll make them happy and I like doing nice things for my friends, then it becomes something you actually enjoy. You've regained control because you want to do it for your own fulfillment. And so think about this in terms of studying. If you know you're gonna spend 20 hours studying for next week's exam, like that's for sure gonna happen, how do you wanna approach it? You can either be stressed out and feel like you have to study, like it's a chore, or you can accept it, relax, and enjoy the process. The choice is 
yours. You're gonna study 20 hours either way. Do you want it to be stressful or do you want it to be joyful? Now, if you'll notice, the thing that each of these three lessons have in common is how they're focused on what's happening in our brain versus what's happening on our computers or on our notes. And that's because enjoying learning has nothing to do with the actual study techniques or the fancy apps we use. It's all about the way we train our brain to think about information, to make it matter to us on an emotional and relevant level, and to see it from a glass half full versus half empty point of view. If you're tired of putting in tremendous amounts of effort, hustling eight hours a day, and you're still not seeing progress, it feels demoralizing. Everyone says consistency is king, that as long as you show up every day, you'll experience a massive transformation. But consistency is only half the equation. It can only take us so far before it plateaus, or worse, leads us straight to burnout. If we want to experience continuous growth and get 1% better each day, we need to complete the other half of the equation. Carol Dweck, professor at Stanford University and author of Mindset, discovered an intimate connection between our mindset and achievement. Her research revealed that those who believe their abilities could improve with effort reached higher levels of achievement than those who didn't, a dichotomy called the growth versus fixed mindset. Those who possess a growth mindset are consistent. They welcome challenges, persist despite setbacks, and put in tremendous effort because they believe in themselves. On the other end of the spectrum, those with a fixed mindset lack consistency. They give up when faced with challenges because they believe their efforts are pointless. But Dweck also stresses the equal importance of another aspect of the growth mindset, self-reflection our ability to learn not only from our past failures and criticisms, but also from the failures of others. Because what good is facing Ganon the hundredth time if you don't try anything different? What good is retaking a failed exam over and over if you don't self-reflect on the mistakes that you made? Self-reflection is the missing half of the equation to experience real growth. So I wanna share my process for self-reflection. It's a three-part cycle, CCC, and it's worked amazing for me. The first step I call collect. We need to collect data from each experience so that we have information to self-reflect on. Back in my pre-med days, when I had pretty poor study habits, I would grind for eight to 10 hours a day for weeks. Some exams I do well with, but some I completely tank. And when it was time to ask why I got that score, I was left scratching my head because I didn't have any data to go off of. I didn't collect any information during exam prep, so how was I supposed to know what to change? If we want to improve our lives, we need to collect data about our process and the experiences we had. So for me in med school, this included everything from study sessions to clinical rounds. And each of those experiences, I'd collect data. How long did I spend studying? How many times did I get distracted? How do I feel? You know, what's my energy level like? Because with that information, I can better understand how my process led to the outcome, which now brings us to step two of the cycle, which I call calculate. Most of us struggle with asking the right questions to identify what needs changing. We usually ask questions that are too vague, like, did you study enough for this? Or too narrow, like, how many times should I practice this one flashcard to make sure I understand this tiny concept? Neither of these give us much useful insight. So I really like Chris Aguirre's triple loop learning model. He was a Harvard professor whose model was used more in business organizations, but I think its adaptation to self-reflection is actually very cool. So we can think of calculating in three loops of increasing size. We start narrow and then broaden our reflective questions to gather deep insights into our beliefs and our behaviors. Single loop is reactive learning. It's asking, is there a problem that needs to be changed? For example, as a doctor, if my patient Mike had anemia or a low blood count, reactively, I'd identify and see that that is a problem there that needs some kind of intervention. So I'd give blood. The double loop is reframed learning. It's digging deeper and asking why the problem arose in the first place. Why does Mike have a low blood count? Does he have an open wound? Is he low on iron? Is there a history of blood disorders in the family? So using the information that we collected in the first step of the cycle, we can continue asking questions in the single and double loop to uncover insights about why we got the results that we did. And for a lot of people, this can be an uncomfortable process to realize that we have a problem and that our actions actually caused that problem. The third loop is transformative learning. Now that we've identified the possible explanations to the problem, we now have to ask ourselves, why does this problem need fixing? Why do I need to fix Mike's anemia? What will that do for Mike if I fix it? And what will happen if I don't fix it? Self-reflection is a cycle of breaking down our beliefs and then rebuilding them. It's identifying the bugs and glitches in our current behaviors and then updating our brain's software to correct them. The third loop is all about reconnecting with our values. We have to understand why we wanna change, what we believe change will do for us so that we can move on to the final step of the cycle with a clear head and purpose. Step three is course correct. Using the data we collected and the realizations we 
calculated, we set a new goal to course correct and improve the outcome. But if we want to get 1% better with each turn of the cycle, we need to set goals that we'll actually follow through with. Oftentimes, the goals we set for ourselves are designed to fail. They're too lofty or too confusing. So what I found to be extremely helpful for setting goals is using the SMART goals framework. It's an acronym for creating goals that ensures we'll be able to repeat the collect and calculate cycles and churn out continuous improvement with our self-reflection practice. S stands for specific, a clearly defined outcome for our goal based on our practice. For example, doing 30 practice questions each day. M stands for measurable. We want to be able to collect data from our practice, like how many questions we got right versus wrong or how long we studied for. A stands for achievable. We want to choose a target that's not out of reach. So choosing 30 practice problems is much more achievable than say 300. R stands for relevant. We want to make sure the goal aligns with our values and our beliefs, that third loop of learning. I want to do practice problems so I can do all of my exams and apply to medical school because I want to become a doctor. And T stands for time bound. We want to provide an ETA to create a sense of urgency into our schedule so that we can stay focused. And now the self-reflection cycle repeats. We execute on our goals during our next study session or work experience. We collect new data, calculate to gather new insights, and then course correct again to improve our process. As long as the cycle keeps turning, we'll keep getting 1% better every day. I think Carol Dweck said it best herself, unproductive effort is never a good thing. So don't let your consistency and motivation go to waste without self-reflection. How cool would it be to have a personal AI track all our studies? From tracking how well we know each topic to scheduling review sessions for us so we always know what to be doing at any given moment. Yeah, that tech doesn't exist yet, at least not yet. But in today's study skills episode, I wanna show you how to build a system that does everything I just mentioned to save you time and give you peace of mind to know exactly what to work on at all times. And yes, you can grab the template for yourself at the end of this video. So we call it the GROW method. The idea of the GROW method is to build an adaptable review schedule one that changes based on our confidence and how well we know the information. Before using the system, I would plan ahead of time when I would review each individual lecture one by one. Like on Monday, I'll do lectures one, two, three, on Tuesday, four, five, six, and so on. That's a prospective revision schedule, and it has some issues. First, nothing goes according to plan. Like, what if it takes me a lot longer to do lecture three? or I need to take Pepe to the vet, or I come down with explosive diarrhea. Then I have to shift my entire schedule around, which gets chaotic, and I get overwhelmed, and that makes my diarrhea a lot worse. Second, a prospective revision schedule doesn't consider how well I know a topic. If I'm super confident in lecture one, then reviewing it is a waste of time. It's like farming with level 100 Diglett. It's already maxed out. And say lecture six is high yield and tough, but I don't get to it because I wasted all my time reviewing the previous lectures. Then I double screwed myself for the exam. I wasted time reviewing stuff I already knew and I didn't review the stuff that I didn't know. So the GROW method avoids both these problems. And here's how it works. GROW is an acronym that explains the method step by step. The general idea here is to consider every topic as a plant or a tree. Some topics are harder to learn than others and require more time and attention, you know, more water and sunlight. The problem is we only have a certain number of days until the exam, which means we don't have unlimited water. So the GROW method helps us distribute our water efficiently. We schedule our reviews in a way that prevents overstudying topics we find easy and understudying topics we find challenging. Basically, spend more time with topics we're less confident about. Here's how it works. G stands for GRID. This method uses a grid calendar or table type layout. You can use Microsoft Excel, you can draw it out by hand. We also built a Notion template that we'll link in the description below. We wanna make one grid per exam. List all the topics for that exam in the left column. And then every time a topic is reviewed, record the date to the right. R stands for rating system. We wanna come up with a color-coded system to rate how confident we feel about each topic. For example, you could use this red, yellow, green traffic light rating system. So every time we review a topic, we wanna to highlight that date with the color based on our confidence level. So if I didn't know this topic well, I'd mark it red so I know to spend more time and attention on it next time. O stands for overall outcome. The goal of the GROW method is that by exam day, we want zero topics to be red and as many topics to be green as possible. And W stands for weakest topic. With this system, we don't have to worry about planning what to study ahead of time because we'll always decide on studying the weakest topic at that moment, which I think is pretty nice because if I took the time to plan all of my review sessions ahead of time and then I fall behind, then I have to shift everything forward and it kind of ruins the entire schedule and it gets annoying. 
But using the grow method, I can study whenever I want and just look at what red topics or yellow topics I need to address. And if there are multiple red topics and I can't decide which one to review, then I'll go with the one with the least recent review date. We keep reviewing our weakest topic until our overall grid is as green as possible. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a very quick demonstration about how to use the grow method in a simple app like Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel, something that I know you all have access to. And I'm gonna leave the grow acronym somewhere on the screen over here so you guys can follow along and know which step I'm actually tackling. So step one is G, which is the grid calendar. So the cool thing about Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets is that it's already organized in a grid. So on the left side of the grid, I'm gonna put all the topics or um, lectures and across the right is going to be the date that you actually reviewed them. So let's just make an example that this is going to be anatomy class. What do people, what do we learn in anatomy? Can't think of anything else off the top of my head. The cool thing about using Google Excel, I mean, Google Sheets, is that you can duplicate each sheet at the bottom for every single class you're taking. You're probably gonna wanna make one grow table for each class you're taking. And so when I'm preparing to study for the day, I can just easily see every single class and quickly find uh, the weakest topic that I need to study for. But I digress, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Let's get back to anatomy here. Let's say that uh, today's date, which is November 30th, I reviewed this lecture and maybe I did this one as well. And um, this one, because why not? So moving on to the next part of the growth framework is R, rating system. So I want a way to actually rate my confidence after I reviewed each lecture. So a very easy to use rating system would be something like the stoplight system where red is super hard, yellow is kind of in the middle and green is super confident. I know this like the back of my hand. So for cranial nerves, I'm not super confident in it. So I'll give it a yellow and you can do that by just going up here to the fill color. I'm just gonna do yellow for that one. Sits muscles for some reason, I just got it easy so i'm gonna give it a green and neck muscles Ooh, these guys are pretty tough if anyone has studied anatomy there's a lot of neck muscles in there kudos to my ent boys and let's say that tomorrow i'm gonna review these other three lectures that i didn't touch yet so 12 1 22 i'm just gonna copy this and put them in these two cells and once again we're gonna use the r rating system and let's say that for some reason not the best day i'm gonna give this a yellow I'm gonna give this a red, and I'm also gonna give this one a red. Maddie's got a lot of work to do. Anyways, moving on to O, which is the overall outcome of what we want. We want to see as many of these become green as possible. And I'm gonna see that happen as I continue to review more and more and more each coming day. So let's fast forward, dawn of a new day. I just drank some coffee, I'm revved up, maybe a little bit anxious, sit down at my desk and I wonder what should I study today? And I'm gonna go with W in the framework, which is weakest topic first. I'm gonna take a look at everything I have here. The weakest topics are the ones that are in red and the ones that I should prioritize are the ones that I haven't looked at in the longest time. It's gonna be neck muscles, which I would look at first. And if I still have time, I'm gonna hit abs and then I'm gonna hit legs because we don't skip leg day, right? So as I review my weakest topics, I'm once again going to color code them using the rating system. And let's say that all of these were a little bit better. So we're gonna be yellow. And then I'm just going to continue this process, right? And look, we're getting to the point now where they're all turning green. Cool. But that doesn't mean I should stop studying, right? Because if my exam is next week, then I still want to have these fresh on my mind. Weakest topic just ends up being the last one that I reviewed. So for example, if I was going to continue studying for anatomy to keep it fresh before my exam, the weakest topic would now be the sits muscles because this was the longest to go that I reviewed. And what's cool about the grow system is that it's adaptable, right? It changes with how confident we are. So because I didn't look at the sits muscles for almost a week, maybe today as I reviewed it, I actually felt less confident than I thought I did. So just because it was green once doesn't mean it can't go back to yellow or doesn't mean it can't go back to red, right? Because our confidence changes as time goes on. Maybe we learned some new information. Maybe we did some practice problems and realized that, oh, maybe I didn't really understand abdominal cavity or brachial plexus as well as I thought. And I can change the confidence rating system accordingly. But yep, this way I always know what I need to be studying each time I sit down because I have the grow system in place. If there's a single study technique that trumps all others, what would it be? Think about your professor. They don't need to study flashcards or do past papers because they review everything daily. 
through teaching. Because when you teach something, you get to learn it twice. I picked up teaching in med school, which makes sense. The word doctor literally translates to teacher in Latin. And at the end of the day, what doctors do is teach patients. But teaching has helped me with so much more than just school. It's made me a more interesting conversationalist. It's how we started our side hustle and then turned that into a business. Teaching can change your life. But we don't need half listening students with their cameras turned off to learn from teaching. The only person who needs to pay attention is you. I mean, me, or yourself, the, the one doing the teaching. So I'm gonna share our 4S teaching framework and then how you can use it in two different ways. The first S is crucial. When patients have questions about their medications or diseases, I can't explain things to them using uncommon sciencey words. Most of my patients didn't go through medical school, so I can't talk to them the same way I would talk to other doctors. So it seems like the toxic exposure is accumulating in your ocular tissue, causing retinal degeneration of selective rods and bipolar cells. Louis is a smart guy, but this won't make sense to him. Instead, I would say, look, I know you're a painter or plumber, but here's the deal. If you don't stop eating paint, you're gonna go blind. So the first S is to teach in simple language, in a way that most people will understand. As Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I imagine myself speaking to a complete stranger who knows nothing about the subject. I'll avoid using jargon or key terms that might be confusing, but it also forces me to know the definitions myself. I also like to imagine myself speaking to a child. I'll use simple language and simplify my explanations. This forces me to understand the most complicated topics by their basic ideas. The second S I had to learn the hard way. When I moved across the country from medical school, I was a lost boy in a new city. I was completely reliant on my GPS for navigation. A couple months later, I accidentally dropped my phone into the river and surprisingly, it broke. I know, I was shocked too. But what's interesting is what happened over the next few days, because even though I'd been driving the same streets for months, I couldn't recognize anything. I never actually tried to learn my way around because I was so reliant on my GPS. And I realized that this is exactly what we're doing when we study with our notes open. We become dependent on our notes when we over-rely on them to teach. Most tests aren't open notes, so why study in a way that will handicap you for the exam? So the second S is to teach on stage. Teach as if you're up on stage with a microphone, no open notes, and speaking straight from memory out to a sea of students waiting to be inspired. This also works better when we teach out loud because it forces us to articulate things in our own words. When we're learning something for the first time, it's okay to peek at our notes, but ideally, teaching out loud and from memory is like the most reliable and quickest way to figure out how well you actually know something. Teaching on stage is how we overcome the GPS dependency trap. The third S I picked up while studying for my medical boards. A classmate of mine recommended I listen to medical podcasts, and I thought, oh, I can learn while I'm just doing chores to maximize productivity? Sick, dude. So I was at the gym, had my AirPods in, warming up a 315 bench, you know, no big deal, whatever, listening to a podcast about gallbladder disease. And I was like, what the hell are they talking about? It was super confusing trying to understand the anatomy of the gallbladder and how that affected all the surrounding organs. So I put down the bench, I took out a piece of paper, and I made a crude sketch, and all of a sudden, everything I learned just clicked. So the third S is teach while sketching on pen and paper, iPad, chalkboard, whatever method helps you facilitate what you're teaching. Not only does it clear room in your mind, which can only hold about seven things at once, but sketching activates multiple regions of the brain. We're absorbing, visualizing, creating, we're using multimodal learning. The fourth S is what makes teaching the ultimate learning skill. When we make our rounds at the hospital, attending doctors will cold call on us to randomly test our knowledge. I hated that feeling of being put on the spot and looking like a complete idiot in front of my classmates. If I didn't know the answer, it was embarrassing, but after that, I would never forget it. The information just stuck, and I realized they were helping us identify the gaps in our knowledge. So the fourth S is teach to stumble. We're deep diving into a topic and actively looking for weaknesses. This is one of the best ways to review for an exam, because if we can't teach something, do we really understand it? So those are the four S's of teaching to keep in mind. Now let's look at two specific techniques. This first one was named after Richard Feynman, one of the most famous teachers of all time. He was a physicist who could break down quantum mechanics into simple ideas that anyone could understand. And he does this by asking, why? Why is that? By asking why over and over, we're forced to break down a complex topic into its basic ideas. That's the power of the Feynman technique. Let's have a look. Step one, pick a topic to teach. Step two, remember the four S's. Step three, keep asking why until you've broken down a topic to its simplest parts, as clear as possible, down to a science. 
or until you start to stumble and identify your weak points. And step four is to go back to your notes, videos, and professors and clarify those weak spots. Once you've filled in those gaps, teach it and condense it again until you're confident with the topic before moving on. All right, so let's do a little demo. I'm gonna teach about cholecystitis. So cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. Let's sketch it here while we teach. The gallbladder is this organ next to our liver that stores a bunch of enzymes used to digest food. So with cholecystitis, this gallbladder is inflamed. Why? Well, this is often because a stone gets stuck at the opening here. If you think of the gallbladder like a tube of toothpaste, you squeeze the tube and toothpaste comes out this tiny hole. Well, imagine if there was a stone that was blocking this hole completely. No toothpaste is gonna to come out the other side, and all you're gonna be doing is building up pressure from how hard you're squeezing, and that pressure is actually gonna cause inflammation. So let's keep asking, why? Because it's very common for stones to form within the gallbladder. So, why? So stones form because, um, huh, I don't remember. So this is when I would go back to my notes and my resources to fill in that gap that I just identified. Five minutes later. Okay, got it. So the stuff that we're trying to squeeze out of the gallbladder, this toothpaste, is actually what we call bile. And bile is used to digest certain foods that we eat, mainly fatty foods. Why? So bile is actually composed of different chemicals, things like bile acids, bile salts, cholesterol, all these things work together that when they enter the intestines, they break down food. But sometimes bile doesn't function properly. Why? So if there's an imbalance in the components of bile, for example, if there's too much cholesterol in bile or something like that, this causes the bile to change consistency and clump together and form these little stones. Kind of like how toothpaste can harden when you forget to close the cap. Most of the time, these stones are harmless. Why? Well, because sometimes the stones are so deep inside the gallbladder that even though it squeezes, no stones get pushed out. But if the stone does somehow manage to get pushed out and it gets lodged in that small opening and blocks it, that's when we run into problems. So you can see that I've started with a complex topic like cholecystitis and I've broken it down into very basic ideas, comparing it to toothpaste. Analogies and stories are a great way to associate and consolidate information together in a way that's easier to understand. So I'll keep repeating that cycle until I feel confident in my understanding of cholecystitis before I move on to another topic. The next technique was introduced in The Adult Learner, a book on adult education that's been used to teach technical skills, sports, and even corporate and work life. The aim of this technique was to ensure that we understand how individual details fit into the bigger picture. And that's why it's appropriately called the whole part whole technique. The way it works is exactly how the name sounds. Step one, you start by addressing the big picture or the whole or main idea. Step two, you then teach the details or the various parts of that whole. Step three, then you wrap up by showing why the parts are relevant to the whole, why it's important to the big picture. We're constantly looping back to the big picture to provide context of every new idea that we introduce. So let's do another demo now. I'm going to teach cholecystitis and the gallbladder in general again, but this time, notice how the order of things I teach is different from using the Feynman technique. First, we start Start with the big picture or the whole. So when we eat fatty foods, like cheeseburgers for example, our gallbladder helps us digest it. Remember the four S's I'm sketching to aid in teaching? Now let's dive deeper into the details or the part. So when the food we eat enters our intestines, the gallbladder releases this fluid called bile that travels through a pipe called the common bile duct into the intestines. And there, bile works to break down fat so we can digest it because bile contains these fat-breaking enzymes. Bile is made up of different chemicals and enzymes, and if there's a chemical imbalance, it causes it to clump up and form little stones. So now relating it back to the whole, when our body needs to digest cheeseburgers, the gallbladder will squeeze and try to release bile. But what can happen, since there's stones, is that it can cause a blockage in that pipe and prevent bile from being released. Then, everything gets backed up. The gallbladder will try its best to squeeze out bile, but all this tension and pressure causes inflammation, and that process is known as cholecystitis. So I just explained another part, what happens when bile backs up and pressure forms, leading to cholecystitis. Now let's tie it back once again to the hole. When cholecystitis happens, not only can it be extremely painful because our gallbladder is trying to squeeze on top of a stone and pressure is building up behind it, our ability to digest fatty foods like that cheeseburger is impaired. Plus, if we don't do something to remove that blockage, all the stuff that's backed up here can get infected 
since bacteria love stagnant fluid. So that's why it's important in the overall digestive health of the patient that we treat cholecystitis, either with medicine or surgery, so that the gallbladder can function properly to release bile and we can digest fat and we don't develop an infection, which can be fatal. We constantly make connections of why each part is relevant to the whole before adding on more parts. So did you notice the difference in order there? In the Feynman technique, I said, here's cholecystitis, here's the definition, and here's the explanation. In whole part whole, it's kind of reverse. I start with the situation, the big picture and explanation, and then I give the definition of cholecystitis. The reason this works so well is because it gives context and helps you understand how cholecystitis fits into the bigger picture of the human body and our digestive health. That way, if I were to throw in other complicated diseases like cholecystitis or cholangitis, you'd still have the context of the big picture to see how everything fits together. While the Feynman technique simplifies the topic, whole part whole connects the topic to the big picture. So once you've gotten more comfortable using each individual method, I'd highly recommend combining them together to make it even stronger. This is how it could look. Step one, pick a topic to teach. Step two, teach from memory and while sketching. Step three, teach it starting from the big picture, the whole, and elaborate down to supporting topics, the parts. Step four, keep breaking it down into fundamental ideas in the simplest terms. Step five, then try to consolidate it all and connect it back to why it's important to the big picture, the whole. Step six, teach to stumble and then fill in those gaps. And step seven, repeat the cycle. All right, are you ready to have your mind blown? This entire video was structured using whole part whole. I swear, go back and watch it again and you'll see that every time I introduce a new idea, I give the context first. Then I explain the detail or definition and relate it back to the whole. These teaching frameworks are a great start and I seriously cannot stress how important teaching has been in my success as a student. This video is part of our Ultimate Study Skills series, and today we're talking about how to review for exams using practice questions or past papers. During med school, I remember going through massive Q banks on UWorld for big exams like the MCAT or the USMLE. Massive, like literally thousands of practice problems. But I've also taken classes where I was only given a few past papers, and I still made it work. And so I realized it doesn't matter if you have 10 practice problems or 10,000. If you're not using them properly, then it's going to be a waste of time. So how is this done? The most important idea to understand here is confidence. You know when you use flashcard apps like Anki or Remnote, after you answer the flashcard in your head and reveal the answer, it asks you to rate how well you know it. That's the important part. It's asking how confident were you with that decision? I would argue that it's smarter to rank your confidence before even checking the answer. Because it's not enough to just get the answers right. You also need to be confident that you know the answer and that you'll get it right again. We're confident that we know something, but it turns out that we were wrong. That piece of information is way more likely to stick in our memory. In psychology, this is called the hypercorrection effect. Like, I remember once I got into it with my friend that the main villain in Lord of the Rings was Saruman, and you know, we got in this heated argument about it. Then it turns out I was wrong and it's Sauron, not Saruman. Lost 50 bucks for it, and so yeah, I'm never gonna forget that again. So here's a three-step framework to raise your confidence when reviewing practice problems. Step one is to always make sure you know why the right answer is right and why the wrong answers are wrong. That's why it's always helpful to have an answer key to check your answers, and you want the answer key to be a detailed explanation, so it explains the thought process. Step two is to change the variables of the answer choices or change the variables of the question itself. So for example, if you know why the wrong answers are wrong, how would you change the wrong answers to then make them right? Or how would you change the question itself so that the wrong answers would be right? Because once you can start manipulating the questions and the answers, you'll start to think like an exam writer. I would say try to go even deeper and ask yourself, how could this question be asked differently on the test? Or ask, how could the teacher ask a curveball question or combine multiple variables into the same question? So now, so now I'm gonna use tips number one and two on some practice problems to see how this all works. And because I love triangles, let's do some trick. So let's draw out a right triangle here, like that. It's actually pretty good. And let's say this side here is a four, this one over here is six, and we'll be solving for this length here, which is X. And I'll put some answer choices from this problem set here. So A is going to be 12, B is going to be 7.2, and C is 17.2. 
So for my long lost memory of trigonometry and from Googling it like 20 minutes ago, I recall that to find the hypotenuse of a right triangle, the long side that's opposite from that right angle can be found using the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, I think I spelled that right, which is also equal to a squared plus b squared um, equals c squared c being the length of the hypotenuse the long side so with some simple plug and chug we get four squared plus six squared equals c squared simplifying this down we're going to get 16 plus 36 equals c squared uh, 16 plus 36 or is that 52 equals c squared and finally we just take the square root of each side because this one has a squared over here plug that into your calculator or wolfram alpha or whatever and we'll get that c is equal to 7.2 and that makes b the correct answer choice now what if this one practice problem was all you had to study for your upcoming quiz we can use tips one and two to learn a lot more from this problem so tip number one is to know why all the wrong answers are incorrect and why the right answer is correct right for math this is much more black and white like obviously i can just google square root of 52 and i'll know that it equals 7.2 not 12 or 17.2 right but i can also stop and think more carefully about why answers a and c were included at all like why is 12 and why is 17.2 possible answers that it could have gotten given this situation so from the limited amount of information that was given from this problem what else could i actually solve for right well i also know that i can find the area of a right triangle if i have the height and base of the triangle and those are two variables that i am given so the area of a triangle um, is equal to the height times base divided by two. Let's do some simple plug and chug here. We have the height of six times the base of four divided by two, and that is going to equal, doing simple math in my head, 12. Okay, cool. So answer choice A was solving for the area of a triangle, whereas B was testing for my knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. What about C? I see a 0.2 there, that decimal, and answer B, which we just solved for, which was the hypotenuse, was 7.2. So the only other variable that I can think of that would be equal to 17.2 would be the perimeter of a triangle, right? Just adding each side length together. The perimeter of a triangle is equal to A plus B plus C. Plugging all of those in, we would also get 4 plus 6 plus 7.2. Since we just solved for it in the Pythagorean theorem, this is going to equal 17.2. So C is solving for the perimeter of a triangle. So now I know why answer choices A and C were wrong. They were using different formulas, one for the area of a triangle, one for the perimeter. And now I know why B was correct because we used the Pythagorean theorem, which was the right formula for that equation. Now let's move on to tip number two. How can I actually change the conditions uh, so that I would solve for a different variable of this equation overall? Like what would it look like if instead of getting this here, I was actually given 7.2 and asked to solve for this variable right here? How would that change the way that I applied the Pythagorean theorem? So we can just kind of do the same plug and chug as we just did before, but this time it would look like this. We would have a squared plus six squared equals to 7.2 squared. So find that again, we would get a squared plus 36 equals to 52. And then we could just subtract 36 from both sides. I would get a squared is equal to 16. I would get the square root of a and 16. And that would give me this final answer of a equals to four, right? All right, let's do another one. What if, for example, this angle right here was unknown. It wasn't right angle. That means that the Pythagorean theorem wouldn't apply, right? I would have to use a different formula, right? Like the law of cosines. So we go in, so the law of cosines is equal to C, it's equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared looks bad plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of that angle 
So you see, I can just keep manipulating this one practice problem to generate a whole different set of problems to, to solve for, applying different constraints to solve different variables. Like how would I solve for this angle instead? How would I solve for this angle if it was a right triangle? What if this was a completely different shape? Like it had another triangle over here. What if it was three dimensional, you know? And it had this shape like that. How would that change solving for different angles? How would this change the way that I approach this problem? So effectively, I can turn this one practice problem into like 10 problems or more. This is such an underrated way to learn because it emphasizes making connections between topics and really challenging yourself to think more deeply. Connecting ideas like this differentiates them and makes them more applicable and usable in different situations. And remember that this is what your teachers are doing when they write exam questions. They're testing your ability to manipulate and distinguish between different kinds of concepts. All right, so let's get back to the framework. The last tip actually happens after you finish reviewing the problems for the day, and it's a really important step. You have to track your confidence for every topic you study. Otherwise, you'll end up wasting precious time reviewing past papers or even entire chapters that didn't need to be reviewed. There are different ways to do this, from the old school analog shoebox method to encoding entire algorithms, but let's be real, the simpler the better. Our preferred way is something we call the GROW method. Not only does it keep track of how well I know each topic, but it also serves as a study schedule that recommends which topics to study at any given moment, which is a huge time saver because I don't need to worry about planning a schedule ahead of time. Group studying can be disastrous, but with structure, it can actually be productive. So there are two major benefits from study groups, accountability and collaboration, but most study groups only achieve accountability. You see, what happens is that the gang gets together with some Taco Bell and they work together quietly maybe with a Pomodoro timer, and if everyone is working on separate projects, then that's as good as it's gonna get. But if you're like me, you might end up watching YouTube or doing whatever it is that's happening here. But when studying in groups, in order to achieve collaboration, we need to share knowledge and work together. Because just having more brains at the table doesn't necessarily mean that more learning is happening. In the hospital, one of my duties is to respond to emergencies. For example, if someone dies, we call a code, we deliver CPR, and we try to revive them. Yes, it can be as stressful as it sounds, but thankfully, I don't need to do this alone. There's a person who keeps time, they have a clock, and they tell us exactly when to deliver medications. We have a pulse checker who performs CPR and assesses the patient. And as a physician, I'm responsible for calling the shots and directing the crew. So as stressful as the situation is, things can run pretty smoothly. And I realize now the key to effective teamwork is when everyone has a clearly defined role. It's just more chaotic and dangerous when a bunch of people are frantically yelling, how can I help or what can I do? So how can this be applied to studying with other people? The first thing you wanna do is make sure everyone has a clearly defined role in the group. It's too hectic when everyone is talking over each other or doing multiple things when we should all be really focusing on one session together. I'd also say to keep the group lean, no more than five people. In my experience, the magic number is three because just like running a code, there are three distinct roles to delegate. There should always be a teacher, a student, and a timer or the carry, support, and healer, or master, padawan, and droid. Whatever you wanna call it, the point is that every time we switch topics, we want to rotate roles so that everyone gets a chance to be the teacher. The teacher leads the current topic. They decide which topic or which chapter to teach the rest of the group. Useful skill builds for the teacher role are the Feynman technique and mind mapping. To get the most benefit from playing the teacher role, practice teaching from memory without relying on any notes. And as you're teaching, you can use a whiteboard or a piece of paper to map out the ideas visually. We have a full video about the most effective teaching strategies that you can watch right here. As the teacher, hopefully you did your homework and know your stuff or else it's gonna get awkward up there real fast. And actually, I wouldn't recommend group study unless you're all prepared. So choose your guild wisely, otherwise you're collectively wasting each other's time. The next role is the student. This is the person who has their laptop and notes open and the role is to make sure the teacher is spitting out true facts. Useful skill builds for the student include higher order learning and using control find to quickly look things up. If an explanation is lacking too much context, the student should ask why? Why is that important? How is this relevant? And help the group connect small ideas to the bigger picture. 
If an explanation doesn't make sense, the student should ask clarifying questions, either by politely raising their hand, pinging the voice channel, or throwing carrots at the teacher, depending on the relationship. In the third role, the timer controls the clock. They're responsible for making sure that everyone in the group is staying on task. Useful skill builds for the timer are Pomodoro and Focus Mode. If an explanation rambles on or goes on a tangent, the timer must help the team regain focus. On the other hand, if the timer notices that the current topic is high yield or important for the test, then they can extend the current session or make a note to come back later. Group study sessions can definitely become battlegrounds for challenging each other's ideas, constructively, of course, but don't get too lost in the weeds and lose track of time. So based on Pomodoro principles, the timer should also make sure that the team gets an adequate five to 10 minutes of break after every hour of studying to kind of stretch your legs and grab snacks and energies. After the teacher finishes teaching a main topic and all concerns are resolved, we rotate roles to give every group member a chance to teach, to ask questions, and to hold the tomato. When it comes to roles, there should always be a teacher and a student. So if your group has only two people, and have the student also be the timer. Sounds fun, right? Well, let's see it in action from our first year rookies at Cajun Koi Academy. There he is, late as usual. All right, listen up guys, dibs on teacher. Any objections? Yeah, you're gonna have to bring me back up to speed. Like, what are we even reviewing today? Yeah, just look at the agenda. Kai set up a couple days ago. Uh, Kai, you good on me being teacher first? Kai, are you there? Also, can you turn your camera? We can't see you. Um, what are you doing? I can explain. You know we have a group study session this time every week, right? I'm sorry, I know, but dude, the McRib is going on farewell tour, and this might be my last chance to try it, ever. What are you talking about? They always do this. It's a scare tactic, man. It's how they get you. I know, it's working. I'll be super quick, I promise. Just make me timer anyways. I'm, I'm watching the clock, yeah? Uh, can you just go afterwards? Kumar, back me up here. Oh yeah, can you give me one too, actually? and a McSpicy and small fry. Cool, okay, bye. To understand how the nervous system works, I like to break it down into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is broken up further into two parts, the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. Right, but what's the difference between the central and the peripheral nervous system? Can you raise your hand instead of just interrupting me? What, how do I do that? Oh, <sighs> okay, to answer your question, the overall function of the nervous system is to send signals between the brain and the rest of the body. Think of it like Amazon delivery. The central nervous system is headquarters and the peripheral nervous system is a driver delivering the <laughs> I win. What are you guys doing? One hour later. All right, if you guys have no other questions, I've prepared some practice questions. What, you made practice questions? How long did you spend on this? Like five minutes. Okay, so I know this question is like bottom of the pyramid, lower order learning type of stuff, but if you guys have even been paying an ounce of attention. Dude, some of these are hilarious. Wait, did you see this one of Maddie here? <clears throat> oh, sorry, what was the question again? Come on, man. We're still on the first topic here. Yeah, my bad, but keep going. I think you're crushing it. Um, and by the way, Kai's supposed to be keeping time anyways, right? All right, that's time. One hour has passed. We should probably take a break and stretch so we don't overwork ourselves and burn out. Ta All right, guys, active recall, the best way to learn, backed by science. If you're not already on this, then I don't know what you're doing. In a nutshell, active recall is basically quizzing yourself. It was my secret weapon. It was my superpower all throughout medical school and even now as a doctor. But anyway, I'm not here to waste your time. I'm not trying to convince you. We're just gonna cut straight through all the fluff. Here are 12 ways that you can use active recall step by step on a day-to-day -day basis to get better grades. So the first way to use Active Recall is to pretest. You can start using Active Recall before you even start learning. Get a hold of some old papers or practice problems. It doesn't need to be a lot, just take a small quiz. And don't worry, you're going to get many of these questions wrong, and that's okay. And that's actually a good thing because you're trying to benefit from the hyper-correction effect. This is when you thought that you knew an answer to something, but you end up getting it wrong, 
and it makes it more likely that you'll remember the right answer the next time you see it again. Works like a charm, but many students skip the pretesting benefits. The next way to use Active Recall is to stop and recite. Okay, so we're still talking about using Active Recall before even going to class. Stop and recite is extremely effective for learning new material the first time. If you're trying to get exposure to the material by either reading a textbook or watching educational videos on YouTube, then what you want to do is after every section, you want to stop, close the book or pause the video and try to recite in your own words what exactly you just learned. And remember, the more explicit you are, like writing it out or typing it out or saying it out loud, the better this method works. And you'll find that some topics are just too difficult for you to recite. So make a note of it and then you can ask your professor during class or during office hours. So those methods are great prior to going to class. This next way of using Active Recall can actually be done during class. And that is to write out questions. Okay, here are some examples. You can turn each topic into a what is question. Like this slide is about addiction, so what is the definition of addiction? That's a question right there. You can turn each process into a how question. How is ATP made? You can turn each concept into a why question. Why is this so complicated? You can also look at the lecture objectives or review questions for that chapter. Those are free questions that the professor wrote for you, so don't sleep on those. There are so many perks to this method of active recall. Writing questions is kind of like reverse active recall. Like when the professor is talking about a topic, you want to think, how could this be asked on the test? Another perk is that writing questions keeps you engaged so that you don't fall asleep during class. But the main perk is that you'll have questions to practice recall later on. And by later on, I mean immediately after class. That brings us to number four, immediate review. So after class, I usually go straight to the library or go straight to the coffee shop. And since you've already written your questions during class, now is the best time to quickly run through them. And it doesn't need to take that long. And actually it shouldn't take that long because you're not peeking at your lecture, you're not peeking at your notes. All you're doing is just trying to recall straight from your memory, okay, that's it. So like 15, 20 minutes. You wanna go at it actively. You wanna to try to physically write out or type out the answers as best as you can remember. Okay, let's say that you fell asleep during lecture. It happens. Or let's say you were too lazy to write questions. Another way that you can do immediate review is by just going through the lecture slides one by one and try to explain or teach out the concept that was on the slide. So now we are in the time frame after going to class. And it's been at least a day, if not more, since you've gone to class. So your goal now is to make sure that you understand all the topics. One of the best ways to use Active Recall here is by using the toggles within a note-taking app. You can see that when studying for an exam, you have all the topics that will be tested all nicely packed in one place. And I have nested under each chapter all the topics, processes, and concepts that I need to know. And I can just go through, test myself on these questions, and then check my answers as I go. I like to use toggles on a note-taking app at this stage of learning because I can see how all the details fit into the bigger context of the exam as a whole. And obviously, when you take the test, the questions will come at you at random. For now, you can make sure you understand all the concepts and how all the pieces fit together before you start mixing it up. The next way to use Active Recall is using mind maps. This can really be used at any stage of your study schedule, but I find it helpful for me after I have a good understanding of the bigger picture. It's fairly simple to do. You grab a blank piece of paper, you pick a topic that you wanna study, and you proceed to brain dump everything you know about that topic. But the important thing to remember here is that you can't just throw ideas willy-nilly onto the page. You have to link the idea to something that's already on the page. So not only are you recalling specific concepts, but you're also recalling how they relate to each other. This next way to use Active Recall is great for study groups. So call up your friends, get together. What you're gonna do is teach each other. If you don't have any friends, then you can round up the gang and you can go ahead and teach them. Some people call this the Feynman technique. Some people call this the protege effect. It doesn't really matter. 
the one thing that does matter is that you have to teach from memory, okay? You can't peek at your notes. If you don't wanna talk out loud, that's fine. You can still get by doing something active like writing it out or typing out specifically what you wanna say in a script format. Because this forces you to really pick your words carefully. The beauty of this method is that you can apply different types of constraints. For example, you can pretend that you're teaching a seven-year-old, which means you have to use the most basic words possible. Or you can pretend to teach someone who isn't in your class or even outside of your field. And this means that you can't use jargon or you can't use key terms that they don't understand. Or you can pretend to teach someone who's very nosy. And this person will keep asking you, why? Why is this? Why is that? Okay, every time you explain something, they'll just ask you why. And you just keep answering until you've broken down your concepts into its most fundamental parts. This next phase of learning is when I feel like I understand the big concepts and how everything works. Now comes the part where I have to start memorizing all the little details. So the next way to use Active Recall is my personal favorite way, and that is flashcards, specifically digital flashcards. If you know me, then you already know this. Digital flashcards are mobile, they save time, they randomize your practice, and they employ spaced repetition. A lot of students love studying flashcards because you can find pre-made decks from other students online. I'm guilty of this myself. I remember downloading most of my medical decks from the top students. The next way to use Active Recall is enumeration. This method is particularly useful for process and problem-based classes like math. Because the way it works is that you have to recall the answers in a specific order. So whether it's the steps of a process or a list of a series, recall in the same order every time. By the way, notice how you can come up with your own mnemonics to help you with your enumeration. The next method for active recall is occlusion. And this method is particularly useful for recalling images, structures, graphs, charts, and that sort of stuff. I personally use occlusion a lot when studying anatomy and surgery because there were a lot of images to remember. RemNote Pro has a version where you can incorporate occlusion images with your flashcards, but you can also achieve this simply on a Word document if you wanted to. Just drag a box over the pictures, you can delete it to reveal the answer, and then you can undo delete to put it back. Occlusion isn't just limited to images, by the way. You can also occlude certain words from a sentence or a paragraph, kind of like fill in the blank type of question. This is called closed deletion if you want to get fancy with terms, but it's really useful if you don't have a lot of time to make flashcards or mind maps. You just cover it up and go crazy. Okay guys, now we're in the home stretch. We've learned the info, we've understood it, and we've started memorizing details. I would start doing practice questions as soon as possible. This is particularly important with math or problem-based subjects, but also very important for medicine and actually every other subject really. When you find practice problems, make sure that they come with answers and explanations to those answers. The key learning point here is that you wanna understand why the wrong answers are wrong and why the right answers are right. For a multiple choice question with four answer choices, A, B, C, and D, you can potentially make four different flashcards from that one question to review later. If you're preparing for an essay or humanities test, then try finding last year's writing prompts. So you wanna prepare your essay blueprints ahead of time, and afterward, your blueprints can be turned into flashcards that you can then commit to memory. That way, on the day of the test, you already have your essay blueprints memorized and you don't have to waste any time thinking about what you need to write. And the last and necessary way to practice active recall is by doing practice tests. Taking a practice test is mandatory if you're studying for a standardized test. So when I'm talking about taking practice tests, the difference here compared to just doing practice problems is that you're trying to mimic your actual test conditions as much as possible. So you'll want to time yourself. You'll want to only take as many bathroom breaks as you're allowed to. You want to wear what you intend to wear, earplugs, your lucky sweater, a face mask. The most important thing you want to get out of the practice test is to gauge which topics are your strengths and which are your weaknesses. So that in the final days leading up to your tests, you can really focus your active recall practice on the topics that need improvement. 
Space repetition, the best way to learn anything fast, backed by science. Space repetition was my superpower during medical school. It allowed me to learn so fast that I had plenty of time for other things like starting a YouTube channel, producing music, and building RemNote all during my training. The science behind space repetition can be quite complicated, but honestly, you can watch any other video on the internet for that. But in this video, I'm cutting straight through all that fluff and I'm giving you real life applications. 11 ways to use space repetition step by step to get better grades. In a nutshell, space repetition is simply spacing out your studies. It's the opposite of cramming, which means that all the benefits are also the opposite. At the end of this video, I'll talk about the most common mistakes that students make when using space repetition so that you can avoid it. But for now, let's get into the list. So I see space repetition in three different tiers. The higher you go, the more benefits you get, but also the more complex it is to apply. Tier one is the basics. You don't get the full effects, but it's easy to get started and you can start right after this video. So the first way to use space repetition is delayed review. And this is based on the science of memory decay. When you first learn something, give it some time to marinate. Allow yourself to actually forget some of the material. That way, the next time you review it, you'll struggle a bit more, but retention will be way higher. More effort equals more retention. So here's an example of what you could do with your class schedule. After you go to your first math lecture, just let the material sit and do something else, like maybe preview the history lecture for tomorrow's history class. Then tomorrow you can go to history lecture. But after that, leave history alone. Now that some time has passed since you've seen math, you can go back and do, say, the math homework or math review. Then maybe you can preview science, and then you can do the history homework, and then back to science, and then back to math again, and so on and so on. You're delaying your review, allowing for some space to happen between repetitions. The second method here is interleaving your topics. So it's kind of like the first method where you're spacing your subjects across multiple days. This method spaces your subjects across a single study day. So let's say you plan to study three chapters today. Instead of studying in blocks, as in only studying chapter one in the morning, only studying chapter two in the afternoon, and only studying chapter three in the evening, you can try breaking up the blocks and interleaving them. So for example, we could study chapter one in the morning, afternoon, and evening. With block study, your brain can completely forget about chapter one after the morning. But with interleaving, your brain is forced to hold on to chapter one material even while studying for chapters two and three. And this allows you to make connections between all the chapters. So the next time you plan to study for an entire day, like cramming for a test, try out this method. You're basically applying spacing to your cramming. So the next method is end of day review. According to the science of memory, we tend to forget more than half of what we learned within a day. So a good time to review newly learned material is to do a refresher at the end of the day. If you watched my other video about 12 ways to use active recall, then this is a great time to run through the questions that you wrote in class. It's okay if you can't remember everything, you can always review it at a later repetition. But the things you can recall will be better ingrained in your memory. Let's move on to the next tier. In tier two spacing, you're adding the idea that each repetition should be done in increasing intervals. The reason here is because again, it mimics the science of memory decay. An easy way to demonstrate this is the shoebox method, also known as the Leitner system. The way it works is that you have four or five boxes. Items in box one is studied every day, box two is studied every other day, and so on as you see here. Box five is retired, meaning that you already know all that material well enough and you can just quickly review it right before the test. So to start, place your study topics into box one. A lot of people use flashcards, but you can put whatever you like, past papers, problem sets, whatever. Every time you get a topic right, you move it up one box. Every time you get a topic wrong, you move it all the way back to box one. This ensures that you study your weaker topics more often. And this method is highly customizable. For example, you can come up with your own intervals, or you can move your wrong topics back just one box instead of all the way back to the beginning for a less punishing schedule. The next method is using a Kanban Kanban board. You can think of it similar to the shoebox method, but done on your electronic device rather than with physical cards. The columns will act as the boxes, and after you review an item, you can move it along to the next box or column accordingly. There are a number of apps that enable you to do this. Some free ones that come to mind are Trello and Notion. 
The next method is to use a study timetable, also known as a prospective revision timetable. The idea is that you're scheduling your repetitions ahead of time in your calendar. So you have the dates in the first column and then you can fill in your study topics. If you want to be more detailed, you can even put time in the first column. A common spacing interval is to double the days. So for example, if you're studying chapter one on this day, then the next time you'll study it is two days later, then four days later, then eight, then 16, and so on. Or if you wanna get really fancy, you can try using the Fibonacci sequence. There's another method for timetables and that would be the retrospective revision timetable. It's basically the reverse. Instead of having the dates in the first column, you put the study topic in the first column. And every time you review a topic, you rank it based on how well you knew it. So let's say that I studied chapter one on January 1st and I felt like I knew it well. I'd highlight it in green. For me, yellow is medium and then red means I don't know it very well. So unlike the other timetable, for this one, we don't plan out the schedule ahead of time. We just choose what we wanna study that day based on which topics are the weakest or based on which topics we haven't studied in a while. You just keep studying every day until all your topics turn green as you approach your exam. The obvious advantage of this method is that you're studying based on your strengths and your weaknesses. The next method takes the idea of retrospective revision and applies it not just to your study topics, but to individual concepts within the topic. For example, instead of deciding to study for the topic of pharmacology, I'm zooming in and studying individual facts from that chapter. This method works well using an outline or note-taking app because you can go down your list of concepts and you can highlight the questions based on how well you know them. Or you can use emojis if you wanted to. If you're using a note-taking app with a tagging feature, like RemNote for example, instead of highlighting, you can tag the concept. This way, you can later do a quick focus review on your weaknesses right before your test by choosing to study specific tags. So let's move on to tier three. These next methods I'm about to share will give you maximum space repetition benefits. So in tier two, the intervals are increasing, but the optimal spacing is having the intervals adjust to you. Your understanding of topics can fluctuate, so the intervals for specific topics can get longer or shorter based on how well you know that topic. And this can get extremely complicated, but luckily we have spaced repetition algorithms. Think of it like the YouTube algorithm. It recommends videos that it thinks you'll enjoy based on your personal watch history. Well, in the same way, spaced repetition algorithms will recommend specific topics for you to study based on your personal mastery of those topics at that moment in time. So this next method is to use an app with built-in space repetition algorithms. Some of the old school ones are Super Mimo and Anki, but nowadays there are plenty of other options with all sorts of aesthetics and gamification. The next method is custom space repetition within a note-taking app. So there's been a recent trend of people trying to build space repetition algorithms directly into a note-taking app like Notion or Roam Research. I admire the creativity of these DIY algorithms, but the main downside here is that it requires some form of plugin or add-on or custom coding that you have to do yourself, which can make it very complicated if you don't know what you're doing. Personally, I think it's a lot of work and hassle to go through just to achieve makeshift space repetition. I mean, you can pack on as much muscle as you want. A diglet is still just a diglet. Now let's talk about the biggest mistake that students make when using spaced repetition. And that is, you gotta combine spaced repetition with active recall. So if you're using spaced repetition to space out how many times you reread your notes or rewatch your lectures, then you're missing the point. When it comes to studying, active recall is what you do and space repetition is how you do it. They go hand in hand, like sword and shield. Which means the best study strategies are some combination of methods in this video and methods mentioned in our previous active recall video. Whether it's combining retrospective timetables with practice problems or the shoebox method with mind maps, or spaced repetition algorithms with flashcards, you wanna mix and match based on what type of subject you're trying to study for. Our brains love to play tricks on us. The brain is a highly efficient machine, and in order to conserve energy, it likes to take the path of least effort, which means we might feel like we're learning when in actuality, we could just be wasting our time. These are what we call the illusions of learning. And here are the top three that you gotta look out for. First, we have the illusion of competence. 
Have you ever read through a really complicated topic and felt like you actually understood it? It's like a light bulb moment. Or maybe the teacher explained a difficult math problem and all of a sudden it just clicked, like it actually made sense for once. That's your brain giving you a rush of dopamine. It's that aha moment. It feels great, right? Well, don't let it fool you. Our brains tend to overestimate how well we understand a topic. This illusion of competence often reveals itself when we're asked to explain the topic ourselves or when we're asked to apply it to solve problems on our own. I've fallen into this trap for so many years, so many hours of my life wasted. I'd feel so good like, dang, I actually understand this. And so as a result, I wouldn't study as much. And then I take the exam and realize, oh crap, I've seen this problem before, but I don't actually know how to do it. So don't fall into this trap. Remember to always practice your knowledge. Prove it to yourself that you know how to use it. And don't be tricked by the dopamine rush of the light bulb moments. A good rule of thumb is that if you can't explain a concept to someone else, like if you can't transfer your knowledge accurately from your brain to someone else's brain, then it's probably not well ingrained in your brain to begin with. Next is the illusion of familiarity. Have you ever started reading a flashcard and instantly you knew what the answer was before you even finished reading the question? Well, you probably saw a buzzword or a phrase in the question that immediately triggered your memory. This is because you've seen that flashcard so many times that you've just wrote memorized it. So look at this real quick. This is the example we like to use in our study quest course. We'd show this partial question on one side of the flashcard and immediately a bunch of students would already know the answer without even seeing the entire question because this buzzword right here triggers your memory. You're used to seeing these two words in association. And don't get me wrong, this trick is great for memorization, but in most classes, especially in college level and higher, we're expected to master our knowledge one step further than just memorization. Sure, it feels great to be able to breeze through your flashcards effortlessly. But sometimes you gotta take a pause and ask yourself, do I really understand this concept or did I just memorize it? Another common scenario for me was when I did so many practice problems that I started to memorize the exact order of the answer choices. And it got to a point where I would know the answer even before reading the question. That's the illusion right there. Sure, I know the right answer to this practice problem, but do I know the reason why that answer is right? What if on the exam they ask the same question, but they change one word or one variable, and now it's asking something completely different? Would you still understand it enough to solve it? Well, I have two tips for you here. First, you wanna make sure to mix up your study techniques. This is a strategy called interleaving. Don't just rely on a single technique like flashcards. You wanna mix it up. Try teaching, mind mapping, blurting, practice problems, group study sessions, or all the above. For those of you who go to the gym, it's a very similar idea to muscle confusion, where you do different exercises targeting the same muscle so that the body doesn't get used to it. The same idea here is that you don't want your brain to get used to seeing the trigger words or phrases by studying the same information in the same way and in the same context. It's great for memorization, don't get me wrong, but it can be very deceiving when you wanna understand what you're learning at a deeper level. The second tip is to keep track of your confidence levels. When you answer a flashcard or a practice problem, always, always ask yourself, are you sure? How confident are you in your answer? Because if you're not confident at all, then you basically took a guess, right? You got lucky, which means that on the exam, you'll have to depend on luck to get the answer right again. So if you're not confident about your answers, it's probably because you're just relying on rote memorization. Instead, learn more about the topic so that it makes sense. Read further, use chat GPT. Yes, this is the right answer, but why is it the right answer? If you can find some sort of logical explanation or scientific basis, then you'll understand it at a deeper level. Next, we have the illusion of productivity. Have you ever spent an excessive amount of time studying, yet your grades and scores don't reflect the amount of effort you've spent? Maybe you spend more time studying than all your friends, but somehow they always get better grades. I used to be one of those students who went to the library earlier and stayed later than most people, and I still wasn't performing as well as them. And that's when I started to realize that it's not about the time you spend, it's about how you spend your time. I used to severely misjudge the productiveness of my study sessions. I used to think that the more physical things I did, the more productive I was. If I managed to write 10 pages of notes or made 100 flashcards or highlighted and underlined all my summaries, then I would feel so accomplished. But that's where the illusion of productivity comes in. Just because we look physically active, like we're writing a ton of notes, we're highlighting, we're coloring and all these things, just because we look active on the outside doesn't mean that we're actually active on 
the inside. The inside meaning our cognitive activity. That's where it matters most. Because studying and learning are not the same thing. Studying is the physical action, like reading a book, writing notes, and learning is the cognitive outcome of studying. Memory formation, knowledge retention. It's two completely different things. Just because we spend eight hours studying, it doesn't necessarily mean we've achieved eight hours of learning. It's the same thing as if we spent eight hours lying in bed. That doesn't mean that we actually got eight hours of restful sleep. If you're tossing and turning, if you're anxious, if you're scrolling on your phone all night, then of course you're not gonna fall asleep. So how do we ensure that our studying equates to learning? We have to start measuring our study sessions by how much knowledge we're retaining. And I know it can be tricky because for much of our lives, for me it was elementary to high school, we are led to believe that studying is supposed to look like busy work. Like I remember in elementary school when my mom would come home from work and check in on us to see if we're studying. And of course, me and Maddie were just playing video games all day, right? But when she comes into the room to check on us, we gotta make sure that we are looking busy, that we look like we're studying and working hard. And a lot of teachers still encourage this busy work as well, right? They encourage you to write more notes. We're actually graded on our notes. We're brought up in a system where it can be easy to mistake busy work for real work. But if you're not actually doing the critical thinking, then the notes are gonna be useless and you're probably not even gonna look at them again later on. So we gotta realize that spending time on superficial tasks like rewriting notes and highlighting and all this busy work, it only makes us feel productive. It gives us the illusion of productivity. But what's more important is engaging with the information, struggling and thinking deeply. So the biggest tip I can give you here is always remember that the more cognitive effort you use, the better you're going to learn. And this cognitive effort and the feeling of confusion and struggle, it feels uncomfortable, right? But that's what learning actually feels like. So stop copying and rewriting your notes for the second time and instead close everything and see if you can rewrite it from memory. Stop highlighting your lecture slides for the second time and instead close everything and see if you can teach it. Why is that concept important? You gotta challenge yourself because the amount of time we spend doesn't matter nearly as much as the amount of thinking that we do. For the longest time, I struggled with procrastination. It was tough to regularly hit the gym, study for exams, or do hard things, even if I knew it was for my own good. Recently though, I've been able to consistently take action, and I realized it actually has nothing to do with willpower, because there's a way to trick our brain into doing difficult things even when we don't feel like it. So to outsmart our brain, we first have to look at how our mind works because our behaviors have patterns. And if we pay attention, we'll discover that hard work is always met with two types of resistance. First, negative emotions. The analogy I always use here is to think of our brain like a spoiled child. When they don't get their way, what do they do? They complain and throw a tantrum. Our mind works the exact same way. When things feel stressful or boring, our inner child awakens and we procrastinate. Like imagining how difficult it's gonna be to get started with our work for the day, start a side hustle or study for exam. Second is our ego or the self image we have about ourselves. Our mind does its best to protect our ego from being hurt because the ego is what we attach our self worth to. For example, if I grew up believing I was gifted or better than most people, that makes me feel special. But if, suddenly, I had to do something outside of my comfort zone, like ask out a beautiful woman, I would subconsciously avoid it because if I failed, that would prove I wasn't gifted and it would destroy my ego. So instead, to preserve my self-image, I would avoid doing the hard thing at all. So in either case of resistance, trying to fight against our brain's natural response to doing hard things, it won't work. But if we identify the source of the resistance, we can change our approach to trick our brain into working with us. So let's start with negative emotions. The amount of negative emotion we feel towards something directly depends on the size of it. For example, the feeling of boredom would be substantially worse if I knew I had to spend two months without my phone versus spending one hour without it. I would feel substantially more overwhelmed if I had to write an entire book than if I had to write one paragraph. Our mind is very visual. It does a mental calculation for the amount of effort and struggle it's gonna to take to reach that end goal. So what if instead we shift the goal? So first tip is tell yourself you're only gonna do the hard thing for a little bit. Right, you're only gonna take a baby step. Finishing the entire UWorld QBank is a lot of damage, but let's just do one practice problem. Getting jacked feels impossible, but let's just do one set of bench press. Running a 10K sounds really, really far, but hey, let's just run around the block. James Clear calls this technique the two minute rule. 
we can lower the stakes of the task so the negative emotions around it don't feel so overwhelming. Do the hard thing for just a little bit and then reevaluate how you feel. That wasn't that bad, so what would it look like to just do it for a little bit longer? How bad would it be to do one more practice problem or one more bench press? When we break apart a huge, daunting challenge into very small steps, it won't feel so scary and we'll be more likely to follow through. Another trick that's absolutely worked for me is I'll just start getting ready. Like if I'm supposed to go work out, but I'm feeling resistance, I just change into my shorts. I'll put on my shoes and grab my keys. If I feel frustrated that I have to study, I'll just open up my textbook. I'll pull up my study scheduler. I'll get my calculator out. I'm not telling myself I'm gonna do it, I just start getting ready. And usually just going through the motions of getting ready, I eventually convince myself that, you know, well, I might as well just do it now since I'm already here. This literally happened to me this morning. Like some guy called and tried to sell me like landscaping services and I don't even have a house. You know, he was like, well, since I have you on the phone already or like you came all this way, we might as well just buy it, right? Seriously, this tip works, just give it a shot. The next thing you can try is to batch difficult work with enjoyable work or with rewards. Remember, our brain is a spoiled child. So we need to speak to it that way or else we'll encounter even more resistance. Like say you're babysitting a kid and they start throwing a tantrum about doing their homework. I would say, well, if you finish your homework, we'll watch a movie and you get to choose the movie. Batching is incredibly underrated and effective. I used this all the time when I was in school. I make plans to go out with friends, but only if I finish my work before then, or I'd only watch anime if I was on the Stairmaster. Try to find ways to incentivize hard work with enjoyable things, and the negative emotions around it won't be so high and be more likely to do it. Let's move on to ego now. So our ego is formed based on all our past experiences and it defines who we are and shapes our reality. In Maxwell Maltz's book, Psycho-Cybernetics, he explains that all of our actions, feelings, behaviors, even our abilities are always consistent with our self-image. We can only act based on beliefs we have about ourselves, but our beliefs have nothing to do with the action itself. For example, regardless of whether or not I believe I can run a five minute mile, the act of running, trying is exactly the same. The only difference is that my ego puts up resistance because it's afraid of failing. So something we can do is what I call taking the pressure off our ego. During clinical rotations in medical school, I frequently had to step out of my comfort zone and do difficult things. I had to give lectures. I had to do procedures. I had to break tough news to families. I even had to tell a 16 year old she was pregnant. And if you've never done it before and you you know you're gonna suck at it, and multiple high-profile doctors are watching and grading your performance, let me tell you, it is terrifying. But I did work with other students who didn't really seem bothered. Like even when they made mistakes or they messed up and stuff, they were eager to get back at it. I remember asking one of my friends how she was always so positive and willing to step out of her comfort zone. And she told me she wasn't even thinking about that. All she was doing was having fun. She was immersed in the process, learning and treating it like a game. And that idea really stuck with me. If we take the pressure off the ego and just focus on having fun, the resistance drops and we can just start to enjoy the task and actually perform better. Alex Lowe, he was this inspirational mountaineer who was notorious for his infectious enthusiasm. He once said, the best climber is the one having the most fun. And I think that idea truly applies to so many things in life, especially when doing difficult things. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, what if there's absolutely no way I can imagine this hard thing being fun? What if waking up at 5 a.m., running in the freezing cold to the gym to lift heavy things just can't be fun? Fair enough, there is another trick we can use on our brain. Change the narrative we have about ourselves. We all talk to ourselves, but what most people don't realize is that the words we use are very important. There are nuances in language we can use to trick our brain. For example, change the narrative so that doing the actions of that hard thing aligns with your identity. Take this statement for example. If I tell myself, I need to work out and get in shape, my brain receives this message, processes it, and decides, you know what, we're not gonna work out today. Because by definition, if I need to get in shape, that means I, in fact, am not in shape and someone who's not in shape is not someone who works out, and so I'm not gonna work out. My brain's gonna resist working out and come to this crazy conclusion because it doesn't align with my identity. But if I rearrange the words a bit and I tell myself, I am a person who works out. Well, what do people who work out do? They go to the gym. They're probably in shape. Great, that means I go to the gym. Doing that hard thing will align with my self image because remember, we can only act according to how we view ourselves. I know this might sound crazy, but I'm not saying to flat out lie to yourself. 
Obviously, I can't say I'm a person who will launch a billion dollar company tomorrow. That's just outright foolish. But this is why language is so important. The key to tricking our brain is to align our identity with the actions of the person we want to become, not the end result. I'm not saying I am super jacked. I'm saying I am someone who works out. You see the difference? One of those is based on progress, based on actions, and the other one is based on fantasy. Now, of course, we don't want our brain to be in a constant state of deception. Tricking our brain is not a permanent solution to getting us off our asses and actually doing difficult work, but it actually doesn't need to be. Once we're able to cultivate consistency in our work and in our habits, that itself becomes a snowball effect that perpetuates motivation. Consistent action leads to progress, which leads to motivation. Seeing gains in muscle growth gave me motivation to go to the gym. And the more I went to the gym, the better I got at exercising. Because no one likes to be bad at what they do. That's a breeding ground for negative emotions and ego buffering. Once we develop consistency, we'll start to enjoy doing the hard things. We'll start to enjoy the stressful feeling of pushing heavy weights. We'll start to enjoy the cognitive effort of studying and learning. And that is the ultimate goal. Definitely try these out for yourself. Those are some of the strategies that I use to get myself to do hard things by tricking my brain. If you've got other strategies you use, drop them in the comments below. Let me check them out. And I will see you in the next video. For years, I struggled to stay on top of my daily responsibilities and actually finish the things I needed to do. It always just felt like I was scrambling to meet deadlines. So in this video, I wanna go over my organizational system and how I manage the chaos that's happening up here. And I'll also show you how you can implement this in your own life. It's a simple framework I call the three C's and it's loosely based off of David Allen's GTD. I use Notion as my app of choice to implement the system since all of my other workflows are there, but feel free to pick whichever one suits you. So the first C stands for capture. That means grabbing every idea, thought, or task that comes to mind the moment it happens. Have you ever tried focusing on something and you find your mind is just wandering all over the place? That's because our mind is just an endless thought generating machine and we don't even have control over what those thoughts are or when they're gonna happen. When I try to ignore something, like waiting for a reply to a text message, I can't stop thinking about my phone and minions and ramen. But as I started to pay attention to my thoughts, I began seeing patterns. I noticed that the majority of my intrusive thoughts were unclosed loops. You know, and I think back to college days when I was procrastination king, I had this problem where I wasn't ever fully present in the activity that I was doing. Like I remember going to parties and hanging out with friends and stuff, and every 15 minutes or so, I would get these intrusive reminders like, Psst, hey, you have an essay due on Friday. Or hey, don't forget, you have homework to finish by Monday. And then I'd stress and complain about it with my friends for a few minutes, like, ha ha ha, you know, I'm so screwed. But then I would tell myself, I'll just worry about it later. 15 minutes later, that same thought would come back. Like, hey, don't forget about Friday. Don't forget that homework on Monday. And this kept happening. I just couldn't fully be there because I was always on high alert. As David Allen says, the mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. It took me a long time to understand. That's just how our mind works. The ideas are mind loves to ruminate on the most are open loops. So the goal of the capture phase is to identify all those open thought loops and write them down so we don't forget them. That way our mind isn't constantly trying to remind us to think about that thought. They're stored in an inbox. An inbox is just basically a place to gather ideas so we don't continue worrying about them and losing focus every few minutes and we can just deal with them later. The next C is clarify. We now have to organize and prioritize our thoughts so we can determine what is important and what is not important. Otherwise our inbox piles up and reaches critical mass. It would be like moving all of your files onto your desktop. Something I've found helpful in keeping my inbox tidy is implementing cat time. Cats leisure most of the day, so this time it's meant to rejuvenate and catch up. So basically every day from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., I block out my calendar for cat time to filter my inbox, prioritize tasks, and process all of those open loops I captured. I got the idea of cat time from my internal medicine rotation. We can juggle about six to seven items in our working memory at one time. And in the hospital, we were always constantly bombarded with phone calls and pages, questions, concerns, <laughs> hunger, you name it. Trying to multitask on 50 different things at once is very inefficient. Things would slip through the cracks for sure, which gets dangerous for patients. My attending understood this and gave us staggered blocks of time after morning rounds so we can catch up. Scheduling cat time makes it so the task inbox never reaches critical mass and we don't have a hundred things living rent-free in our brain and destroying our ability to focus. In getting things done, David Allen proposes a fairly complex system for sorting an inbox. I think it's a bit convoluted, so I created a simplified version. So first, determine is this thought actionable or not? If yes, it's a task. If not, 
It's an idea. If it's a task, does it take less than five minutes to do? If yes, just do it and cross it off the list. If not, then decide its priority or how important it is and also its energy. Is this going to require a lot of effort or is it like a mindless task? Ideas can also be clarified if they pertain to certain projects you're working on. For example, I often get random ideas throughout the day for YouTube videos or like lyrics for songs that I'm writing. So I'll just capture those in my inbox and I can filter them later into different categories in Notion. Clarification usually doesn't take me more than five minutes since I've gotten to the habit of doing it consistently. And the last C is commit. Decide on a time to complete the task so they no longer interfere with your work. By assigning a specific time for the task, we offload it from our mind and we close that loop. We stop worrying about if we're going to forget the task and we stop worrying about when we're going to get around to doing the task because it's physically in our calendar. One of the biggest reasons why we procrastinate is because we don't have a clear plan of action. Lack of clarity means confusion and indecision. And if you've ever had trouble deciding on like where to go to dinner or what movie to watch or something, you know how overwhelming and frustrating that feeling of indecision is. So it's a lot easier to take action, even if that task sucks, you know, where it's boring when it's predetermined and planned out in our calendar. You know, if I knew I had to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, even though I'm not a morning person, because that's predetermined and pre-scheduled, I'm going to make it there on time. So calendar really allows us to fully focus and be present, enjoying what we're doing because we don't have indecision about whether or not we need to be doing something. So let's see how a Torah at Cajun Koi Academy implements the triple C framework all while using his favorite productivity app, Notion. Techno has a busy day ahead of him. He has an essay and presentation to prepare for tomorrow. So he's been locked in his favorite spot all morning, but he's aware that he needs to capture unclosed loops. So he proactively opens up his daily scratch pad on his phone and has this right beside him as he works. Not only is this a quick way to capture thoughts, it also means he won't get distracted by social media and games since his phone's being occupied. While working, Techno suddenly remembers he needs to email paperwork to his boss. He pauses what he's doing, quickly picks up his phone, and captures that idea into the inbox. As the morning continues, several other intrusive thoughts barge into his mind. Write a YouTube script about sleep, research camera lenses for photography, pay rent by tomorrow. He captures all of these unclosed loops as they come and preserves his focus for work. As lunch rolls around, Techno begins to feel hangry. So he goes to the kitchen and starts heating up leftovers from yesterday. As he impatiently waits for his food, he realizes now is a great time to clarify my inbox. So he whips out his phone and opens up his inbox, which is conveniently just another synced page in Notion where all the inbox ideas are captured. Now he begins to clarify his Notion database by priority and by energy. Email paperwork to boss is very high priority and low energy because he needs to get paid. He schedules that for later this evening. Write YouTube script is lower priority, but that's a very high energy task. It requires a lot of concentration and focus to write a banger script. So he schedules that for tomorrow morning when his focus is highest. Researching camera lenses is also low priority, but it's also low energy. He'll do that sometime tomorrow, maybe after lunch during his food coma. And finally, pay rent. This is a very high priority task, but it will also take less than five minutes to do. So he'll just do it right now on the spot. And would you look at that? His entire inbox was clarified and put into the calendar in less than five minutes. And now he can reward his efforts with a hot, delicious meal. And for the rest of the day, he won't have to worry about those same recurring thoughts invading his productivity because he's penciled them into his calendar and he knows when he'll take care of them. Now, I'm a big fan of digital minimalism. I prefer to identify the gaps in my productivity first and then use as few apps and tools as possible in my workflow. It seems like everything nowadays is fighting for our attention. Social media, email, apps. This became a huge problem for me. I was constantly distracted. But over the past few months, I've learned how to train my focus. And I've come to realize that we can master our attention if we understand how the brain works. A lot of people think focus is black and white, but it's more like a spectrum. Our brain produces different frequencies called brain waves for different types of alertness. And it's the way we transition between them that determines our focus. The simplest way to train our ability to do this is to think about focus as a three-part process. I call it the focus formula. It stands for prepare, engage, and sustain. We prepare our mind for focus, engage into focus, and then sustain it. Because focus is a process, just like reaching any physiologic state. Imagine going from lying on the floor to sprinting and then back to lying on the floor again. When you get back to the floor, your heart rate and your breathing are still going to be fast, your muscles tense. Our body goes through a process to calm down to a state of relaxation and vice versa. Focus works the same way. 
The mistake I made was trying to force myself to focus without paying attention to this process, which made focusing really frustrating and even uncomfortable. But to master our attention, we have to think about each part. So let's start off with prepare. We have to prepare our mind and our environment for focus, which can actually be done long before we plan to work. Preparation targets one of, if not the most important contributor to focus, which is clear goals. It is almost impossible to focus if our brain doesn't know what to focus on. I can't count how many times I sat down to get productive, but I didn't prepare what I was going to do, and then I ended up scrolling and wasting time. The prefrontal cortex, right? The part of our brain responsible for executive function or coordinating other parts of the brain to work together, it needs clear goals to focus. With clear goals, it suppresses other parts of the brain that don't need to be active. Imagine going to a supermarket where everything was black and white except for the things that you were looking for. You wouldn't waste time strolling through every aisle or getting stuck at the cookies. Clarity creates focus. Confusion causes procrastination. So to train our focus through preparation, make it a habit that before you dive into important work or studying, you spend a few minutes to prepare a strategy. Brainstorm out a list of to-dos and simple steps to accomplish them. Give your brain something to look forward to achieving. This is also super helpful because our brain loves finishing tasks. Every time we cross something off or make progress toward a goal, we get a small hit of dopamine, which actually helps us focus longer. Prepare also extends to your environment. Clutter is terrible for focus, so clean up your room and tidy up your workspace. Tech is even worse, so turn off the TV, hide your video games, and put your phone in another room. And don't just flip it upside down, keep it out of sight. So many people try to focus with their phone around. And from personal experience, it doesn't matter how much discipline I think I have, if my phone is close by, I'm gonna reach for it at some point during my work session. Preparation isn't procrastination, it's cognitive alignment that sets the stage for engage and sustain to run smoothly. Next is engage. This part of the process is where we actively transition from a relaxed state into the flow state, or what people call being in the zone, you know, when you're effortlessly absorbed in what you're doing. Think of engage like jumping into a cold pool when it's freezing outside. Like no matter how prepared you are, you know that jumping in is just gonna suck. That imagination and mental picture is thanks to a part of our brain called the insula, which connects our emotions to our thoughts. It's what makes us feel that dread, anxiety, and fear about jumping into the cold pool. And it's why the hardest step is the step from stillness. But just as important as taking that first step is considering the way that we take that step. Because how we take that step has a huge impact on our ability to reach and sustain flow. Remember, focus is a process. And to make sure it's as smooth and effortless as possible, we want those first steps to be done properly. Think of it like warming up your brain. Without it, you could risk injury. It's way easier to enter the flow state when our brain transitions seamlessly from beta waves, you know, or our normal consciousness into alpha and theta waves, which are more relaxed, creative, and immersive. But engaging our brain to overcome the emotional pain of the insula, it requires a lot of effort, which is why those first few minutes of focusing are going to be really uncomfortable and you're probably going to struggle. The problem is a lot of people don't even make it past that discomfort and they give up before they've gotten to the rhythm and flow. So to train our focus through engaging, we can do two things. First, reduce the emotional struggle as much as possible. And second, speed up that transition into flow. One of the best strategies to reduce emotional struggle is to have a ritual, a protocol, you know, like how athletes have a pregame ritual. Ours is called the focus checklist, and we already have a video about it here. But make it a routine to focus by going through the same motions. To speed up transitioning into focus, we can use the golden rule of flow. This comes from Stephen Kotler, one of the world's leading experts in flow. We can quickly introduce positive neurochemicals like norepinephrine, endorphins, and dopamine into our system by incrementally increasing the amount of challenge with our work. And we keep adding challenge until we find a sweet spot that's just outside of our skill level. And this is because our brain enjoys being challenged and overcoming challenge. But we have to find a balance here, right? Don't immediately dive into complex problem solving because the emotional struggle is going to be really high. So instead, what you want to do is gradually build up to it. Warm up first with like one or two small wins, and then push yourself until you're challenging right outside your comfort level. So as a student, you know, this could be trying a more advanced study technique or practice problems. If you're a creator, you can try implementing a new editing transition or a different storytelling framework. 
So once we've engaged and acclimated into a state of focus, the final part of the process is to sustain, right? We've already jumped into the pool, we're warmed up, we're focused, maybe even in flow, but we can easily fall out of flow if we don't know how to sustain it. You know, the same way you can't swim forever, you can't be focused forever. Our brain uses up a lot of energy when it's active, so we have to monitor it, which means that training our focus through sustain ultimately comes down to two things. First is to understand the limits of your focus. Our focus is like a muscle. Muscles need breaks in between sets to rest, and they also need longer periods of recovery to grow stronger. If we want to train our focus, we have to treat it the same way. We have to push our focus, but also take breaks when the fatigue starts to settle in. The mistake I used to make was trying to power through like eight or nine hour study or work sessions without taking breaks. I got like wrapped up in the how many hours can you study on YouTube trend. Sure, you can try to focus for that long, but the quality of your work is going to suffer. And if you keep it up day after day, you will burn out. Focus requires recovery. So if you've been in flow for a while and you start to feel fatigue or you're constantly getting distracted, your brain is telling you that it needs a break. And science shows us that on average, this is every 90 minutes or so. This is because our body functions in 90 minute cycles, what we call ultradian rhythms, our sleep cycle, our gut and appetite, our blood circulation, and most importantly, our arousal and focus. So begin to train your awareness of focus fatigue. A good way to figure out your focus endurance is to work using a timer or a stopwatch. Things like Pomodoro are excellent for getting more in tune with your current focus endurance. Second is to manage your level of engagement. While we're focusing, we need to constantly evaluate our emotions and the cognitive burden of the task. For example, if you're studying and you come across a concept that's really difficult to grasp, the insula is going to light up again and you're going to start to feel overwhelmed and frustration. If you're studying something really dull, you're going to start to feel bored. Those negative emotions will try to drag you out of focus. So to sustain focus, you have to train yourself to recognize when those moments happen. And instead of letting it pull you out of focus, what you want to do is reframe it in a positive light. Think of it as part of your training. Tell yourself it's a good thing, right? This is what training your attention feels like, kind of stressful. Like who said training was supposed to feel easy? And from there, think about what you can do to get back to the golden rule of flow. If it's too boring, try to add more challenge. If it's too challenging, try to break it apart heart or ask for help or look at it from a different perspective. So anytime I notice distractions taking over, I simply refer to this formula to figure out what went wrong. A lot of time management advice we get from productivity gurus were not meant for students. For example, delegation. Now, as somebody who runs their own business, I delegate things like checking my email or editing this video, for example. Maybe you have a lawn that you don't want to mow. What are students able to delegate? Are you gonna have your little brother go to class for you? Another example is hell yes or no. Hell yeah or no, just like learning to be okay with saying no to stuff. If I get an email from someone saying, hey, do you wanna do this thing? And I'm thinking, mm, maybe it sounds kind of all right, then my default position is gonna be no. Everything is an obligatory hell yes for a student. When can we ever say, no, I don't wanna take this exam or meh, I don't feel like studying. So instead, here's a time management framework that's actually built for students. And it's part of our ongoing series, Study Skills. It's as easy as one, two, three, four, five. Let me explain. For this method, you only need to master one skill that will make time management easier over the long run, and that is understanding how long it really takes for you to do something. Our brains are really bad at estimating this, so pay attention to how long it takes you, especially for things that you do often. For example, going to the gym actually includes getting ready, driving to the gym, and washing up after or eating lunch actually includes preparing the food or waiting in line to pay for it. The best thing to do is to literally time yourself. I used to always overestimate how long it would take me to do reading assignments or to do 20 flashcards. But after timing myself, I realized that I can get a lot of work done in all the random bits of time throughout the day, like in between classes or on the bus ride home, that would have otherwise been wasted. Next, you'll only need two items to carry out this entire time management system, a calendar and a piece of paper or you can use your smartphone if you have one. But don't worry about all these fancy to-do list apps and routine trackers and stuff like that. If you can master this analog method, then you can later customize it and make it as sophisticated as you need it to be. Now, there are three steps to this time management system. This is based off of Cal Newport's book, so shout out to him. The three steps are, number one, whenever a new task or assignment comes up throughout the day, you wanna quickly jot it down on your piece of paper. For me, the hardest part about this entire system is just remembering to write things down on the spot. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. Step two happens the next morning. You wanna plan your day based on what needs to be done. 
And step three is to move all other tasks to future dates in the calendar. So I'm gonna show you an example of what the three steps look like in action, but I wanna emphasize four rules that really made this system work for me especially when I was studying for my dual degrees. First rule is it has to be flexible. We're not trying to be Elon Musk and plan every minute of our day in order to run four companies at the same time. We're students. We need to be ready on a moment's notice when our friends hit us up for an impromptu ramen run. The second rule is it needs to be easy to restart after periods of neglect. I love this idea. It's also from Cal Newport. We're human, we're not perfect, we're going to miss days, and that's okay. But once you've seen how organization can change your life, you're gonna have a hard time going long periods of time without it. Number three is it has to reduce stress, and we do this by offloading all the things we need to remember onto our paper. Having obligations and deadlines kind of floating around in your head is exhausting. Plus, it makes it impossible to relax when you want to. As author David Allen says, your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. So this is why we want to immediately record any tasks or deadlines that we get and offload them from our brain. And four, it has to prioritize our tasks. It's impossible to do everything. We can't manage to go to every party or join every club. Sometimes it's not even possible to do every single assignment for every class. So we have to pick and choose what's important to us. So that's why this method consolidates all our options and clearly displays in front of us so that we can make informed decisions when it matters. With these rules in mind, let's look at a typical Thursday for young college Maddie. Maddie wakes up at 8.30 a.m. for class at nine. He starts by pulling out his list from yesterday, containing all the tasks that he had recorded throughout the day. Now he looks at his calendar to see what's already been scheduled. He has class at nine and 11 a.m. There are dinner plans with his friends at 7 p.m then a party for the newly matched rookies at 9 p.m. He wants to go to the gym before dinner, so he plans to have all of his schoolwork done by 5 p.m. Now he looks at all the tasks that need to be done. Biology assignment due today, calculus problem set due tomorrow, script a YouTube video, return Breath of the Wild to Kev, or keep it and buy the DLC, buy his big bro Mike a new iPad for his birthday, find a summer internship, and make lo-fi beats for a study with me video. Now, Maddie just needs to fit the most important tasks into the open slots. Luckily, Maddie has developed the skill of knowing exactly how much time it takes for him to do certain tasks. So this step is a breeze. He can finish the biology assignment and submit it in between class. He can also do some random chores in this hour, like returning the video game or slaying Ganon for the 50th time this week. It would likely take him about two hours each to do calculus and script the YouTube video, so he schedules them both after lunch. That takes him up to 5 p.m. and probably all the time he has for today. The other things on the list can get pushed to future dates because they aren't as urgent. And that's it. Maddie spent less than five minutes recording his task and planning his day, all while dropping off the kids at school. But of course, his schedule doesn't always go according to plan, but it's flexible enough that nothing will get missed. He returns Breath of the Wild to Kev, but they end up playing a little too long and go for an impromptu late lunch. Then they find out that Techno is working on the calculus problem set, so Maddie rearranges his schedule. He only has a little time before the calculus study group, so he'll get as much of the YouTube script done as possible and finish the rest tomorrow. Imagine what life would have been like if he didn't have such a flexible time management system. He'd probably forget all the menial tasks and allow them to build up. Plus, he'd be more stressed when last minute study sessions arise but he kept his cool throughout the day. He was able to record new tasks onto his list so that he can plan again the next morning and the whole process starts over. When we aren't able to accomplish the things we need to, we often blame time. And no matter how much time we give ourselves, it still never feels like enough. But what if we've been looking at it completely wrong? What if time is actually our ally and not our enemy? The reality is we'll never have time to do everything, but that's not a handicap, it's a buff. Because once we understand that time is limited, all the projects, relationships, and tasks we feel we need to cling onto or to finish at a certain time, we can just let go of. And along with letting go is all the emotional baggage that comes with it. So back in med school, years one and two are didactic, meaning we do the typical, you know, study, go to lectures and take exams vibe. Then during third and fourth year, we add on hospital rotations, you know, seeing patients and stuff, but we still have to study and take exams. I remember struggling first year and thinking, geez, this is gonna be rough doing it while working. Like how are we supposed to have time to do anything? But I was able to make it work and actually keep up. And that's when it clicked for me. Time isn't the enemy. It's our friend. 
Because when we know time is limited, it forces us to reflect and focus only on the things that matter. Muhammad Ali once said, don't count the days, make the days count. The reason why we don't accomplish the things we need to is not a lack of time, but because we squander it and don't have clear priorities. Lack of clarity means confusion, and nothing is more stressful than watching the clock tick because we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. So let's break down a three-step process to clarify and prioritize your day using time as a tool and not as a handicap. First is to clarify what needs to be done by urgency and importance. Our brain will oftentimes mix these two up. For example, replying to every text message or email might feel important. We can easily spend all day doing those tasks. But ultimately, if our goal is to get into medical school, then what's important is to study. The worst way we can use our time is to do something really well and thoroughly that didn't need to be done in the first place. But of course, something can be both important and urgent, so figuring this out can be kind of tricky. Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about a method for prioritization called the Eisenhower box. Make a four quadrant box. Things that are important and urgent, important but not urgent, not important but urgent, and then not important or urgent. Put all of your tasks into one of these four boxes, and then focus on the important tasks first before even moving on to the urgent ones. If you don't have time to address all of them, remember that's okay, we can't do everything. So just let them hang out in their box. Over time, as you continue using the system, you'll realize that most things that we think we need to do or we hold on to eventually end up in box number four. So now that our boxes are filled out and we've identified the most important and urgent things to do, step two is to clarify how how we'll do each task by its sequence of actions. Right, just because I know it's important for me to get an internship or get a job, doesn't mean I'm actually gonna do it if I don't know how. There have been so many times where I've carved out a huge chunk of time to do something important, but then I realized I had no clue how to do it, and so I ended up procrastinating. So it's super important to clarify each thing into a sequence of actions. If I wanna land an internship, what are the actions involved? I need a resume, a portfolio, I need a letter of recommendation, I need leads of where to apply, and I need to practice and hone my interview skills. And each of those steps can be clarified further. Brainstorm all of it out so there's no confusion about what steps need to be done. Because that way, when we have some time to work on it, we'll know if it's realistic or not to make progress on that task, or if our time is better spent somewhere else. Another exercise that's been helpful to clarify a sequence of actions is to work backwards and reverse engineer the steps. So for example, what happens before I land an internship? Well, I probably had an interview. What do I need to do to get there? I need an offer. How do I get an offer? I need to submit a strong application to a lot of different people, right? So you can work forwards or backwards, work in whichever direction makes sense for the task at hand. And step three is to clarify when we'll do things by energy. In general, I divide up my day into three parts, morning, afternoon, and evening. Because during each of those periods of time, we all have a unique energy curve. Our energy state will make it easier or harder to complete different types of work. And we can use neuroscience to explain why. So typically in the mornings, between six and eight hours of being awake, our body releases high amounts of cortisol and adrenaline. It's what makes us feel alert, awake, and focused. So when clarifying when to do important tasks, it's a good idea to pick work that's cognitively demanding, you know, like deep studying or writing or problem solving and do those in the morning. As we move into the afternoon time, our energy curve tends to dip a little bit. Cortisol and adrenaline start to come down and our serotonin levels start to rise, which makes us feel more relaxed. This is also usually when our caffeine starts to wear off and the food coma starts to settle in, so our alertness might drop. So in clarifying work, pick work that's mellower or doesn't require as much deep thinking. This could be administrative stuff like answering emails or phone calls, uh, practicing flashcards, club or work meetings, or running errands. Then as we enter evening time, usually around 5 p.m. or so, our energy curve again shifts. And this is due to the circadian alerting system. So during the evening, we tend to get a slight boost in energy about three to four hours before bedtime. And it's similar to the alertness we feel in the morning, but our body might feel more tired. If you've ever felt physically tired, but your mind is alert, you'll know what I mean. So during this time of day, I would clarify things that don't require a long stretch of deep work. This could be things like doing practice problems or pre-studying for tomorrow's lecture or you know clarifying your inbox. And also very importantly, during this time, stop drinking caffeine because we wanna to get to sleep. So to give a complete example of how I used this entire three-step process was how I prepared for my step one exam. Before going into my five weeks of dedicated study time, I sat down and clarified all of my upcoming responsibilities with an Eisenhower box. And I realized that the only things that were important for me were studying, 
getting exercise, and checking in with my girlfriend at the time so that she knew I was live. Everything else in boxes three and four, I just deleted from my brain. Next, the sequence. Studying for my exam is pretty vague, so that needed some additional sequencing. What was I going to do each day? And for this exam, I broke it down into three steps. Learn new information from videos, textbooks, and modules connect the dots to see how that fits with what I already know, and then test myself with self-assessments to make sure I understood it all. And I'd repeat that sequence of actions for every subject until I learned everything. That's the super condensed version and actually goes much deeper. So if you're interested, definitely check out our comprehensive how to study guide video right up here. And then finally, I had to map out my energy curve. Learning new information, which is very cognitively demanding, I reserved the morning time. During the afternoon, once my caffeine wore off and I hit my midday slump, I focused on flashcards, exercising, and the occasional FaceTime check-in. And then in the evening, with a second surge of energy, I do practice problems or draw mind maps until bedtime. I knew I wasn't gonna have much time to do anything else besides study, but instead of letting that cause me overwhelm, I saw it as an opportunity to focus only on what mattered. And so I clarified exactly what my priorities were for the next five weeks, what were important and urgent to move me towards my goal. So anyways, hopefully I've convinced you now that clarity is the most important ingredient for personal productivity, and that maybe, Time isn't such a bad guy after all, and really it can be a tool we can use to live each day more intentionally. If you're tired of feeling stuck because you're distracted, scrolling social media, or binging TV shows and movies without accomplishing the work that you need to do, this video is for you. Today I'm talking about dopamine detoxing. Not throwing any shade, but a lot of people treat these dopamine detox challenges like antibiotics. Like take this pill and reset your brain in 24 hours, you'll be reborn a new person. Well, I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. A dopamine detox isn't about challenge, it's about change. Recently, I completed a detox and I realized if I went straight back to scrolling and procrastinating, then what was it all for? Anyone can challenge themselves not to use their phone for a week, but that's completely missing the point. To regain control, it has to be done with intention. Most people don't see results from dopamine detox because they don't have a proper protocol. And that's why I created this video, to share my protocol. That's helped me experience real growth, improve my focus, and gave me mental clarity. It's three steps, and you must do each in order to have a successful dopamine detox. So part one is preparation. Planning out the rules and structure around it so we're clear on what we want to achieve. The first is purpose. As a doctor, my most successful patients are the ones who understand the extent of their health concerns. They realize what will happen if they don't change their behavior. Feeling stuck, experiencing pain, and visualizing what that future looks like, not being healthy to see their kids grow up, taking five pills a day and feeling miserable each morning. That's the mental picture that sparks a desire for change, and that's why they succeed. So honestly, ask yourself, why is it important for you to regain focus? What is going to happen if you don't get your life together? This protocol has the potential to change your life, but just because it can doesn't mean it will. Not until you decide and internalize why it's necessary for you to change. Number two is cutting. Everyone has a different opinion about what to include in the detox. I'm not here to argue over semantics, but if you want to use my protocol that's gotten me real results, there are four non-negotiable categories that you have to cut out. First is binge tech. This includes social media, TV subscriptions, video games, forums, and political news. These things need to be physically deleted from your phone and blocked on your browser if possible. I don't care how much discipline or willpower you think you have because our brains are conditioned, programmed even to consume instant gratification. It's not even always about having a craving or motivation, it's just habitual. Even just glancing at your phone lock screen notification is all it takes for 30 minutes to disappear from your life. And yes, this also means blocking YouTube if you can. I know, a YouTuber is telling you to stop watching YouTube? Weird, right? But if you need to use YouTube for work and creation like I do, I get it. But at least do yourself a favor and use a browser extension that blocks your YouTube homepage and your sidebar to prevent getting sucked into the void. Number two is unhealthy sex. This includes pornography, masturbation, and yes, dating apps like Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge. There are many problems that can arise from watching pornography, especially in young men who are the majority consumers here. Now you have to understand that sex is something that drives people to do very irrational things. It's absolutely crazy, but the science shows us that even the pursuit of sex releases huge spikes of dopamine, sometimes even more than the act of sex itself. So even swiping on Tinder and Bumble feeds our brain dopamine. I had a friend in college who was so dominated by sex, he once had a 
paper and final exam the next day, but he decided to throw away an entire semester and fail his class all because a Tinder date wanted to meet up. Imagine your life being controlled by a total stranger's text message through a dating app, not even a confirmed real human being. Remember, this part of the protocol is to help us take back control. Next are consumables. No alcohol, no recreational drugs, including marijuana, and no junk food. We are what we put into our bodies. And in order to give our mind and brain the opportunity to reset, we can't keep altering it and feeding it dopamine. Substances are one of the easiest ways to escape from emotions and from reality because they feel really good. It's way easier to kick back with the girls and boys, pound brewskis and hang out until 4 a.m. than it is to sit down and focus on studying or building a business or whatever your goals are. Our mind will always crave the things that give us quick pleasure. So this is why it's really important that during this entire protocol, our mind is unaltered. And remember, this isn't forever. Trust me, I love a glass of wine or a cocktail as much as anyone else, but you have to stay dry for the duration of the detox. And number four is thrill-seeking behaviors. No gambling, no shopping sprees, no skydiving or bungee jumping. All of these activities release massive surges of dopamine because of a psychological tendency called variable rewards. You know what I'm saying? Keep them on their toes. That's a dopamine playground. If we aren't sure if the reward we're gonna get is gonna be good or bad, but there's a sliver of possibility that it's gonna be a banger, then it's the most addictive type of activity. It's weird, studies have shown that when we know exactly what the reward's gonna be, it's less exciting and we're less likely to do it consistently. But when the rewards are uncertain, it's an all-you-can-eat dopamine buffet where we keep coming back for more. Maybe I'll get lucky on my next hand. Maybe I'll find a way better deal on page 10 of Amazon. If we are 100% certain we'll get rewarded, our craving for it gets amplified. This concept, of course, also applies to social media, dating apps, and all the other stuff we're cutting out to. And part three of preparation is how long to dopamine detox for. At this time, I'm not aware of any clinical research specifically looking at dopamine levels after this type of detox. So my protocol is based on our understanding of human physiology. We wanna spend at least seven days in full detox mode. There's so much instant gratification delivered to us that our brain is in a constant state of overstimulation. And as you've probably experienced yourself, the more you consume, the less you actually enjoy it. And this is because our body has a biological protective mechanism to overstimulation. It's called desensitization. Normally, stimulation causes our cells to release dopamine, which binds to receptors on these neighboring cells so that they can function. But with overstimulation, there's too much dopamine hanging around and our brain can't handle it. And to compensate, these cells decrease the outbound function and they also decrease the number of receptors. Dr. K over at Healthy Gamer had an amazing analogy to describe how this works. He said, overstimulation is like turning up the volume on your phone to max when it's plugged into a speaker. The input is so high and the sound is so loud that we have to compensate by turning down the volume of the speaker. We have to reduce the level of the input before we can balance out the volume of the speaker Otherwise, we'd blow out the speaker. This process, desensitization, takes time. What we're doing is allowing the dopamine receptors in our brain to return to a state of balance, or what we call homeostasis. So give your brain at least seven full days to reset. You can always go longer if you want. There's no upper limit to the length of time you can reduce stimulation. But personally, I don't think it's necessary to go longer than 30 days. And I'll explain why later. But for now, let's move on. Part two of the protocol is execution. We've set up the logistics of the mindset, the rules, and the time frame. Now it's time to begin. As you begin a dopamine detox, you are guaranteed to experience some emotions. You'll feel anxious about being disconnected from the internet or losing your Snapchat or be real street. You'll feel uncomfortable with long silences as you're forced to make conversation with your friends instead of watching Netflix. You'll feel lonely with your thoughts and silence. You'll feel frustrated eating breakfast without your iPad or taking a dump with a book instead of scrolling TikTok. But of all of these emotions, there is one you will definitely experience and you cannot try to escape. What do we do when we feel the least bit bored? We reach for our phone, we start scrolling. It's an instinct. Our mind is trying everything it can to escape feeling bored. But what we're gonna do instead is tolerate it. Think of boredom as the state of mind where there's still a lot of dopamine hanging around, but the receptors haven't rebalanced yet. Eventually, our mind is gonna be so bored that doing anything will be better. But you don't just have to sit around all day and do nothing, although that's definitely an option. Don't forget that we also release dopamine for a lot of things that we do. It's often gradual and less intense than the stuff that we're cutting out, 
but we need to jog our brain's memory, figuratively speaking, that it also gets dopamine from pursuing goals, spending time with cool people, learning, and a whole bunch of other stuff. With the execution phase, we're reconditioning our brain toward healthy dopamine alternatives so we get a steadier release of dopamine and we can actually enjoy doing the things that we used to do. So to put this in action, we will do three practices every single day. Yes, you heard me right, every single day no exceptions. Number one is self-reflection. This is the most important part of the execution phase because in order to experience positive change, we have to first become aware of it. It doesn't have to be a deep trauma dump exploring your deepest, darkest secrets. All the protocol requires is 10 minutes of self-reflection by meditating, journaling, gratitude practice, or whichever one you prefer. There's really cool data to suggest that even 10 minutes of meditation can calm our mind, improve our mood, and give us long-term focus. Most people live every waking moment in constant distraction. The moment we wake up, we grab our phone, scroll TikTok, listen to music during commutes, watch Netflix while eating, we even watch TV and scroll at the same time. The point I'm trying to make is that our mind is so consumed with instant gratification that we never make time to think about ourselves. No wonder we're stuck and not making progress and becoming better humans. It's because we don't sit down and reflect. But we're different at Cajun Koi Academy, right? Self-reflection is the building block of self-improvement and the vehicle for self-discovery. Can you devote just 10 minutes a day to change your life? The people who say they don't have time to self-reflect are the ones who need to self-reflect the most. Number two is exercise. It doesn't have to be a full-on workout. It can be as simple as a 30-minute walk through the neighborhood or park. It can be yoga or stretching, a bike ride or rock climbing, whatever fits your vibe. Move your body. Exercise increases blood flow throughout our body. And yes, it also causes a healthy and steady release of dopamine. That's why you feel so damn good after a workout and partly why people experience runner's high. Regular exercise improves our mood, increases our focus, reaction time, keeps our body running smoothly, and makes us look sexy. There are literally a billion other health benefits from regular exercise. I'm sure you don't need me to remind you. Number three is connect. Talk to another living, breathing human being. Believe it or not, having real conversations with other people releases dopamine and other neurochemicals. Again, this doesn't have to be a super elaborate thing. It can be a five minute phone call with your parents, a friend you've neglected lately, or maybe your older brother. But if you wanna take the protocol to the next level, then tell them about why you're doing a dopamine detox. Get them involved and inspire them to take control of their life too. I've grown more as a person from an enthusiastic and passionate friend than than anyone else. Maybe you'll be the spark for someone else's self-discovery journey. And that's all the protocol required. Once you end the detox, we reach the final part of the protocol, restoration. Restoration is the phase where we begin to reintroduce the things we cut out during our dopamine detox, but only after careful consideration. Sure, we can be extreme and say we're never gonna use social media or video games or drink ever again, but personally, I think that's completely unnecessary. Think about it this way. If you have to go as far as to create an absolute rule, never to use social media again, then who really has control over who? You're being held hostage and restricting your opportunities for self-discovery. The goal of dopamine detox is to regain control of our mind. So it's not about permanently deleting all instant gratification or dopaminergic activities. It's about being intentional with the way that we consume. And this is why I don't think the detox needs to go beyond 30 days. Because once we reach dopamine homeostasis, the restoration phase of this protocol will help us build the life that we want. For context, the idea of restoration came from Nassim Nicholas Taleb's concept of anti-fragility. After a catastrophic incident, we normally think of two outcomes, something being fragile or breaking apart or being resilient, bouncing back. For example, if I 360 roundhouse kick a tiny shih tzu, there's gonna be critical damage. It's fragile. If I try the same thing to a massive elephant, there's going to be zero damage. It's resilient. But there's actually a third outcome he calls anti-fragile, becoming stronger after catastrophe. Taleb's opening example is the Hydra. You're probably familiar with this from the Greek tale Hercules or Avengers, but when one head is removed, three more take its place. As its heads are severed, the Hydra doesn't just bounce back. It becomes more and more powerful. Restoration makes us anti-fragile. We just spent seven days cleaning the slate, hitting the reset button, and disrupting the status quo of our life. But instead of bouncing back to where we were before, being stuck, being unmotivated to pursue the dream life we desire without mental clarity and focus, why not become stronger? So before I decided to reintroduce things back into my life, I asked myself very important questions. What are the types of things that I value? What type of person do I want to be? And what does that person spend their time doing? 
Does this app, video game, subscription, six pack of beer, or new pair of Yeezys align with my values and how I want to spend my time? Do they help me become the person that I want to be? If they don't, then leave them out of your life. To give a personal example, I did reintroduce Twitter and Instagram. Other self-improvers will disagree with me here, but I believe that some scrolling has value and it can be healthy as long as it's done sparingly and with intention. I really enjoy a specific subsection of self-improvement philosophy Twitter. And so I really only ascribe there to get the ideas that I want and actually connect with other like-minded creators. Through restoration, I identified that very specific angle. And now I only use Twitter to engage in that community. Same with Instagram. I love branding and design and photography photography, art, and music. So I also use it to engage and explore those areas of interest. And this is probably the most millennial thing I'll ever say, but none of my friends use TikTok or Be Real. We're too old for that. So all of our group chats are still on Instagram. But I also won't allow myself to get consumed. So I also very intentionally set a limit on my phone of 20 minutes a day for each app. And this has worked amazing for me. I get exactly the value I want out of these apps and I get to leave the rest behind. So I really encourage you, Get into the habit of putting that much intentional thought to the things you want to reintroduce into your life. If down the line you realize it's not serving the same purpose that it once was, then get rid of it again. This is how powerful you can become from restoration. You'll have the ability to pick and choose the best parts about technology, about video games, social media, and then leave the rest behind. We can regain control. Adding more doesn't always lead to more happiness, but it always leads to more distraction. And that's my full protocol for dopamine detox. Ever since I did it a couple months ago, it's helped me tremendously. And I'm gonna keep using it every few months to hit a hard reset, especially when I'm starting to feel burnt out or that I notice that I'm not spending time the way that I want to. And I have to preface that like all good things, this protocol won't instantly transform your life. Reframing our mindset and breaking down barriers and beliefs takes intentional practice and time. But that's why we have protocols in place. If you find yourself constantly putting off work, only to feel guilty when things pile up, you force yourself to focus but can't seem to make any progress, trust me, you are not alone. Everyone procrastinates, it's just part of being human. So you're not SOL, you're not beyond saving, you just don't have a proper protocol. Most people fail to overcome procrastination because they don't understand it. They just want a quick fix, but that's the problem. We can't change our behaviors unless we understand them. And that's why I created this video, to share my five-step protocol that's been incredibly effective for me in beating procrastination the moment it appears. But for the protocol to work, we need to ask ourselves, why am I procrastinating right now? Procrastination is always a result of our mind's desire to escape from negative emotions. Whether it's boredom, frustration, tiredness, annoyance, or a fear of failure, our mind uses every Jedi mind trick in the book to avoid those emotions. But if we dig deeper, we'll find that these are symptoms of three underlying causes. First is a lack of experience. Either we don't have the experience or knowledge to do the thing that we need to, or the instructions are unclear and we don't know how to get started. The summer before starting college, I wanted to get my first job so I could have some extra money before moving out of my parents' house. Every morning, I told myself, today I'm going to find a job. I'd pull up my laptop, struggle for a few minutes, start feeling overwhelmed, and then just default to playing video games or hitting up my friends or something. I never got a job that summer. I realize now that those emotions were just symptoms of the real problem. I had no clue how to find a job. I had no experience with it. I didn't even know what knowledge gap stood between me and having a job. Lack of clarity causes confusion, which leads to those negative of emotions that cause procrastination. Second is level of effort. Effort goes both ways. Something that's too low effort makes us feel bored or gives us a false sense of security. And something that's too high effort makes us feel overwhelmed. If my professor assigns me a 50 page paper on like neurochemistry of cat brains or something, I'd feel hopeless and anxious about how many hours and how many hand cramps I'd suffer researching and writing that project. I'd end up procrastinating. On the other end of the spectrum, let's say that I study for my exams by rereading my notes 20 times over. I would feel so bored and annoyed having to do such a mindless and passive task, I would also just get distracted and procrastinate. The emotions we feel from the different levels of effort are also sometimes attached to our ego. Maybe you're a perfectionist and the fear of failure causes you to procrastinate doing things unless you're 100% certain you're going to succeed. Or maybe you feel threatened by difficult tasks because you don't want to be judged as being incompetent. And the third type of procrastination I call a low energy state. We all have a unique energy curve for when we're most focused and motivated to overcome procrastination. And our energy 
curve is affected by the time of day and the surrounding environment. So in college, I had the freedom to choose my own class schedule. I went to a big public university, right? So there were multiple options for biology and chemistry classes that I needed to take, you know, and being the degenerate party animal that I was back then, I decided that my first semester, I was going to take only afternoon and evening classes, you know, so I could stay up all night, play video games, party and sleep in and stuff. And most days I woke up around noon or even later. And when I went to class, I could barely focus or even pay attention, which didn't make any sense to me at all back then. Like, how was I this tired from doing absolutely nothing all day. Yeah, I didn't do very well my first semester. So the following semester, I changed things up and I started waking up way earlier and studying in the morning. And that changed everything for me. I realized that my energy curve, my willpower to overcome procrastination was way easier to tap into in the morning. And I didn't feel that resistance of tiredness or laziness. So figure out what your energy curve looks like. As you can imagine, trying to force ourselves to overcome procrastination doesn't work if we aren't targeting the root cause. Some people can watch watch a David Goggins video and motivate themselves into action. But for most of us, we need a better approach. So here's the five step protocol that's worked amazing for me. Step one is to identify the emotion you're experiencing. Don't react, don't fight it, just sit with it for a second. What is this feeling? Is it fear? Is it overwhelm? Is it boredom? Is it anxiety or hopelessness? It might be more than one of them or all of them simultaneously. Sometimes we get so worked up that we can't think clearly enough to identify our emotions. In which case, there's actually an interesting physiologic mechanism we can tap into that temporarily clears our mind. So if the overwhelm or emotions are too intense, fill up a large bowl with ice water and dunk your face in it. Cold shower also works. This evokes something in us called the diving response. When ice water hits our face, our brain and body do like a hard factory reset. If you've ever done this, you know what I mean. But our heart like skips a beat, we hold our breath, and whatever thoughts that were on our mind instantly vanish. And then from this new place of peace, we can revisit that emotion from a much calmer perspective. There are other more effective long-term ways to strengthen our mind to detach from emotional states like meditation and exercise, which I also highly encourage making a regular practice of. Step two is to deconstruct the emotion. Now that we've identified the emotion, we need to break it apart and determine which of the three types of procrastination that we're dealing with. Is the procrastination coming from experience, effort, energy, or some combination of the three? Think about your current situation, you know, your environment and the responsibilities you have planned for the week as guiding prompts to determine why did that negative emotion appear now? Did you just get off a 10 hour work shift? This might be an energy type of procrastination. Are all your friends DMing you to play Valorant? Your brain is probably calculating a high level of effort to continue studying. Do you have the skills and knowledge to film a YouTube video? You probably hit an experience gap that's manifesting as overwhelm because you don't know the next steps to take. What emotional consequence is your mind trying to escape? These are some examples of questions to think about when deconstructing an emotion. And once you've deconstructed the emotion, move on to step number three. Create a clear plan of action that's so simple, you'd be stupid not to do it. Emphasis on clear and stupid. This is gonna be a little different for each type of procrastination, but ultimately the idea is the same. Make the action plan so easy and the next steps so clear, it's a no brainer for you to get started. For example, for that ambiguous task of getting a job, do a brain dump of all the mini tasks that are part of that big task. Lay out everything you know to uncover those experience gaps and then build a plan around it. I probably need a resume, right? So how do I do that? I'll watch a YouTube video about how to write a resume. I'll get AI to draft a resume template for me. What do I do from there? Now. I'll brainstorm all my work experiences and school achievements. Next, I'll have to find jobs to apply for. So I'll research local job centers, I'll ask my school counselor, you know, so on, so on. And at any point I run into an experience gap, I'll look it up or I'll ask someone. For the effort type procrastination, break apart the task into bite-sized actions. A 50 page paper can be broken apart into read an article, summarize the article, write one paragraph. If it's still too hard, make it simpler and make it stupider. <laughs> write one sentence, write one word. If I'm feeling low energy from exhaustion, then how can I create an action plan to tackle this tomorrow? Don't try to force studying right now. Just go take a hot shower, get to bed early, set an alarm for like 6 a.m. and then try again with a fresh cup of coffee and a clear plan of action. The whole idea of step number three comes from Brian Tracy's Eat the Frog. When faced with a daunting task, whether it's due to experience, effort, or energy, get your mind off of the negative emotions by focusing on a single action you can take. This step is definitely the most challenging and requires practice. There's an art to prioritization and goal setting, and it gets much more complicated than I'm letting on right now, but check out this video up here if you're interested afterwards. Step four, begin your action plan, even if it's not perfect. It's important to know that too much planning and researching is itself a form of procrastination. It's perfection. 
perfectionism. So once you've got a plan that's at least somewhat coherent, you know, maybe 60% complete, don't think too hard. Don't allow that perfectionist tendency to override. Go dunk your face in ice water again if you have to and just get started. It doesn't matter how perfect your plan is if you don't use it. The hardest step is the step from stillness. But once you start working, momentum will carry you over procrastination. There's this popular quote that I love by author Brad Stolberg, mood follows action. So just get working even if the negative emotions aren't completely gone because the good feeling of making progress will eventually catch up. Finally, step five, which is an often forgotten step, is to celebrate your ability to overcome procrastination. Be your personal cheerleader and praise yourself for doing something despite those negative emotions you felt. Fred Bryant, who's done research on the psychology of enjoyment and motivations, talked about the importance of savoring and acknowledging our wins, no matter how small they are. There's an intimate relationship between our brain and achievement. Achievement releases dopamine and other endorphins in our body. Remember that procrastination presents as negative emotions. So by celebrating our wins every step of the way, we're conditioning our brain to enjoy the feeling of over coming resistance, to feel good for taking action. And this in turn will make it easier for us to continue doing so in the future. But also keep in mind that there is an important nuance between the idea of celebration and reward. A celebration is an experience. It's that internal euphoria we feel for accomplishing something. Like Steph Curry doing a shimmy after draining a three-pointer, or dapping up your boys after acing an exam. A reward is something external, like treating yourself to a new pair of shoes or playing video games for five straight hours. Focus on celebrations. Rewards can be useful, but be careful not to use them too often because then your brain will start to associate joy with that reward and not from actual accomplishment. And that is my five-step protocol. Now, I wanna make a disclaimer that this protocol call is an effective tool for overcoming the immediate battle against procrastination. However, there is no actual cure for procrastination. Just because we beat procrastination today doesn't mean we've conquered it forever and never have to worry about it again. Procrastination is a non-stop balancing act. We have to be attuned with our emotional state at all times. Every minute, our subconscious brain performs a mental calculation to assess the emotional damage of the current tasks. The long-term solution comes from doing internal work on ourselves and reflecting on our core values. People who seem to effortlessly dive into hard work are the ones who've identified identified their values and internalize them so deeply that taking action isn't even an option, it's a duty. So honestly, ask yourself, what do I want for myself? What does that person value? And how does that person spend their time? Once you've clarified that version of yourself, take full responsibility to become that person. Actually, let's take this a step further. Take personal and public responsibility for your goals by sharing them in the comments below. Why exactly do you want to beat procrastination? What do you think that's going to do for you? That way we can work together to reorganize our lives and eliminate procrastination. Back in college, I was one of those kids who always had a job while in school. At first, I worked as a barista, making mediocre latte art for poor students. Then I added on a tutoring gig for high schoolers, and then front desk at a yoga studio, all the while taking full stack classes. As you can imagine, an 18 year old punk like me didn't know how to handle that kind of responsibility, especially since that was right around the time Hunter x Hunter started to air. And my grades paid the price. Any sane rookie would have dropped work to focus on school, but I really liked having the extra cash to fund my luxurious $6 specialty coffee addiction. So after years of learning and experimentation in the productivity space, I slowly began to develop smarter strategies that eventually allowed me to work a full-time job and study consistently. By the end of college, I was working over 40 hours a week as an EMT, studying for school, and preparing for the MCAT all at the same time. And I wasn't burning out. I was locked in. Hey Misty, activate focus mode. I was able to carry this system into medical school at Cajun Koi Academy. In my third year, I was working full time in rotations, studying and grinding on my YouTube side hustle. So I wanna share the principles I use for arranging my life so all the pieces of the puzzle fit. And I hope the lessons I've learned from managing my own time can help you find balance, no matter what kind of job or academic schedule you have. So the first big mind boggling idea I adopted was to schedule my life around focus, not time. Let me explain why with an analogy. Our focus is like a phone battery that drains throughout the day. Even if we're not playing Pokemon Unite or texting someone, we can give or focus some juice with things like coffee or cold showers, but it's gonna drop regardless as the day goes on. As our brain gets tired, our focus is lost and we enter battery saver mode. And our brain hates being tired. It starts to complain like a hangry child. It wanders, it daydreams, it starts to feel bored, we get headaches, and the more and more we push, 
the worse our focus actually gets, and the more likely we are to procrastinate, burn out, and fall prey to temptations of more fun activities. Before I paid attention to scheduling my life around focus, I used to organize a workday like this. I'd wake up at 9.30 and drive to work by 10 a.m. I'd then work a 10 hour shift, head to the gym on the way home, eat a quick bite, and then start studying at like 10 p.m. I'd go until about 2 a.m. or something before just passing out from pure exhaustion. And let me tell you, this absolutely sucked. I'd be totally blasted after work, my mental battery was depleted, so my focus was shot, and I could never finish studying. And I remember thinking, geez, I wish I had like five more hours every single day so I could actually get through my studies. But that wouldn't actually work either, because contrary to conventional thinking, I believe our most valuable resource is actually not time, it's focus. If I can't even read a paragraph because I'm running on E, hallucinating after a long workday, then it doesn't even matter if I have five more hours or 500 more hours. My battery is fried. But then I had this crazy idea. What if I moved this study block from here to here? So I was studying when my battery was actually full. Such a simple idea, but I never thought about it that way before. I always assumed that as long as I scheduled in time to study during the day, I was good. But I didn't take into account my fluctuating focus. So to maximize focus, I wake up and do the most intense studying before I even go to work. And as my energy levels drop throughout the day, I'll do less rigorous studying in the pockets of time I can find at work, like brain dumping concepts onto my notes app or redrawing mind maps from memory. And then late in the day, when my energy is low after work, I can relax with easier light studying, like reading or burning through some flashcards. I'd break up my day by focus and tackle the most intense studying when my focus is highest because it demands the most brain power. And then I can allow the natural progression of my energy throughout the day to determine how to study optimally and efficiently and reduce burning out. But I do wanna point out that for me, my focus is highest in the morning. Contrast that with my best friend over here, whose focus is actually highest at nighttime. While my battery drains throughout the day, there are some mutant night owls whose batteries start drained and then slowly charge throughout the day. He's definitely not a morning person, obviously Akuma. Come on, Misty. Turn off the alarm. It takes a while to wake up in the morning. So for him, his schedule might be opposite of mine. So he can move his study block from here back to here. But the whole idea is to plan our study intensity according to when our battery is fullest. But like many degenerate students, I'm a chronic snoozer. I'm one of those roll out of bed five minutes before class, bedhead and lecture kind of rookies. So even the thought of getting up earlier is triggering to me. But I eventually figured out a Jedi mind trick that helps make the mornings feel less awful. And it's another easy mental kickflip. Instead of setting an alarm in the morning or having a scheduled wake up time, I only set a strict bedtime. To me, mornings sucked because I felt rushed and sleepy going into work. And of course, dispatch would bombard us with emergency codes right when I clocked in. It's like they were waiting for me. The goal of this flip is to sleep earlier. So my body naturally wakes up in the morning, not to the soul crushing sound of an alarm and not on any particular schedule. That way I could enjoy a productive and peaceful start to every single day. So if I needed to get up to study before work, I wanted to be studying by 6 a.m. to get at least three hours of focused work in. But using the trick, I'd move my bedtime earlier by one or two hours. So if my normal bedtime was midnight, I'd get to bed by 10 p.m. This way, it doesn't matter if I get up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 5.30, or even 6 a.m. I'd naturally wake up when I do, on my own terms, fighting demons. And the morning would just be less awful overall. Even after a couple days of using this rule, I noticed a huge difference in my overall mood during the day, too. I don't feel rushed, so I'm not stressed out. I'm optimistic because I've already studied early in the day and I don't even have to think about it when I get home from work later. And honestly, I never thought I'd say this, but there's something very peaceful about the wee early hours of the morning. No one's awake, social media is dead, it's quiet, and there's just less distractions. Once I realized that waking up earlier actually worked for me, I could start to shift my circadian rhythm to align it earlier in the day. And there are some evidence-based ways to do this. One of my favorite ways is getting light exposure, preferably natural lighting, about half an hour to an hour when I wake up. And absorbing that natural light into our eyes actually helps us move that clock forward. If there's no natural light early in the day where you live, then overhead lighting is more optimal than low lighting, like a desk lamp or something. So after I began medical school, I no longer had a full-time job. 
but being a medical student on rotations was basically the same thing. Plus, we still had to study after work, too. But my work schedule was much more erratic. Some weeks I'd work night shift, some weeks I'd work early morning shift, and sometimes I'd work weekends. As a kitsune, I loved this spontaneous work schedule. But that also meant that in order to optimize for focus and maintain a strict early bedtime, I had to add another layer to my time management system. So to work with a flexible schedule, I had to start setting strict deadlines, not just for studying, but for everything from running errands to meals to even my free time. And I didn't know this at the time, but this was actually really useful because it touches on two very powerful psychological ideas. You may have heard of this theory called Parkinson's law which states that work expands so as to fill the time given for its completion. Basically, if I had to finish something, like write an essay, and the deadline is in one week, I'm most likely gonna procrastinate and spend the entire week writing that essay. Whereas if the deadline was in one day, I'd have to finish it by then. But regardless of what the task is, we're programmed to drag out our responsibilities to fill how much time we allow ourselves to work on it. So setting strict deadlines addresses Parkinson's law because it capitalizes on this other principle about time pressure. There's this interesting paper from Japan that analyzed why people procrastinate on things. They found three main determinants for procrastination. How challenging it was, the rewards or the punishments for doing it, and how far away it was. But the most interesting thing they found was that regardless of how challenging it was or how punishing the consequences were, time pressure was always the main determinant for taking action. And that actually makes sense, right? If my presentation is tomorrow, I literally can't procrastinate on it. It doesn't matter how challenging it is, it doesn't matter what the reward is, it just needs to get done. So I would focus and I could do it. So in medical school, my responsibilities were starting to pile up, but I also wanted a good work-life balance to see friends and go to the gym, produce music and stuff like that. So setting firm deadlines for studying or for projects forced me to focus and not procrastinate. But I also wanted to make use of the other two principles for not procrastinating too. So I'd give myself rewards for finishing, like going to see friends or going to dinner or something. And I'd also break down big assignments into smaller bite-sized pieces to reduce how challenging it was. And after doing this for a bit, I realized that it actually took me a lot less time to finish studying than I once thought. Before, I was just letting Parkinson's Law drag out all of my tasks. But using things like Pomodoro and setting strict deadlines helped me focus and fit all the studying and hobbies I wanted to get in. A strange paradox about productive people began to make sense to me. The most productive people do so much every single day all because they can quickly transition their focus and block out distractions. It made me think about all those rookies I knew in college who were athletes on the school team, running multiple clubs, working a part-time job, dating the hottest babes on campus, and also maintaining top GPAs. Or thinking about some of the doctors I worked with who were clinicians, faculty professors, residency directors, parents, they got kids, you know? And they all still find time to work on side hustles and enjoy their own hobbies. They were all way ahead of the game, and I think it's because they understand how important time pressure is on our ability to focus. And this is a good segue to the final principle I follow, which might trigger some of you rookies, but it's to stop doing shit you hate. By this point, I hope you all realize that I think focus is the most crucial asset to managing a busy schedule of work and school. But to me, focus no longer only applies when I sit down to study. It also applies at the macro level, at the big picture, you know, regarding my whole life in general. In med school, I also added on a YouTube channel as a creative side hustle. I was also working on a research project and studying for school. There was a lot of responsibility on my plate. Even with the strict deadlines, optimizing focus, and all that other jazz, I was struggling to keep up with my studies, and I was on the edge of burning out. And because there's no way to create more hours in a day, the only option left is to create time from cutting out the pointless stuff. Quit doing shit you hate. Quit doing the stuff that brings you no joy and no value. This lesson was a slap in the face. It hurts because it requires honest reflection to admit that I waste time doing a lot of pointless stuff. But once I did accept it, it was liberating. How many times have you gotten wrapped up or roped into doing something and felt like, dang, this is a complete waste of my time? Or think, wow, it's already 1 a.m.? What did I even do today? I think that even if it requires spending a little extra money or some time up front to 
stop doing these pointless things, it's going to be so much more worth it in the long run to maintain your focus over your life. And so taking a look at my schedule, I saw that there were a lot of tiny pockets of wasted time. For example, I used to go to the school gym to work out and it was a 40 minute drive round trip and I hate traffic. So I identified that, I sucked it up, and I bought a basic gym membership that was right downstairs. Another example for me was rallying my geriatric self to go out and get drunk with friends, but then I'd spend the entire next day hungover. And I'm not really about that anymore, and that's not bringing any value to my life, so it's gonna get cut. Or spending time with toxic people I don't enjoy being around who destroy my mental health, Sorry, yeah, that's also gonna get cut. That last one in particular was tough because I had to stop caring about how someone else would think about me. But if it's hard for you to say no to people, there's no need to be a jerk about it. Just be clear and have some self-respect to prioritize your own time. It's been a great first step for me to build a more fulfilling life, one that I actually choose. Of course, there are obviously some things that you hate and you have to attend to, but at least use this principle as a self-reflection tool. That way you can see what things in your life you can actually easily cut out that will contribute to an overall happier and more focused approach to life. And with that carved out time, sprinkle in some more studying or activities that you find fun and fulfilling, like side hustles, relationships, and other hobbies. So those are the four principles in my system as I plan my schedule to make sure I fit in all the study I need alongside work. As you can see, it all comes down to playing Tetris with the time we have each day. Whether moving things around, optimizing focus, or cutting things out completely that drain our focus. And to reiterate, this system works for me based on my brain type and my personality as a kitsune. So a different looking schedule might be better for you. I used to think that sleeping was a complete waste of time. Your eyes are closed, your body is motionless. I mean, how could sleeping be productive? You're literally doing nothing. I thought Doctor Strange was so cool because while he was sleeping, he cast an astral projection form of himself to keep productive. In high school, I would pull all-nighters, sometimes doing homework, but mostly playing video games. In college, I would pull all-nighters, studying for my exams. Little did I know that I probably would have been a better student and a better gamer if I had taken my sleep more seriously. Well, obviously, I was wrong but it's not for the reason that you'd expect. I'm not about to tell you that sleeping is more productive because it helps you recover energy for tomorrow. I'm sure you already knew that. It's more than that. If you look at the science of sleep, you'll realize that not only is sleep productive, it might be the most productive thing that you do all day. Hey guys, if you're new to the channel, my name is Mike. I make videos with my brother, Maddie. We're both doctors and we love talking about the science behind productivity and learning new videos every week, subscribe and let's hang out. So recently I started my first job as a doctor and half of my shifts take place at nighttime between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. At first I thought it was fine. I mean, you get paid substantially more for working at night. Plus when you work at night, you get more days off to recover, which meant that I could work on making videos and music on my days off. But the hours quickly caught up with me. Sometimes I felt almost hung over the next day. Sometimes it took me multiple days to recover and reset my circadian rhythm. But the worst part was that on my days off, I was unmotivated to do any work and I felt such brain fog and I had a hard time remembering and focusing. And this really bothered me. Like what's the point of having all these extra days off when you can't even use them? So I started to explore the science of sleep and what I found was awakening, pun intended. While we are sleeping, we turn off our bodies, but not our brains. During a full night of sleep, which is about seven to nine hours, our brains transition between three different types of sleep, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep. We cycle through all three of these phases approximately every 90 minutes, but the important thing to note is that every cycle is a little different. For example, the first sleep cycles right when you fall asleep have more deep sleep, and the last sleep cycles right before you wake up have more light sleep. So why does this matter? Well, some of you guys know that I love analogies, so let me try to use an analogy to convey to you just how productive our brains are during sleep. And the analogy I'm gonna use is about note-taking. So you can think of deep sleep like taking and storing notes. So during the day, you've collected all these different notes into your little notebook. That little notebook in the brain is called the hippocampus. Your notebook is just a temporary storage space 
During deep sleep, your brain attempts to file away each of your new notes into a more permanent place in your brain, into the specific areas where they belong. So what happens if you decide to stay up late and miss out on the first sleep cycle? Remember, these first cycles are heavy in deep sleep. Well, you would risk not properly storing away the hard-earned notes that you collected that day. Basically, going to sleep late means you don't give your brain the chance to save your work. And those notes could be lost forever. Because right after deep sleep comes light sleep. Light sleep is like the janitor. It goes through your notebook and gets rid of all the leftover notes and papers that you didn't care to save. Because after being awake all day long, your notebook gets full and light sleep's job is to clean it out and make more room to prepare your hippocampus to learn new things the next day. When I stay up late trying to cram new information, I sometimes find myself rereading the same paragraph over and over again. My hippocampus, or my notebook, is full. I don't have the capacity to cram any more notes in there. See, in college, I would wake up super early to be productive and study. Like, I would wake up at 5 a.m and try to get ahead. Well, what happens is if you wake up too early, you lose out on your last sleep cycles, the ones that have the most of your light sleep. So you might find it difficult to learn new things because you haven't given your brain the chance to clean out your notebook and make room for new notes. So waking up early and only getting like five hours of sleep is actually counterproductive. Finally, let's talk about REM sleep. During REM sleep, your brain is making connections between all the old and new notes that you've stored in your filing cabinets. REM sleep is when all the bi-directional linking happens. You're trying to make sense of all your stored memories and make new connections. That's why you sometimes hear about all the artists or musicians or mathematicians who had vivid dreams and wake up discovering some new creative idea or some new breakthrough in their field. So just to recap, deep sleep helps us save information, light sleep helps us learn new information, and REM sleep helps us make sense of our information. If you don't get a full night's sleep and you miss out on the important stages of deep, light, and REM sleep, you'll remember less, you'll learn less, and you'll understand less. So based on the science of sleep cycles, you'll come to realize how important it is to get a full seven to nine hours of sleep when it comes to learning and productivity. Now, when we're planning our sleep, a lot of us forget that lying in bed for seven hours doesn't mean you're actually sleeping for seven hours. You could be laying there doom scrolling through social media or tossing and turning for hours. I mean, I've had many nights when I was physically lying in bed for seven hours, yet I only got like four real hours of sleep. So the solution to this is to train your body to fall asleep faster and to stay asleep. And there are a lot of unnatural ways that you can do this, like using pills, supplements, technology, paid products, some of which are amazing and some of which are expensive. Maybe I'll do a different video covering those topics, but in this video, I'm gonna take it back to the natural and fundamental methods, which also happen to cost nothing. So these natural habits are based on a simple sleep framework, which is comprised of three factors, temperature, timing, and light. Let's go through each one starting with temperature. So our inner body temperature is coldest in the middle of the night. And as we get closer to waking up, our body temperature automatically rises and rises and rises until boom, you get this boost of cortisol and then you naturally wake up. When nighttime approaches, our body temperature starts to drop and this makes us sleepy to get ready for bed again. So now that we know how our body temperature naturally works for sleep, how do we affect change? Well, an easy fix is to make sure that your bedroom is cool. Your body needs to drop its core temperature by about two to three degrees Fahrenheit to fall asleep and then to stay asleep. And it's the reason you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. Use fans or use less blankets if you get really hot at night when you sleep. One of my favorite things to do is to take a warm shower before bedtime, because when hot water hits the skin on the outside of your body, you react by trying to cool down from the inside of your body. Therefore, taking a warm shower causes your body's temperature to drop in response. The opposite is true for cold showers. The cold water makes your body react by heating up your inner body temperature. That's why you see people taking cold showers in the morning to wake themselves up. Next, let's talk about timing. 
Our brain is conditioned by habits and rituals, and if you go to sleep at the same time every day, preferably in the same bed every day, your brain gets used to it and helps you establish a regular circadian rhythm. Regularity is probably the most important thing I can tell you. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekend, weekday, regularity is key. Take myself for example, depending on what kind of night shift I'm on, I'm forced to sleep at a different time and I'm assigned to a different call room with a different bed. So over time, I found it harder and harder to fall asleep because I've lost the regularity. And even when I get home, I'm unable to sleep during the daytime. And finally, let's talk about light. When we view light, like when light hits our eyeballs, there are certain chemical reactions that happen in our brain that kind of resets our circadian rhythm. The Simple way to think about this is you want as much light as is safely possible early in the day, morning and throughout the day, and you want as little light coming into your eyes, artificial or sunlight, after, say, 8 p.m. And certainly you do not want to get bright light exposure to your eyes between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. So the goal is to get the right kind of light exposure at the right time in order to get good sleep. After you wake up, make sure there is plenty of light around you. And the best way is to have natural light just pour into your bedroom. Or if you don't have that, go outside or onto your balcony for like five to 10 minutes with a cup of coffee if you want. Then at night, you wanna do the opposite. You wanna limit the amount of light that's hitting your eyeballs. That way you can get ready for bed. So let's put all three of these together. An easy way to clean up your sleep habits is to use a night routine. Routine is where timing comes in. Have an established bedtime and keep it regular. About an hour before you plan to sleep, start wrapping up your work and start turning down the lights. And try to avoid too much light coming from screens. And finally, it might be helpful to take a quick warm shower to rinse your body, bring down your body temperature, and get you feeling nice and clean before jumping into bed. So as you can see, getting enough quality sleep makes you more productive, and it makes you smarter. Why is it so damn hard to stay focused? No matter how much coffee I drink, how much sleep I get, how many friends I ghost, or how many hours I set aside, I just keep daydreaming. What's funny is I actually love daydreaming. It's comforting, it's enjoyable, it feels good, but being up in the clouds all day quickly becomes wasteful. There are times where I can't focus on studying for more than five minutes before my mind starts to wander off. The question is, at what point does daydreaming become a problem? A little daydream therapy here and there seems harmless, even healthy, since it actually motivates me to work on myself. I knew I couldn't be the only rookie with this thought, so I looked into it. Psychologist Ellie Sommer was the first person to propose a mental health observation about this type of mind wandering, and he called it maladaptive daydreaming. It's not yet a proper diagnosis, but it's described as a situation where individuals engage in vivid, fantastic, daydreaming for hours, neglecting real-life relationships and responsibilities, resulting in clinical distress and functional impairment for hours on end. Unlike most popular representations of daydreaming where the dreamer seems spaced out and needs a snap back to reality, maladaptive daydreamers engage in it willingly, even mouthing the words or acting out their dreams to reinforce the positive emotions from it. And that's the reason daydreaming can be dangerous, because it's so enjoyable and it's so accessible to anyone, any age, any time. It's free dopamine. This type of rewarding experience can create a yearning, a craving, a longing for that experience which is so pleasant. As you probably notice, what I'm actually talking about is the conditions ripe for the development of a behavioral addiction. So this is when immersive daydreaming becomes uh, maladaptive daydreaming. After reading up and learning about maladaptive daydreaming, I was convinced that Ellie Sommer had just followed me around for a few years because it sounded like it described me perfectly. Maybe it was a form of medical student syndrome where you feel like you have all the symptoms of the conditions you learn about, but I had to be sure I wasn't going insane. So I got some input from someone more reliable than myself about daydreaming. Hey, hey, wake up. Wake up. Hey. What? So what are your daydreams usually about? Uh, I guess sometimes I dream about us being jacked or... Wait, I'm in your dreams too? Yeah, sometimes. Oh. Wait, am I not in yours? Usually when I daydream, it's about like something I'm working hard towards or it's like when I'm really stressed out. Mm. So it sounds like daydreams are like a form of escapism from negative emotions you're having? Yeah. But what do you usually daydream about? Pretty much the same thing as you, although I'm like 
pretty huge already. Or I'll have dreams about like finishing my exams early or I'll have wet dreams sometimes. It seemed like Mike and I shared the same experience with daydreams, which made me feel a lot better. And after going back and forth, we compiled all the reading we'd done and came up with three practical tips to manage frequent daydreaming. Tip number one is to look forward to the daydream. As we study, we naturally tend to daydream, and I've always hated when that happens, so I turn it into something fun. I challenge myself to see how long can my focus actually last before I start daydreaming. And if I can extend that length with regular training, that's where the fun comes in. So instead of using a timer for Pomodoro, I sometimes switch to using a stopwatch to measure how long I can actually last. When I feel like I've lost my focus, I'll gladly take a break. And once I've recharged, I can then try an endurance test for another round. And how long should the break be? Well, a tip from Pomodoro is to divide your focus time by four to calculate your break time. So for example, if you study for 20 minutes, you take a five minute break. Number two is to put things into your environment to distract you. Yes, it's usually helpful to eliminate distractions, dispose of things like my phone, video games, my younger brother, but there is a way to use distractions to your advantage. We can actually use distractions for specific cues to remind us to stay focused and not daydream. This comes from Rock Lee. Yes, I just cited Naruto. I wear this really uncomfortable piece of thick leather. It's constantly nagging and weighing on my wrists. So whenever I'm distracted by it, it's a cue to remind me to regain focus and resist the temptation to daydream. Maddie also uses the focus band. I mean, let's be honest, everyone at Cajun Koi Academy uses the focus band, but Maddie's kitsune brain is even worse than mine, so sometimes he puts stickers all over the walls, or sometimes he'll change his phone lock screen to a friendly reminder. Number three is to collect your daydreams. As the ancient one once said, We never lose our demons, Morda. We only learn to live above them. We're never gonna fully get rid of our daydreams, but we can learn to be in control. We can do this with the daydream diary. The idea is to make a note of what it is that you dream about. And don't wait to write it down. Do it the moment that you start drifting because we wanna offload those thoughts from our brain and keep our mind focused and clear. Keeping a diary is also a great way to gain insight into what kinds of daydreams we have. I'll go ahead and share one of my dreams, but in return, you gotta share one of yours in the comments below. So for me, not many people know this, but I've started writing a novel about the Cajun Koi universe, obviously. And lately I find myself daydreaming, like what if this novel miraculously does well? Like what if this novel becomes an anime or a full on movie? What if they make a Cajun Koi ride at Disneyland? Obviously never going to happen, but keeping a diary helped me recognize the pattern of my daydreams so that the next time I start drifting, it's easier for me to think, oh, it's one of these ridiculous dreams again. I've seen this before. I don't need to waste my time any further on it, offload it from my mind and keep moving. After implementing these strategies into our daily study routine, we both started to notice lots of improvement in our focus. But even though I felt more confident in my ability to snap out of a daydream or take a break when I felt my mind wandering off, these tips weren't addressing the underlying reason of why I kept daydreaming. I was using it as a coping mechanism for emotional distress. One way of coping uh, seemed to have been the creation of an alternative reality. In general, poor emotional regulation was linked with a higher degree of maladaptive daydreaming. I remember on rotations in medical school, I felt overwhelmed with learning EKGs. All of a sudden, I had to recall algebra, vectors, and electrophysics, stuff I haven't even thought about in years, and apply them to cardiac physiology. It was so difficult, so when the pressure got too real, I found myself escaping into daydreams. I daydream about impressing my attending on rounds by identifying a cardiac ischemia or pulmonary embolism, I had no other way to deal with that frustration I was feeling. Daydreaming was a coping mechanism where I'd imagine a time in the future when I overcame those emotions. So a more lasting solution to daydreaming is to explore ways to actually manage and unravel those stressful emotions. And it's gonna take weeks, months, or even years of deep introspection and self-discovery for me to accept my insecurities and figure all that stuff out. All that's not to say that these tips and tricks we showed you aren't useful because they definitely are. They do help us get by on the day to day. But at Cajun Koi Academy, our goal is to empower students to think deeply so we can live our best lives. And that's why we all match into clubs, understand ourselves just a little bit better. Just remember that you're not alone. We're here to figure it out all together. I have a love-hate relationship with studying. Actually, mostly hate. It sucks. It's no fun. But the one thing that gets me through those 12-hour study days is music. I find myself gravitating towards the same genres every time. Among those are lo-fi hip-hop and binaural beats. I always knew that there was something about these genres that made it easy for me to obliterate hundreds of Remnote flashcards in a single session. But then the debate becomes, which one is better for productivity? Are you team lo-fi 
or are you team binaural? Since I can't make up my mind on gut feeling alone, like I usually do when I'm in a pickle, we turned to science. We did some digging, and turns out there's quite a bit of research on why this music works so well. Of course, no matter how sound the science is, see what I did there? When it comes to music, we all have our personal preferences. I'm gonna come out and say it, I'm team lo-fi all the way. But I have this brother who's like, so we'll present the science, make our cases, and then we'll let you decide. But choose wisely, or you're dead to me. All right, team, let's lo-fi. Lo-fi definitely hasn't been studied as closely, but we can't argue it doesn't work. So here are the two big selling points that I've dissected. First is the simplicity. At its core, if I break down a generic lo-fi track, it's not that complicated at all. Throw down a laid back 70 to 90 BPM-ish groovy drum loop. Slap on a few jazzy inspired chords on piano or Rhodes. Add a sparse bass line. Top it off with that vinyl crackle or white noise for the old school feel. Maybe a Yoshi. Or a Mario. Just for good measure. That's pretty much it. You can get creative with sound design, sampling, and adding more texture, but it's all icing on the cake at that point. Although music is playing, the goal is actually to forget that it's there. Kevin Woods, one of Brain.fm's neuroscientists, described the ideal focus music as having no salient events. What that means is we don't want too much variation or abrupt changes in a track that might pull us out of the zone. It's like a mid-roll ad in a YouTube video. We're immersed in the story, feeling the heartbreak of the hero's journey, cheering him on as he leans in for that kiss. Until you're in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. So simplicity is key to maintaining this steady trance-like state of focus. In lo-fi, this means avoiding any new obvious or piercing sounds. No lyrics because that's an immediate attention grab. No dance-worthy catchy melodies. And a chill BPM drum groove that's not too stimulating to where we want to get up and fist bump, but also not too slow to where we'd fall asleep. We're not going for top 40s here, all right? <laughs> Actually, the exact opposite. Simplicity makes all the tracks blend together, and that way they're predictable to our ears, and thus easier to forget about. And second, lo-fi is all about creating a vibe. We have this anime, vintage aesthetic, and hip-hop feel. It's hard not to feel like a complete baddie when listening to lo-fi. I'm Bully McGuire up in here. I think this is in part due to the production style. Muted sounds and vinyl crackle give it that nostalgic feel, like ah, remembering the good old days, or Christmas morning as a child. It's actually one of the reasons why people prefer listening to vinyl. They say it sounds better, but they can't pinpoint why. Naturally, lo-fi has a positive effect on our mood, which correlates to a positive effect on our cognition. When we feel better, when we're relaxed, productivity follows. So good. And ladies and gentlemen, a quick PSA when it comes to listening to music while you study. Remember to keep the volume down. Oh, I know how tempting it can be to crank that dial and relive your Coachella fantasy. But for the sake of your ear health and your productivity, please keep it down. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe. We thank you for your cooperation. So the science behind binaural beats is a bit more refined, but before we talk about that, we've got to make sure that we understand brain waves. Our brain activity can be measured in brain waves, and we measure this by using electrodes that we stick to our heads. There are five different types of brain waves that your brain can emit depending on your current state of mind and your current activities. For example, delta waves while we're sleeping, theta waves while we're in a meditative or drowsy state, alpha waves while awake and relaxed, beta waves are when our alertness is increased, and gamma waves for focused concentration. So that's just a little background on brain waves. Now the way that binaural beats relates to this is that we're using sounds to influence our brains to change from one state to another. For example, if I'm feeling drowsy right now, my brain is emitting theta waves, but I want to be more focused, I want to reach beta waves. I can use binaural beats to influence my brain activity and increase my focus. The way binaural beats works is that we play two different notes, one in each ear, and when the brain perceives these two different notes, it takes the average of the two. And that average, it synchronizes our brain to a similar wavelength. 
If none of that made sense to you, then let's try a little demonstration. If you're not already, go ahead and put on some headphones for this next part. So here's a note, it's a D, and you should hear it in your right ear. Here's the same note played in the left ear. Obviously when I play them together, you just hear one note. But now watch as I slowly detune the left ear just by two hertz. Immediately we get this wobbling effect, which is the binaural beat. Binaural meaning both ears and beat referring to the beating effect of the detuned notes. Okay, so let's take a step back because you don't really need to bother with all that technical science unless you're trying to make your own binaural beats. But it's really as easy as just going on Google or YouTube and searching binaural beats for whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Binaural beats for focus, binaural beats for sleep, binaural beats for meditation. The best research on binaural beats has found that it helps with anxiety and pain control. But for our case, there's also good research on the use of binaural beats to enhance your learning. And by learning, I mean increasing your cognition, focus, and creativity. So, lo-fi beats versus binaural beats. Now that we've analyzed the science, we can see that each type of music affects our brain in a slightly different way. Lo-fi plays more on mood and motivation. It triggers emotions, nostalgia, but also has a steady rhythm that helps keep you motivated and moving forward. Binaural beats deal with brain waves and aims to influence our level of alertness and concentration. Basically, binaural beats has a bit more hard science to it. It's more clinical, it's measurable, whereas lo-fi is a little bit more moody, it's touchy-feely, it's kind of like Matty. But I can't deny that it works. I personally love lo-fi music too. I would recommend that you experiment with both types of music because they can both potentially serve you in different situations. And also what works for me might not work for you. I find that lo-fi is great for longer study sessions or repetitive work, while binaural beats can be great for shorter bursts of high intensity focus and problem solving. And that might not be true for you. Just keep in mind that you can use both for different purposes. And it's easy to interchange. It's not like you're trying to change your diet or change your exercise routine. It's as simple as just choosing a different playlist. It's been about one year since I graduated medical school at 28, and I've officially moved on from being a student. But reflecting on the last 15 years of my life, there are a lot of things I would have done differently. So here are the five most important lessons I wish I learned as a student. The education system will fail you, so educate yourself. I learned this the hard way. To be honest, high school was kind of easy for me. I didn't study much, I skipped class, and I still ended up doing well enough to get into a good four-year school. But college was a different story. I continued the same habits and basically tanked my first semester. I went from a 4.9 GPA top high school student to a 2.5 GPA and almost failed two courses my first semester. You know those moments where your stomach drops and reality sets in as you realize that holy crap, things just got real? That's how I felt then because I realized I didn't know how to learn. School expects us to know, but no one ever teaches us how. Some people figure it out, but most people don't. This was right around the time I wanted to go to medical school. And obviously my grades weren't going to cut it. So I took responsibility and did a complete 180. Got really into self-improvement, learning, productivity, I started a YouTube channel, and it changed everything. Every area of my life, school, relationships, sports, creativity, they all got better through self-education. And it made me realize that learning how to learn isn't even about grades. It's about gaining confidence in yourself. That if you can educate yourself, then you can learn anything. And that's the real prize. Next, real learning happens on the job, not in the classroom. I took an accelerated EMS training course during the summer of my second year in college. Eight hours of lecture, seven days a week, cramming six months into 30 days. And that's how I became a certified EMT. I got a job pretty quickly afterwards, and on my very first day, I was paired up with a senior paramedic. And I remember telling him, yeah, I just graduated, knowledge is fresh in my mind, I was top of my class, you're not gonna have to worry about me. He straight up laughed at me and said, buddy, your real training starts now. I was humbled that day. It would have mattered how many simulations or fake cases I rehearsed and practiced. I realized that day, nothing compares to real experience, because experience teaches you responsibility. Think of it this way, if I don't show up to class, 
nobody cares. If I don't study, nobody cares. If I miss a couple test questions, no big deal. My grades probably aren't going to change very much. But if I screw up CPR, or I make one tiny mistake and forgot to properly stock the ambulance for my paramedic, there are immediate and real consequences. It could be the difference between life and death for my patients. That is real responsibility. And you can't teach that experience in a classroom. So get a job where you have responsibility. Work with other people. You'll learn more about how the world works from two weeks on a job than you can all of your years of school. Play hard mode by default. Like I said earlier, in college, I was kind of a degenerate. I skipped class. I didn't really study. I stayed up all night playing video games partying, doing absolutely nothing for my future self. And honestly, at the time, I didn't mind. But when I decided I wanted to become a doctor, things had to change. I needed better grades, research, clinical experience, community service. There was a lot to do. So I gave it a shot. After one week of actually trying to turn my life around, I wanted to give up so bad because it was so much effort. And I remember telling this to my mentor because I wanted to quit. And I'll never forget what she told me. She said, did you think this was going to be easy? And I said, of course, course, well, no. And then she said, good, then get used to it because this is what hard feels like. And that made me realize that playing life on easy mode was holding me back. Everyone wants to be successful, but few people are willing to do the work. So get used to playing hard mode. In fact, hard mode is the only mode you should be playing. If an opportunity feels uncomfortable or challenges you to step out of your comfort zone, the default option should be go for it. Go get a part-time job. Go talk to that cute guy or girl you've been dreaming about start a side hustle, a social club, go on trips. If you want to grow as a person, play hard mode. Your projects define you, not your grades. When you finish school and enter the real world, no one cares about your GPA. They want to know what you can do, what you've made, and how you can add value. One of the first jobs I ever got was mixing audio for podcasts. I was a biology major in college, but I didn't get that job because I can recite all 20 amino acids. No, I got that job because I loved music. I had my own radio talk show, I produced music, and I played shows in a band. And the people who hired me didn't care about my grades. They cared about the personal projects that I spent my time on. So think of it like this. If I'm going to hire someone to build me a website and I'm looking at two applicants, one applicant has a 4.0 GPA, you know, perfect grades. The other person doesn't even show me their GPA, but they spend the interview telling me how much they love designing websites and how they've built many dope looking websites for several other startups. 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to choose the person who has experience and genuine passion for that thing. Grades showcase your potential. Like, Sure, they might be smart, but we don't really know if they can do what they need to do. Personal projects showcase your ability. It shows that you have a genuine interest because you went out of your way to do that even when no one asked you to. And there's tangible, real evidence that you can make stuff. The things that we create define us, not our grades. So focus on being a maker. Obviously, if you can nail both the grades and projects, then you're peaking. Prioritize people not prizes. One of the most important parts of student life is that feeling of being on a journey with other people. And now that I've graduated and I work from home, I don't see a lot of people every day. Sometimes nobody. I don't run into friends at the gym or at the library. And I'm starting to realize that's just part of growing older. You'll naturally lose touch with people, even your closest friends, if you don't make space for them in your life. There was this famous study from Harvard that started in the 1930s, where they followed a group of people over the course of their entire life. And when they were old, they asked them, what was the secret to happen? Happiness. And across the board, people said it wasn't money, it wasn't fame, it was the quality of their relationships. So yeah, go study, work hard, but don't neglect your relationships. Because when you're old and gray, wearing diapers and telling stories to your grandkids and stuff, you're not going to reminisce about the A plus on your college physics midterm or the 12 hours a day you spent studying alone in your room. But you will talk about the crazy memories you made with the cool people in your life. So prioritize people, not prizes. I know I can't travel back in time and put my brain into my screen scrawny, stupid 18 year old self. So the next best thing, I hope I can share what I know so you can all learn from my mistakes. Either way, hope you enjoy the video, got something useful out of it, and I will see you next time. So learning how to learn is an infinite game that never ends. It's like going to the gym. You don't just work out a few times and you have a six pack forever. It requires maintenance. If you want to join the ranks of students who consistently score in the top 1% without having to spend more time, then I recommend you join StudyQuest. Our community was built around the lifestyle of lifelong learning. 
and we realize that when something is enjoyable, we don't need to rely on things like motivation or discipline anymore. We've combined the science of learning with the psychology of gamification to create an experience you're not gonna find anywhere else. It's an immersive virtual academy where people all over the world come to study, get productive, create content, build their businesses, any and all forms of deep work that lead to a more fulfilling life. If that sounds like your vibe, then come check out the academy. We'll be there if you wanna join in on any group sessions. All right, good luck and happy studies.